This workshop will follow the release of a consensus study report sponsored by the Food and Drug Administration that identified innovative technologies, including manufacturing processes, control and testing strategies, and product technologies. Over the next two days, the pharmaceutical manufacturing community, including the audience, will discuss the report recommendations and additional strategies to advance the field. So before we begin, I would like to thank the planning team um, that organized this event, Rex Reclitis, Sally Romero Torres, Kelly Rogers, and Tim Chalabois. I would also like to acknowledge our sponsors, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, also, we greatly appreciate the support throughout the report process, as well as this dissemination event. Uh, thank you to our speakers and uh, panelists for taking the time to attend and contribute to this workshop. We are all excited to hear your talks. And uh, finally, I want to give a special thanks to the Academy staff, Brenna Elbin, Jessica Wolfman, and Eric Edkin. They have put a tremendous amount of work and effort to put together a virtual event that we all hope uh, you will find engaging and um, fun. So in the um, chat, we should have, uh, if you know in the Zoom chat, we have uh, the agenda and the bios of the speakers uh, for your reference throughout the workshop. And in a bit, I'll also uh, will go through some instructions on how to use Slido. Slido is the platform that we'll be using to uh, post additional comments, questions, and um, we'll also be having uh, polling questions. So um, this is going to be an interactive workshop. So I'm asking those who have their phone to take out their phone and um, you can you type in the Bitly Pharma Slido link onto the web browser, or you can take your phone and use the QR code and just do it like so. The link to the Slido is also in the Zoom chat. So once you go into Slido, um, you'll see there's a couple of options. You have the Q&A. This is where you can post questions and uh, the moderators during the community discussion may ask those questions uh, out loud to the audience. Um, you'll also see an ideas tab. This is um, during the different sessions. You can post your thoughts and comments in response to the speaker's presentations in the idea tab in the middle. And then during the uh, workshop will also ask a few polling questions and if there is a question um, live you'll see a green button pop up and uh, please feel free to take a moment to answer any questions uh, they're tailored to get you engaged with um, the workshop and so we hope you have some fun with that uh, and as with any um, chatting platform to be respectful of each other's um, viewpoints and um, be mindful of the language you use um, we want this to be a safe and tolerant space. All right. Um, so also another note is for Zoom, there are certain rules of engagement on Zoom as well. During the community discussion, um, because of the number of participants out there uh, to have some organization, we would like people to raise their hand. Um, to do that on Zoom, you'll see uh, the reactions tab with the smiley face. Go to that and you can click on the raise hand option and the moderator can call on you to speak. Also to note, uh, as you are on Slido, as you type in your comments, if an audience member sees that comment and they like it, you can upvote it on Slido as well. And as more votes come in, the likelihood of uh, your name being called is probably high. Um, and so the moderator may call on you to uh, elaborate further on your really good thought or comment. And also for further and more engagement to um, look at your uh, screen and speaker view, which I think is on default already. So let's not worry about that too much. All right. so. Let's do a Slido practice. All right. So if you look on your phone, you should see, oh, yeah, you should see some questions pop up on the poll. Um, 
it's the first question should be, which sector do you identify with? All right, so you can just fill it in however you like. Uh, what level of engagement do you have with the report? And then you hit send after you submit it. And then we can see how many people are participating right now. Only 16, 18 people, 20. All right, so we're getting some good engagement, 25 people. We'll wait a few more minutes to get everyone up to speed and practicing. All right. So with that, you can kind of get an idea of how we're doing. We have about 36% coming from the biopharma industry, 21% coming from government. And again, as people are coming in, you can see the numbers shift. And again, this isn't news for um, any data collection from the academy side. Uh, this is merely to get people engaged. Oh, wow, what 38% will report. Okay, excellent. 60% found this uh, report very relevant. Um, also, for those who have dual screen or will, are feel more comfortable using it on the um, computer, you can use Slido on your PC, Mac, and um, other desktop platforms. All right. And so, without further ado, I will move on to the next section. Um, I would like to introduce Rex Rexlitis, who is the Burton and Kathleen Gedge Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering at Purdue University. He also serves as the chair of the consensus study and will begin our day by sharing some of the findings, conclusions, and recommendations from the report. Enjoy. Um, I'm, okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was on mute. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is to briefly recap for you the uh, principal findings of the study that was released earlier this year. Uh, the purpose of our, our meeting really uh, today and tomorrow is to really to, to draw on your feedback to the report to get a sense of, um, you know, given what has transpired over the past year or two, you know, do we really need to look at other technologies? Are there other issues that have emerged? And so it's very important um, for purposes of uh, validation for the FDA that we have your input into this report. Of course, the meeting will also provide the opportunity for our colleagues in the FDA to convey to us some of the steps they've taken and some of the reactions they have had uh, to that study. So let me just very briefly uh, recap for you the contents of, of, of this study. Um, first of all, um, you have many times heard from the leadership of the FDA that there is a need to achieve a, a flexible, agile manufacturing sector that can produce high quality drugs without extensive regulatory oversight. And clearly what has happened in the last two years uh, emphasizes the need uh, for such uh, innovation. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, we need to, of course, enable innovations in pharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, and um, unfortunately, while there has been a lot of progress, that progress really hasn't been as rapid as uh, many of you and, and I would like. Uh, and so for that reason, the uh, uh, FDA has commissioned uh, a, uh, study um, and that that study um, was to be managed by the uh, National Academies team um, with the purpose of identifying emerging technologies that have the potential for advancing pharmaceutical quality and modernized manufacturing uh, to describe some of the technical and regulatory issues associated with those innovations and then recommend how to overcome some of the regulatory issues to facilitate adoption of that that technology. So um, the uh, Academy has taken that chore on uh, and in its usual fashion has uh, put together a committee uh, which I had the pleasure of serving. Uh, it's a committee that has representatives from 
academia, from various government um, agencies, as well as from uh, the Gates Foundation. Um, and of course, it was supported by the NSF staff. Now, uh, what we did is really convene uh, uh, a number of workshops and WebExes with um, members in the community uh, to really try to identify the innovations that the FDA is likely to see. And the important part is our chore was to identify as those that we're likely to see within the next five or 10 year horizon, not necessarily what we would like the community to pursue. Uh, secondly, um, while we recognize that um, innovation requires all stakeholders to participate, the purpose of the study was really to focus on the role of the FDA in preparing uh, for and facilitating these innovations. So our report did not address uh, our expectations of the stakeholders. It was focused on the FDA. Now, uh, of course, the, the key topic here was the innovations themselves. Uh, and um, the committee chose to divide those into four rather obvious areas, the drug substance, drug product, and then some of the enabling technologies like automation and control and innovation in manufacturing networks per se. Now, there's certainly a, a large inventory of such technologies that we looked at and, and reported. Uh, we really are not going to go through all of that right now. Uh, I'll just highlight a few of them um, uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, for instance, um, in the area of drug substance, um, uh, the, the committee felt that the new routes to synthesize new drug substances, such as electrochemical or photochemical or biocatalysis routes are really gonna be very important over the next um, uh, few five, 10 years. Co-process active pharmaceutical ingredients likewise, and of course, process intensification uh, in order to create more efficient uh, processes and in particular to create processes with smaller footprints that these are you know, really important uh, engineering and technology developments. Uh, Additionally, um, as in much of uh, manufacturing in general, the feeling was that additive manufacturing technologies, which can allow tailoring customization of drug products, again, is a really a very promising avenue that, that we expect to see more um, uh, innovations in. Uh, all of these technologies require advanced process control and automation. Um, we need real-time uh, process optimization, automation capabilities, of course, Digital twin uh, is one um, uh, instantiation of that. Uh, and finally, modular systems that offer the possibility of creating a distributed manufacturing system that are flexible, integrated, and, and readily brought online. So just very briefly, those are some of the key directions. Of course, there's a lot more detail in the report, um, but I just wanted to highlight those. So that's the technology part. And then the second part, a uh, very important part, was really what have been some of the challenges that uh, are imposed by the regulatory process for innovations to take root uh, in the industry. And there are basically five uh, areas that the committee highlighted. The product technology review process itself, uh, the alignment of incentives for manufacturing innovation, global harmonization, post approval change, and then the uh, FDA uh, internal uh, challenges and limitations. And I'll briefly highlight just uh, a little bit about each of these five areas, uh, beginning with the, tech, with the review process. As you well know, um, under the existing regulatory process, the only way a new technology is reviewed uh, is through in the context of an individual product review. Uh, and that really places a significant burden on the manufacturer who introduces that technology because there is the, the risk associated with the new technology and the risk associated with the new product. Um, and the feeling uh, uh, from the community and, uh, uh, and really reflected by the committee was that unless there is sufficient incentive for a manufacturer to bear the possibility of, of uh, uh, costs and, and uh, time delay because of uh, manufacturing concerns, there really is uh, uh, much of an incentive just to stay with conventional technologies and not introduce new technologies. Uh, so uh, 
that basically points to the fact that there needs to be an alignment of incentives. And it was pretty clear from the interaction our committee had with the community that, um, you know, this is a really key area. Uh, it certainly is clear that if there is no other way to get a new product manufactured other than through a net technology, then it's obvious there's a business um, an incentive to do so. The problem is in areas in which uh, that technology really could have an impact on, on a whole portfolio of products. Uh, it still is the case that that first product that uses the technology has to basically bear that double uh, risk. Uh, it is, of course, uh, likewise for uh, existing products where every such existing product now would have to be reapproved uh, in the context of a new technology. And that creates, again, kind of a business disincentive. Uh, so, um, in, in sum and substance, the committee found that although, you know, technical and regulatory ch challenges pose significant hurdles, none of these challenges presents as great a barrier as this issue of incentives. So, um, that means there is really needs to be a, a, an active effort in trying to align stakeholders to come up with um, um, processes and, um, and, and uh, avenues that will al allow us to basically uh, you know, align incentives and therefore drive uh, uh, new manufacturing uh, ideas. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other issue that's, that's really key is that of harmonization. Um, it is clear that, that uh, the manufacturer of every new product would like that product to appear and um, globally in various geographic regions. And it is equally well known that the regulatory expectations of the international health authorities really are quite diverse and they pose a challenge. And that challenge is uh, even multiplied in the area of new technologies. So um, the committee clearly uh, heard from the community that any progress that can be made to accelerate regulatory harmonization and consistency will reduce disincentives for a global Im implementation of new and exciting technologies. So global harmonization is really a very big key issue. Uh, a, a further challenge uh, is that of post-approval. Um, as uh, the community is well-practiced to experience, um, you know, every uh, manufacturing change of a product that's already been approved, uh, if it is significant enough, it requires uh, regulatory approval. Uh, and that certainly um, is uh, required of new technology and that um, provides kind of an impediment. Uh, now there has been uh, a, a guidance, ICH uh, Q12, uh, that looks at um, the product life cycle and really has some uh, good ideas on how uh, product uh, improvements can be advanced. But the key is how will that guidance be applied and utilized by the various bodies? So um, it's clear that um, there needs to be uh, incentives put in again to encourage taking existing products and moving them to new manufacturing platforms. Finally, um, the uh, last challenge is really within the FDA itself. Uh, and certainly the committee appreciated that the FDA has taken really important steps uh, to um, encourage innovations, to foster innovations. However, uh, the views that the committee collected from the community indicated that the role of CEDAR in enabling innovation is uh, underdeveloped uh, and that this underdevelopment really jeopardizes uh, the ability to, um, to use new technology to produce safe and efficacious drugs reliably. Uh, and some of these um, uh, challenges, uh, I'll enumerate a little bit more in detail in the next slide. Um, and first of all, it's a, a matter of having the expertise capacity and the culture within the organization to really be able to do with new technology. And that's a significant challenge for the staff to really stay up to speed with the newer things that, uh, that are coming along the line. And it's a challenge for the organization to basically have training. Um, the capacity constraints uh, in dealing with new technology are, are perceived to be significant enough to affect the consistency in evaluating new technologies. 
Um, and philosophically, there is really a, a, a dissonance uh, between oversight um, to uh, assure safe products and then the facilitation uh, to encourage new technologies. Uh, and we have to find uh, effective ways of, of breaking down that dissonance. Uh, clearly, the, the community uh, feels that with new technologies, there are significant new risks uh, and uncertainty as how the FDA will react to it. And that applies to, for example, the data requirements required for regulatory filings, um, for clarity and consistency and evaluating the residual risk to product quality, and of course, the, the issue of global uh, regulatory environment. Um, so these are really uh, important external uh, kind of perceptions of the community uh, that needed to be highlighted. Um, uh, next slide uh, is um, the committee recommendations. I have a couple of slides to go through. Uh, first of all, um, the, the obvious recommendation is to strengthen the expertise uh, innovative technology throughout the organization and to look at internal mechanisms and practices so that um, staff can be um, exposed to new technologies and to hire people that uh, are already educated in those technologies. So that's really a, a key requirement and a challenge. Um, secondly, next slide, please. Um, the um, committee clearly felt that the Emerging Technology Program is really be a remarkable success. It's very well received by the community. However, um, the, the committee likewise felt that the scope and capacity of, of the ETT program really needs to be uh, enlarged, and in particular, uh, that it have um, dedicated independent funding, uh, be able to expand uh, uh, and have dedicated staff for that function, uh, to broaden the criteria for entry into the ETT program, and to increase the transparency uh, of the capacity of ETT and the program outcomes. This issue of transparency is particularly important so that it, there could be learning across the community uh, of the activities that ETT undertakes. Um, next slide. Um, of course, um, the uh, flip to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, clearly the, uh, the leadership role is a very important one and CEDAR is engaged in ICH guideline preparation, but, but the committee felt that CEDA really needs to increase dedicated resources so that um, the FDA could be a, a leader uh, in encouraging uh, and um, accelerating harmonization and how new technology is really accepted. Uh, finally, um, it is clear that we have focused um, on the activities and the, and the, the resources of the FDA, uh, but it is equally clear that this is a community activity, uh, that um, it, it really getting new technology in is, is everyone's job. It isn't just the FDA's job, okay. Last slide. So um, although there is you know, no one that really has control over it, um, however, um, the community needs to participate, uh, the community needs to be engaged, but the FDA uh, really has a critical role to play. Uh, it has direct leadership role and needs to support uh, the ability and willingness of manufacturers to lead and drive innovative change. Uh, so that was really the summary of, of our report. Um, and um, at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is to invite some of the members of the committee who participated in the study to uh, offer their comments. It looks like we have a question I, from Kelly. Yeah, I'm trying thank, to thank you, Linda. Right. 
Um, so Rex, thanks for the summary of the committee's work. Um, and I, I think that the timing is an important thing to point out to this community that the committee started its work before the pandemic. And so the recommendations that were made for what technologies would appear in the five to 10 year timeline were really pre-pandemic concepts. And so I wanted to point out to this community that one of the things that this workshop is intended and hoped you know, to elicit from the community are areas in which the pandemic has accelerated the timeline for when technologies would hit. And obviously the, you know, the mRNA vaccines are one of those areas uh, where the pandemic has definitely changed the timeline for you know, having commercial applications. Um, so I, I just wanted to invite uh, the community to think from that lens that really the technologies were pre-pandemic um, in their nature or in their assessment, I should say. Uh, Matt, uh, did you uh, uh, want to add a comment? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Rex, for the uh, really fantastic introduction. Um, I actually don't really have uh, too much to add, but if, if a colleague here would like to, to add something, uh, I'll, I'll give up the time for that. I'm actually running on my way to teach bioprocess engineering this morning. So uh, <laughs> teaching the next generation, some of the topics that we'll be covering here in the next couple of days of uh, the workshop. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Todd. We're having a hard time hearing you. Um, no, it's still a little um difficult to hear. No, it can't still can't hear me. Oh, perfect. Loud and clear. Great. <laughs> I just wanted to comment that that was a, a great summary, Rex. I think one of the things that uh, we need to recognize is the is the world really is is changing rapidly, and uh, setting uh, these challenges to innovation also in the context of the now you know recognized ability and extreme pressure to move extremely quickly in manufacturing and uh, the the time constraints from a manufacturer's perspective and their willingness to bring on board innovation may add even additional pressures uh, uh, and make these barriers seem larger than they might have uh, seemed prior to the pandemic. Very good, uh, thank you. Uh, Arlene uh, has her hand raised. Ar Arlene, would you uh, uh, have a comment? Yeah, sure, thanks Rex for including me here. Um, uh, again, and I'm Arlene Joyner. I work with Health and Human Services in the agency called BARDA. Um, and I wanted to really add on to what Kelly mentioned. So the study we did was prior to COVID and the pandemic response, but it really, I think COVID became a case study um, because we really relied on, you know, quick manufacturing of vaccines. And I know the study was focused a lot more on um, cedar products and small molecules, but from a BARDA perspective, it's very similar in that we're always looking to be able to respond quickly to any public health emergency, you know, a CBRN incident where um, product needs to be available quickly. So these innovations, I think, are really important that the private sector company is working on. Um, so we encourage the company, you know, the, the two thing main uh, outcomes, I think, from the study were um, having the private sector companies and communities work together, um, you know, collaborating and helping it so that the FDA from a regulatory perspective is not having to work with one company at a time, right? So can they develop regulations and policies that address a group of companies as opposed to one at a time? 
Um, and then at the same time, we saw through pandemic response that the FDA is very collaborative. We had many, many early on conversations about the technologies that were coming up with the vaccines, how we can expedite things, what can be done, or what their requirements are in order to get them through the process as quickly as possible. So um, it can be done. Uh, we don't necessarily want to have a pandemic be the reason things happen so well and so quickly. Um, but actually, it's a, it was a good case study to show that these innovations are important. Um, and then we can work with the regulatory agencies to get them through uh, quickly and successfully. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Arlene. Um, uh, Paul, uh, did you want to uh, contribute your comments? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Rex. That was a great summary. Um, so my participation with the group is really based on my experience from outside of pharmaceuticals. Uh, I worked for many years in the consumer products industry and worked with solids processing um, in, in uh, less regulated contexts. Um, my um, perspective is that the uh, CEDARS encouragement of the use of continuous processing over the past, say, 15 years or so, I think has been a, had, had a positive effect. It has encouraged innovation in the industry. Um, and I think it, it, you know, it's a, it's a good um, uh, stepping stone to some of the, the recommendations in the report, specifically looking at uh, how we can go from continuous flow and processing to um, uh, a more end-to-end -end view of continuous flow in, um, in, in the production of the, of the product. That means we may need to flow across substance and product regulatory barriers, right? This is a challenge. Um, process in intensification and modularity you mentioned uh, and, the, and the process controls that are associated with them are important. Um, <clears throat> the, the key to all of this is having stable processes with inline controls that assure product quality. And <clears throat> in this aspect, I'm a little bit concerned that the broader community may be, have become a little bit overzealous in its embrace of the word continuous, right? Really the root cause or the root focus should be on process stability and control. If you can do that with continuous, that's great. But there are cases where small batch or fast batch turnover may be inherently more stable in terms of the use of endpoint controls. And we shouldn't, you know, discard that just because it doesn't have the right label. We have to get you know, a, a, a more consistent vocabulary that um, uses words in the right way so that we avoid some of these kind of uh, uh, conflicts or, or dissonance that you mentioned. But beyond that, I, I learned an awful lot about the drivers for product innovation and working with the group and, uh, and how those affect pharmaceuticals. And I think the committee's report is really well-timed to help address some of the more recent supply chain uh, tensions that, um, that Kelly brought up in regards to uh, uh, the pandemic. And uh, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to innovate going forward. So uh, thank, thank you for including me. Uh, thank you, Paul. Those, those are great comments. Um, uh, does uh, anyone else from the committee want to offer some words of wisdom? Uh, Sally? Yeah, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I mean, to me, the, the writing the report was, a, of course, a great experience, but I think that the angle that um, I, or the dimension that I was actually looking at the report was more from a change management perspective. Um, I think that we do have, we do have a lot of talent in our industry. Um, now, I, I think that there has been a little bit of, um, confusion with regards to how we organize, um, you know, the concepts and the language and, and how do we transmit those in such a way that we can use them and use them within the quality systems that we have right now and within, you know, the, the infrastructure that we have. So to me, um, you know, and I think that this goes a little bit to what Professor Mort was mentioning is what's gonna be our main goal, what's gonna be our, you know, um, our, our value proposition or what's gonna be our end goal for, 
um, you know, our customers and our patients, and then just focus on how do we get there um, by leveraging new technologies and perhaps learning from other industries. Um, but then at the same time, how do we make our industry comfortable enough and translate um, certain engineering concepts and quality concepts that are happening in industries that are performing at that Six Sigma level practically to our industry, just to deliver better products and to deliver more to our patients. So thank you so much. All right, thank you for those comments. Um, uh, anyone else on the committee? Tim? Thanks, Rex. Uh, Tim Shalabois, and I, I was uh, really appreciative, Rex, of your comments and summary, and also, you know, thanks to the academies and, and to the committee, you know, for the privilege of participating in this. It was really a great experience. I learned a ton, and I was actually a part of Pfizer uh, uh, with responsibilities in technology and innovation uh, throughout the course of the, the uh, study and, and the writing of the report, and I uh, have now uh, retired from Pfizer and have joined Nimble, uh, which gives me a, a chance to sort of translate my efforts, you know, on behalf of Pfizer into a broader community benefit. Uh, and, you know, this, because Nimble is charged with biomanufacturing uh, uh, and, and technology and workforce innovations. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, you know, use this time to, to quickly uh, talk about the workshop for a second and what we're hoping from all of you. Uh, I, because the, the per, Mike will, Mike Copter will be speaking and he'll be talking about this also, but I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the, the report was sponsored by CEDAR and we were you know, asked to make recommendations to CEDAR, uh, which we did, but there are also observations in there that, that speak more broadly to the community. And, and Rex mentioned this, that it's, it's really important to look at this not only from a, you know, what can FDA do, although that was the purpose of the report, but I hope that this workshop is really, you know, causing people to, you know, who have voted with their feet a little bit and their time uh, to come to this workshop, uh, to think about their own responsibilities to the community as, as leaders in the technology and innovation space uh, for pharmaceutical manufacturing. And I'm, I'm hopeful over the course of this workshop that we will get the kind of engagement and ownership, as, as Rex said, uh, to think about what we can do collectively. I, I really, you know, in the report, it, it mentioned the need for a system-based, a focused system-based effort. Uh, and I think it's really important that we all consider our own our ownership responsibilities uh, to that system and our leadership responsibilities. But I think it's going to take a co cohesive effort. And as people have mentioned, the urgencies and, and highlight that have been highlighted in supply chain deficiencies uh, over the pandemic, uh, you know, really you know cause us to to, to re recognize and need to re energize uh, that, that our community. Uh, toward toward enablement of innovation uh, that will benefit you know not only the the companies but patients uh, and the, I think it's really important so thanks very much for the, the opportunity and please as as you engage over the course of this you know listening and and speaking you know please think about you know how you can help thank you Tim. Um, uh, for for uh, the attempt to rouse the community in the collective action, uh, that, that's really important. And I think that's a theme that actually came through a lot of the discussions is that, you know, rather than individual players advancing technologies, recognizing that technology is a tool to enable good products uh, and we can share in the tools and we can differentiate ourselves of how effectively we use the tools but we won't differentiate ourselves on the tools themselves. Uh, and, and if we keep that in mind, then that can provide the incentives for putting together consortia and, and uh, you know, collective activities to really advance uh, technologies that will, that will benefit patients. So um, I, I think we, we, we need people like Tim here to, to organize the community and, and drive them forward. So Tim, you're not allowed to retire. Uh, um, do, Rex, yeah. uh, we have a few questions coming in from Slido. Um, okay. So one of them with a couple of upvotes is from Narendra Bam. Um, he asked, 
Um, can we create a regulatory incentive for key manufacturing technologies that will advance the whole field, similar to breakthrough status? Uh, well, and that's a very good comment. Would anyone on the committee like to address that? Uh, or anyone in general, raise your hand and we'd be happy to hear your um, thoughts. Silence is always a little bit more amplified on Zoom, but what can you do? Oh, Tim has his hand up. Okay, Tim. All right, I guess I'm off mute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think this, this is a, a great topic, great question. Uh, as far as the, the structure of the agenda, it's probably a good topic for, for the session four discussion, Sally. Uh, you know, because we're really talking about solutions, you know, in session four. Uh, and, you know, this, this seems like one that would be really good to give some time for discussion there. Thank you for that, Narenda. All right. As also looks like Jean Tom has um, a couple of upvotes on her comment as well. Um, for the FDA, how will the FDA engage the industry as a whole, rather co by co? The IQ consortium should be leveraged. Uh, uh, Jane, can you elaborate a little bit on that comment? Um, yes, can, can folks hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the question is, um, how would the FDA engage the industry as a whole, rather company by company? Um, there, there is a uh, what's known as the IQ consortium, which has some 60 major pharmaceutical companies uh, as members whose focus is on trying to figure out how can we do things better from both a regulatory and technology point of view. Um, so, you know, it's just throwing it out there. Maybe it's more appropriate for one of the later sessions, but I, I would be interested to hear how the, how the FDA would think about engaging the industry as a whole, right? I think it sounds great when you just say that, but what is the mechanism to do that? Yeah, very good point. Um, Kelly, did you want to uh, respond? You're mute. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Jean for the question because that really cues up our next session. And um, we are going to have speakers, uh, Larry Lee and Joe Welch in that section, um, which is on existing mechanisms to enable innovation. And so I, I feel uh, that that question really validates the organization of this workshop and the opportunities um, for the community to really put on the table, what do we have to work with and where are the gaps? Um, and so I look forward to that discussion and I'm hoping that um, Jean's okay with being a little patient until after Larry and Joel have had a chance to speak to that. Very good, thank you. And then there's one more question coming in from Laura. Uh, was there any broader discussion of trade-off between data produced for a new process versus that produced for a broadly understood and established process? Um, anyone would like to uh, respond to that? From my recollection, I don't uh, recall that there was an explicit discussion of, of that issue. Uh, however, the issue itself was raised uh, and, and the fact that that's part of the uncertainty, given that you have a new process, what new and additional information do you have to provide in order to, to provide assurance that, that not only is the product um, doing its job but the process is reliable as well. Uh, and, and that is, that is a, a very key uh, source of uncertainty for the community at large. And uh, certainly um, we hope that we evolve to come up with solutions for that. 
So Sally, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, I can add a little bit into that. I think that, you know, like we, we did mention some, some, something that it's just a, it's a good practice, which is it's not, you know, you, you can have tons of data, but you also have to have knowledge and product knowledge. So um, I think that, you know, this, this question, it, it's more aligned with best practices. And I, I, I think that we did mention it in the document um, that what we foresee is that, and, and I think that this, again, this is just something that the FDA has also mentioned throughout um, their guidances, is that um, knowledge paired with data, it's more powerful just data alone, right? Like you have the empirical portion, but then you have also the fundamental part and that combination, it's what really is gonna drive value. Um, so I don't know if that answers a little bit to that, but we can, you know, we can um, add a little bit more later in, in, the, in the other discussions. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good good point, that, and certainly us in academia always value the knowledge part uh, um, as a as a framework for the, within which to present data, because the, the the data ought to support the knowledge. Uh, but but um, how to do that in a you know in a measurable fashion is difficult, right? It's a it's a, a qualitative assessment, unfortunately, what the level of knowledge is. But, uh, great. Do we have any other uh, comments or, or questions, um, Linda, that has have popped up? Um, so far, no. Um, no other questions is on Slido, but um, for those who came in a little late, if you look into our Zoom chat box, uh, we have the links to Slido, um, which if you click on it, uh, from your computer, it'll take you to a screen where you can um, post your ideas and comments. Um, we have it based on session topics. But I think, you know, in about 10 minutes, we'll have Mike um, from the FDA come up for opening remarks. So, oh, Kelly. Is. Uh... Um, Linda, I just wanted to point out that in the question and answer session of the Slido, there's a question there as well. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, right. So from Damiano Dragon, and I apologize if I uh, mispronounce anyone's name. Um, yeah, uh, they asked, how is approaching the F how is approaching FDA the introduction of artificial intelligence tools in the pharma manufacturing process? Um, and, and any responses to that question? It's a tough question. Sally? Sally? Yeah, can, Linda, ju just, just for context, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, they asked, how is approaching FDA the introduction of artificial intelligence tools in the pharma manufacturing processes. So I guess it's asking how, how is the FDA approaching um, using artificial intelligence in the manufacturing? Yeah, I, I mean, as a committee member, I don't want to talk too much, you know, on behalf of the FDA. I can talk on just what I have seen in prior guidelines that they have been um, supplying into our industry. Um, I think that we have to be careful with the term artificial intelligence because we have been doing artificial intelligence um, for many years already. Um, every time that we have a, a like a, a control loop, every time that we do data analytics and we use like multivariate analytics um, um, using any algorithms like PLA, um, PLA, PLS and PCA, which we have been using for many years already, um, that is part of artificial intelligence. Um, so it really depends on which artificial intelligence um, tool the, you know, we're talking about. Um, and again, many artificial, there, there are many shades and colors for artificial intelligence. So 
for what I have seen, in my humble opinion, they have been promoting it, especially when the PAT guideline came out. Um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, like new um, sensors and then new control mechanisms that are using more like, you know, multiple information to make decisions. Of course, that information needs to be mined. And usually the way that we mine that data is using machine learning, which is part of artificial intelligence. So um, I think that they have been promoting it. It's not that it has been called explicitly artificial intelligence. You know, if I can elaborate on that, certainly within the report, uh, we included a, a, a fairly extensive discussion of machine learning and artificial intelligence applications within the automation and control framework. Uh, certainly, um, uh, it, it, it is a component of, of lots of hybrid models where one combines first principles, where you use a first principles model where you know the first principles that combine it with a machine learning model where you don't quite sure the first principles yet. Uh, and that kind of hybrid framework is really, I would guess, part of most digital twins that, that people are contemplating because we never have all of the first principles knowledge on the table. Uh, so uh, AI is, uh, of course, a broad term. Um, um, but, uh, but I think probably for the kinds of applications we're thinking about, uh, machine learning is probably the, the, the more correct decision because we're, we're, we're making, uh, using it as a tool for making quantitative decisions rather than qualitative ones, right? But, but that was a very good uh, issue to raise and, and certainly uh, the committee spent uh, some time discussing uh, that, that new technology or the new not so new technology. Thanks Rex. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, we have one more and um, it's from Su Su Sung Q. Um, they asked, how will the FDA bring CBER to the same page, especially in pharmaceutical manufacturing of vaccine and new mod modalities? Another uh, nascent study for CBER? Well, uh, Sankyu, we really can't speak uh, uh, to the FDA and, and, and we certainly can speak on behalf of CEDAR uh, on what CBER will do. But, um, you know, it is fair to assume that uh, at some point um, the initiative that was shown by CEDAR will be uh, picked up and, and followed through by CBER as well. Um, but as you, as you well know, uh, our study was, was sponsored by CEDAR and so we limited ourselves to the issues within the CEDAR portfolio. Um, but uh, we certainly would have loved uh, to have broadened the study, uh, but you know, that was set by the parameters for, uh, for our task. Uh, well, I think if we uh, have no further questions, um, Linda, perhaps we can um, switch over and begin our, our uh, next presentation. Uh, is uh, Dr. Kapsha online? Hi, Rex. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Let me uh, just take a few minutes to introduce you, although, um, you know, you are certainly not a, a stranger to the... Uh, uh, to this community. Uh, Dr. Kapsha is director of the uh, FDA Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. And as you well know, that's a, a large organization with very broad responsibilities that really touches on virtually every type of human drug manufactured. Um, and, and so it really has a, an enormous scope. Um, he brings uh, to his job uh, a 25 year experience in the industry. Um, uh, including serving as vice president of uh, uh, Novartis Computer Health. Um, he uh, uh, is educated in pharmaceutical sciences and, uh, and certainly um, you know, is, a, is a great alumnus of Rutgers University. Uh, and uh, you know, we're happy to have him uh, address us and kick off uh, this workshop. Uh, Dr. Kapcha. Thank you so much, Rex. I appreciate the kind words. Um, also, I just want to comment that I do appreciate all the enthusiasm uh, with the questions that uh, um, have started already. 
Um, we will answer uh, a good chunk, if not all of the questions that were brought up. So I just ask you to bear with us as we go through um, our presentations and then as we uh, engage in discussion. Because uh, as was mentioned earlier this morning, I really want this to be um, you know, a discussion back and forth because we really do want to get the feedback. We do want to put our um, views on this area uh, forward as well um, as we continue to advance in advanced manufacturing. So um, as you can see from the slide, uh, the uh, topic of my talk today is uh, advanced manufacturing and the future of pharmaceutical quality. Um, as uh, Rex had mentioned, I am the director for the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. I've been in that role now uh, for just about uh, the middle of next month, it will be my six year anniversary uh, in this role. Um, so it's been a lot of fun being in this role and uh, I've enjoyed the opportunities uh, today being one of those opportunities to be able to engage um, not only internally within CEDAR, within the FDA, but with the industry and our stakeholders as well, with patients and consumers, um, obviously uh, being an important piece of that engagement. So what I'm going to do is uh, if we could move to the next slide. Uh, I usually like to start my presentations uh, by, by sharing with people kind of my view or my definition of pharmaceutical quality, just to kind of ground the group. I'm in an easy way to remember pharmaceutical quality, because when we talk about quality of, of any product, whether it be a computer, whether it be a car, or a, a smartphone, people can usually tell you what that quality looks like. However, when it comes to quality of pharmaceutical products, uh, folks uh, kind of stumble a bit in terms of how, how to, to try to define that. But quality of any product consistently meets the expectations of the user. I think that's simple enough. Um, and drugs are no different. If um, I could uh, click on the next slide, thanks. Drugs are no different, nor, nor should they be. So in a general sense, this is um, you know, kind of a way to look at a quality product because uh, it does span across all of these products, including drugs. Uh, next slide, please. So patients expect for, for drugs, um, them to be safe and effective with every dose that they take. Next slide, please. So pharmaceutical quality for me, then an easy way to define it is that it assures that every dose is safe and effective. It's free of contamination and defects as well. Next slide. So it's what gives patients confidence in their next dose of medicines. When you take the next dose, you are assured that it will be safe and effective. So when we talk about drugs, people usually typically talk about safety and efficacy, but there is a third component of that that is understood and that is quality. So when I talk about uh, drugs, I talk about safety, efficacy, um, but predominantly my focus uh, because of the role that I'm in does focus on the quality of that medicine itself. Next slide. What I'd like to do then is to give you a little bit of an idea of the outline of my presentation today. So I wanna talk about innovation in a changing world, the challenges and opportunities that face each and every one of us in this area, the importance of advanced manufacturing, as well as the regulatory framework. So we'll start to get into hopefully answering some of the questions that were brought up uh, a little bit, uh, a little while ago, or a little bit earlier uh, this morning. Next slide, please. So we keep hearing this phrase, the new normal associated with COVID-19. Many of us think about that as taking steps to protect ourselves and others from COVID-19, typically through wearing masks, vaccination, physical distancing, things along those lines. However, what I'd like us to think about today, as well as tomorrow for the two days of this workshop, is how we can use innovation to better equip ourselves to handle an ever-changing world. And when I talk about ever-changing world, one of the things you'll, you'll hear is what's called a VUCA world, V-U-C-A. And that stands for uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, as well as ambiguity in an ever-changing world. So um, we need to address those issues, or at least be aware that those issues are out there as we look at the world or as, you know, um, as we look externally um, to see what's going on on a global scale. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 is a virus that infects humans, but it affects nearly everything else that we do, including pharmaceutical uh, supply chains, customer, customer demands. You see all of that going on. It's in, the, it's in the news every day now. And decision-making that's based on science and research, so, uh, or science and risk, I should say. Um, so it's always a risk-based but science-driven uh, evaluation that we need to do. 
So from one viewpoint though, even prior to COVID, supply chain disruptions have been their own kind of contagion. So what do I mean by that? The best way for me to define that is to um, use a common story that, that I think all of you hopefully would be able to relate to. So for example, there's an issue. Let's, let, let's say it's a quality issue, which forces a manufacturer to temporarily shut down operations. This uh, issue then spreads, as does an infection, uh, to other manufacturers of their products who are forced to scale up to meet market demands. This issue then spreads to patients and consumers who lose access to their drugs when the remaining manufacturers can't respond quickly enough, or in some cases can't even respond at all. So we need to use the same type of innovative thinking to realize a future where we um, uh, focus on uh, becoming immune to supply chain disruptions. Uh, and those are the kind of things that we really wanna start talking about. And advanced manufacturing is one of the ways to address that immunity. And I put that in quotes, obviously, um, if you will. Next slide, please. So we felt it was important, we, um, us at the FDA, more specifically those within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, we felt it was important to share a vision for this future of the future of pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, I love to, to do wordplay, so I, I ask you to bear with me a little bit. Uh, the dawn of the fourth uh, industrial revolution forces us to visualize what a fully digitized and autonomous manufacturing world looks like in industry 4.0. So there will be new operating paradigms as a result of this digitization, automation, and real-time data integration. So we need to start better understanding. And I think you know this has been brought out in, in the uh, report that NASM uh, ha had issued, as well as some of the opening uh, discussion you heard today. We need to start better understanding how this new manufacturing paradigm can impact pharmaceutical operations and the regulatory piece of that as well. And we'll share with you not only today, but tomorrow in terms of how we're starting to craft that regulatory framework. Uh, we shared this vision in a paper we published earlier this year on Industry 4.0. You see that paper uh, in this slide. Uh, if anything, I think COVID-19 accelerated the need for Industry 4.0 technologies. I, I don't think there's any um, uh, argument there. Um, in order for us to be responsive to rapidly changing demand and to reduce dependency on human innovation. Next slide, please. So whereas industry 3.0 saw rapid advancements of individual operations and tools, industry 4.0 promises advancements of entire manufacturing systems. Uh, the journey from single data collection to digital maturity is one in which data transforms from raw data that is captured from a manufacturing process. And when it's captured in that uh, process, it's to help us inform, uh, uh, to be informed by the analysis of all of that data that we now have. Uh, also to the knowledge form through the addition of contextual meaning, perhaps by artificial intelligence. I know some of you are interested in that area. We just saw a question earlier today. And finally, to actionable wisdom to inform decision-making by the contribution of insight that has gotten from that type of an analysis. So it is this wisdom, if you will, that fuels the autonomous systems capable of self-optimizing uh, self doing decision-making, uh, movement of materials, as well as adaptive controls. Next slide, please. So the essential feature of an industry 4.0 uh, environment is the integration of connectivity, artificial intelligence, and automation to enable systems then that operate with little to no human involvement. So these cyber physical systems, if you will, can fuel, real, uh, sorry, confuse real-time and online data with industrial production, as well as artificial intelligence in order to optimize manufacturing as a whole. For example, external information, including patient experience and supplier inventories could fuse with internal information, such as energy and resource management. So we're able to really make better use or more holistic use of the information that we have. This integration of internal and external data source, sources then enables us to, to uh, uh, be in an unprecedented position where we can have real-time responsiveness, monitoring and control of what's actually being done. And the result is a well-controlled pharmaceutical uh, value chain or supply chain 
for the manufacturer, one which also benefits ultimately where we all need to be focused on patients and consumers. Next slide, please. Thanks. We are now at a point in history where challenges have created opportunities, and these challenges always create opportunities. So, you know, we're always concerned about change, but when there's change, that creates an environment for new opportunities, and we need to seize that, those opportunities. Well, we need to seize the change and then also come up uh, and take advantage of the opportunities that are presented. So these challenges spur innovation. They drive us to be better and to stay better and to continuously improve where we are. Next slide. So the White House published a 100 day report on supply chain um, and what was said in there, and I just wanna take a direct quote that the three pillars of a secure and robust supply chain are quality, diversification and redundancy. And you see the first word that they, they highlight uh, for the robustness of that supply chain is quality. Drug shortages, however, do still unfortunately happen. Um, we've published on this, we've talked about this, I've presented on this a number of times that more than 60% of drug shortages are attributed to quality related issues. So traditional manufacturing relies on large factories. I think we're all well, well aware of that um, with needs for affordable labor, uh, which concentrates in areas that can support these needs. Traditional manufacturing technology cannot respond at, uh, agilely to rapid changes such as during a health uh, uh, a public emergency um, such that we're in right now. Next slide, please. So we've been challenged to develop a framework. We've been challenged to develop a framework to measure and provide transparency into a facility's quality management maturity. Or since in the FDA, we love to use acronyms, quality management maturity, I will refer to as QMM. Um, it's not something out of a James Bond movie, but it is. Uh, it, it does define quality management maturity. QMM is a state attained by having consistent, as well as reliable and robust business processes to achieve quality objectives and to promote continual improvement. So we need ratings. People were talking about, well, how are we gonna measure this? How are we gonna incentivize the industry? Well, we are, we are developing a rating system to determine the maturity level of a company um, you know, in their uh, quality systems. So we need these ratings that recognize and reward manufacturers for having more mature quality systems that achieve sustainable compliance and focus on continual improvement. So the bottom line of this then is that we need to incentivize improvements to the pharma uh, manufacturing infrastructure that enhances the reliability of manufacturing and ultimately the supply. Next slide, please. Of course, part of investing in quality and continual improvement is adopting new technologies. So now new technologies can't be adopted without a business reason. And we understand that. Rex had mentioned that in the beginning. Um, you know, there, there is the startup uh, uh, cost associated with these new technologies. And there is some, trepida uh, there, there is some hesitation uh, and, and trepidation in terms of uh, switching over from these conventional uh, technologies to new advanced manufacturing uh, footprints. Fortunately, though, it turns out that in many cases, advanced manufacturing can be more cost effective after the initial startup cost uh, than traditional manufacturing. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, as we move to the next slide, I, I will still continue. Um, in fact, advanced manufacturing is a key, key component of the overall US strategy to, uh, to strengthen domestic drug manufacturing and increase the domestic supply of quality products. Um, it may finally help take our manufacturing capability above Six Sigma. And this is something that, that, that is a target that we really do need to shoot for and that we really do need to achieve over time. It can also enable us to develop drugs rapidly and prevent drug shortages. As the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly taught all of us, and I don't think there's any argument here, agility and flexibility are needed to maintain pharmaceutical quality in a public health emergency. So while the upfront costs can seem daunting, as I mentioned previously, advanced manufacturing can ensure higher quality and consistently available uh, medicines. 
Um, I was going to say next slides, but I think um, two slides ahead now. Uh, sorry, Mike, uh, we're having a little technical difficulties. Um, okay. Sure, that's okay. I can still continue to um, to uh, 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 you know kind of go through the presentation. Uh, when you get caught up, um, <laughs> you know, we'll uh, the the slides will catch up to us somewhere along the way. I would hope. Um, so the situation is similar for regulators. Um, there is a startup cost, as you could imagine, um, for us in understanding and evaluating the new technologies. Uh, so that was mentioned before, you know, we've got to learn, we've got to train ourselves, train our staff, um, train our inspectorate as well to be able to deal with these new technologies. Because while we talk about them, we have to regulate these technologies as well. However, the payoff for us as regulators is a big one. And that payoff is a more reliable industry requiring risk, less regulatory oversight. Because um, I, I think the industry as a whole will be um, I'm more than happy uh, to see less regulatory oversight. You don't have to see us coming in, say, hi, we're from the government, and we're here to help you. Um, so um, you know, we really uh, you know, could put our time and attention in terms of doing other things. Um, but that is our ultimate goal, to have less regulatory oversight. So that is another incentive, um, although the industry may or may not directly realize that, um, it is an incentive to getting into these advanced technologies. Um, if we could just advance one more slide, uh, 18, I think we'd be caught up and then it'd be in good shape. Thank you. Um, part of our regulatory st uh, startup costs uh, were these series of workshops. Uh, so uh, uh, NASM, uh, which, which NASM so uh, adroitly held, as was noted, this was done or sponsored by CEDAR, um, not by CBER. Um, but I will address that question in my presentation that we are partnering with CBER in the area of advanced manufacturing. And I will highlight that um, in my presentation in a little bit. So we appreciate NASM's, uh, the, the committee that uh, NASM have put together on pharmaceutical manufacturing innovations, uh, taking a look at what's on the horizon and uh, the thorough consensus report, uh, support, uh, sorry, study that's available online. Because um, we really do need to see what those technologies are in five to 10 years out. So as we look at our regulatory framework, we could um, uh, put a framework in place that can deal with the future. And that's not going to be outdated as soon as we start uh, you know, putting in or making some changes to our regulatory framework. So we want to be ahead of things by five to 10 years. Um, the benefit of more reliable medicines will be felt by consumers and patients. So everybody wins when we do things like that. Next slide, please. Um, hopefully, you know that FDA has long supported investments in advanced manufacturing. It was noted in the opening remarks this morning as well. Um, and the reason why um, you know, we, we support advanced manufacturing is because they provide a safe and more secure drug supply chain. Advanced manufacturing is not a futuristic approach that you see in science fiction uh, TV shows or in movies. Advanced manufacturing is already providing quality products to patients and consumers. We do have several initiatives um, which have made this possible and we will continue to make this possible in the future as well. Uh, next slide, please. So later in this workshop, you'll hear about um, some of our advanced manufacturing initiatives, which include the Emerging Technology Program, or ETP. Um, we are moving this to the next iteration or the next version. Um, and uh, we, we'll talk about that as well. We're gonna talk about the framework for regulatory advanced manufacturing evaluation, um, which is called FRAME. The, the acronym for that is FRAME, F-R-A-M-E. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. We love acronyms in the government. So, you know, this one, uh, you know, ETP, we got FRAME, um, which, which again follows with, with the use of those acronyms. And the third one is the development of an advanced manufacturing science and research program. And again, we will talk about that uh, over the next two days. Next slide, please. In 2014, uh, CEDAR established the Emerging Technology Program to provide potential applicants an opportunity to discuss, identify, and resolve technical and regulatory issues. The major milestone for this program was the 100th, 100 FDA-sponsored Emerging Technology Meetings. So that avenue is being uh, very heavily um, uh, used by the industry. Of course, the technology cannot be emerging forever. 
And another recent significant milestone was the first graduation from the ETP. So we graduated from the Emerging Technology Program to put it then into the mainstream uh, uh, assessments that we do uh, when sponsors send an application. And that technology is continuous direct compression or what we call CDC. It's not the Center for Drug Control, uh, um, sorry, Disease Control, but it is uh, in this context, it's the continuous uh, direct compression. CDC is a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacturing process that consists of dispensing, mixing, and compressing using equipment that is integrated, resulting no breaks in the process. So it's a continuous process, obviously. Um, CDC can improve the assurance of product quality by minimizing human intervention, as I mentioned earlier, and taking advantage of process analytical technology, or what's, what's another acronym for you, um, is PAT. So the Emerging Technology Program graduation is an important step for us in the life cycle of a technology. The reason being that it signals FDA's confidence in industry's ability. It's the confidence we have then in industry's ability to successfully submit applications utilizing that new technology. It improves the OPQ's um, efficiency in assessing applications and also increases our capacity then to evaluate other more novel tech technologies. So we really do want to then uh, continue to graduate these technologies into the mainstream uh, uh, review work that or assessment work that we do. We want to continually receive new technologies uh, and graduate them as they become more mature within the ETP. We are now creating the next generation, as I mentioned earlier, of ETP. Uh, for lack of a better name, we're calling it ETP uh, version 2.0. Um, and we're doing that to meet the expanding workload challenges. I know some of you had mentioned, um, you know, it was done in the uh, NASM report uh, during the summary that, you know, we need to expand that program. And we are um, because the workload is expanding and the challenges we're facing uh, uh, in that program, um, you know, we, we realize we need to address those. We are enhancing communications with the industry as well um, that are looking to adopt advanced manufacturing technologies. So you'll hear more about ETP 2.0 later in this workshop. Um, as we are seeing a rapid emergence of a, uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, it's imperative that the regulatory framework, and I've mentioned this before, it's extremely important for us, evolve with this innovation. So with the adaption of new technologies, the FDA faces the challenge of fitting new technologies into existing regulations. That only works so far. We do then need to continue to update and upgrade, if you will, our regulations to handle these new technologies. NASM has now helped us identify the technologies we can see over the next five to 10 years, as I mentioned earlier, and we need a regulatory framework then to provide certainty for stakeholders in terms of how we will regulate those technologies. This framework needs to be flexible enough for these technologies and evolving technologies even beyond the next five to 10 years. Next slide, please. So this effort, which we called the Framework for Advanced Manufacturing Evaluation, or FRAME, aims to provide clarity, reduce uncertainty for products manufactured with advanced technologies. So these technologies uh, we're prioritizing for this framework are end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing, distributed manufacturing, point of care manufacturing, and artificial intelligence. I know there were questions about how we're gonna handle artificial intelligence. We're not there yet. We are putting the fr uh, regulatory framework in place to be able to start handling those areas or those types of, of um, uh, advanced manufacturing uh, uh, areas uh, or, or approaches. So thanks to our emerging technology program, we know that several of these technologies are, are um, now far beyond proof of concept and at a point where the technology is pushing the regulatory framework. We know that and we know we have to deal with it and we are dealing with it. So we've begun by tapping our science and policy experts to help us identify those gaps and pain points in the current regulatory framework. So you do that gap analysis, figure out where you wanna be, where you are, and then what that gap is, is what we have to address. So we're embarking on an effort in which we'll be asking for the public's health, uh, sorry, public's help. Um, we do want public feedback. So we're gonna be gathering input from the public on our gaps and pain points to further inform our thinking. So we're not doing this in isolation. We really do need that input and ask you for your input uh, when those announcements are made. 
Once we had an opportunity to understand the issues and leverage both our scientific and policy expertise, we'll begin implementing different components of the regulatory framework. So the crux of our approach will be public white papers. Again, they'll be public, we'll be sharing them, identifying the regulatory gaps and pain points, and then released for public comment. That's how we typically do it in the, in the FDA. We'll then take the public comments, post the final versions of those white papers, taking all of the input into account to inform an internal CEDAR frame roadmap. You'll hear more about uh, the frame uh, the frame initiative later in the workshop. So I don't want to steal the thunder from, from that presentation. Advanced manufacturing is not the only thing of the future. It's also of the present. Now is the time to develop a framework to keep pace with the innovation. And some people may argue that maybe we're at a pace with that, but we are, you know, our intent is to get catch up if we are uh, behind and then keep pace with these new innovations. Next slide, please. So our research program to better understand the science of advanced manufacturing has now fueled ne nearly 60 research projects that we're doing, including many collaborations with experts in the field. We realize we're not the experts, so we do collaborate with those experts. This includes many collaborations with experts that are attending this meeting, as a matter of fact, uh, related to many different technologies. The knowledge gained from our research has helped us to, for example, provide guidance for applicants seeking to use new technologies such as continuous manufacturing. Our research has directly supported ETP participant feedback, as well as application assessment, which is important. It enabled us to develop the workforce and provide training to support the graduation of continuous direct compression, um, CDC, from the ETP. So um, this would have not been possible without the foundation of, of science provided by our research program. So our research really does need to inform uh, uh, the work that we do internally, the guidances that we put together, the assessments that we do. And also, I don't wanna lose sight of this and I want the group here to feel comfortable and understand this, that it will also provide us the opportunity to start training our inspectorate um, because they need to understand these technologies and how to inspect those technologies. So we're taking a holistic uh, um, and comprehensive approach in terms of what we're doing. Next slide, please. So because they address the recommendations of uh, regulators in NASM's consensus study report, I'd like to close by summarizing FDA's initiatives that support advanced manufacturing. I wanna first stress that patients with cystic fibrosis, HIV, breast cancer, leukemia, and asthma are already benefiting from drugs made with advanced technologies. A reason these approvals were possible is the fact that CEDAR has long championed advanced manufacturing. CEDAR has developed a robust research program to understand the science of advanced manufacturing. In fact, we just awarded five new collaboration products in September of this year. We're currently leading our international regulatory counterparts. The report showed that they wanted, you know, uh, looking for FDA to kind of take the lead, and we are around the international um, uh, collaborations in developing requirements for manufacturers exploring advanced manufacturing technologies like continuous manufacturing. In fact, a Q13, an ICH Q13 guideline and draft guidance are out for comment right now to address continuous manufacturing. Um, of course, our emerging technology program has enabled the FDA um, approval of finished dosage forms. Um, as well as APIs or active pharmaceutical ingredients, biological molecules produced using advanced manufacturing. manufacturing. I point out also that the majority, more than 80% of the drugs uh, that are made using advanced manufacturing technologies are produced right here in the US. Uh, we also funded the series of workshops at the National Academies that resulted in the published report on pharma manufacturing innovations in the pipeline. We're using this innovation to develop and inform our regulatory framework around advanced manufacturing, but to maintain the momentum behind advanced manufacturing in the human drug and biologics programs, CDER and CBER. So yes, we are collaborating with our CBER counterparts, recently established an internal center. We call this uh, the Center for Advancement of Manufacturing Pharmaceuticals and Biopharmaceuticals. So we are already partnering with them. We'll use this center then to enhance coordination and collaboration on the science and policy surrounding advanced manufacturing. We need to cover both. Within our regulatory authorities, we wanna be as innovative as the new technologies we're preparing to regulate. Next slide, please. 
So then, um, sorry, I was, uh, I guess I was behind a bit by, by one of my slides. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, 26. Thanks. So in closing, let us use this workshop as an opportunity to continue working together to use innovation to handle an ever-changing uh, world. Next slide. So I just want to take this time to thank all of you and to thank the um, uh, uh, NASM committee for, for inviting me to kind of give you the, uh, the uh, CEDAR perspective and some of our opening remarks. Uh, very good. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mike. That was really a, a, a marvelous presentation and, and certainly uh, very exciting to see that the, the FDA is moving forward uh, and all deliberate speed and responding to, to some of the recommendations of the committee and even taking them further uh, than, than we were bold enough to advance. So uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will take questions to Mike uh, at the conclusion of this session. We have two more speakers uh, to uh, introduce to you. And when uh, all three presentations are done, we will open up for, for questions using Slido and all the other tools. So um, uh, without you know, further delay, uh, I'd like to introduce the, the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is, is Dr. Uh, Narendra Brahm. Uh, he is a senior vice president of pharmaceutical development and supply at JSK. Uh, he has uh, some 25 years experience uh, leading uh, uh, activities in this domain um, and um, certainly is, is well prepared in the area of advanced manufacturing, has degrees in chemical engineering from uh, University of Bombay and from Yale University. So uh, Dr. Baum, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Rex. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you uh, to the NASM committee for inviting me today uh, to give this talk. Uh, excellent uh, excellent conference that, that you are holding in the next two days, and I really expect good things to come out of this. I read the report, and it, it, has, uh, it has hit all the, all the key points that, that one needs to advance manufacturing uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. So if you can go to the next slide, GSK has been uh, a leader in continuous manufacturing of small molecules, both API and drug product, uh, and, and, and was a leader in getting those technologies approved with the help of FDA and EMA. Uh, but now we are taking the next step and going into the biopharmaceutical uh, manufacturing space. And for the last five years, we've, uh, we've had a program called Advanced Manufacturing Technologies focused specifically on uh, what are the next generation biopharmaceutical manufacturing technologies. And what I want to do today is just give you a glimpse of two or three things that have come out of that program and that are on the cusp of, cusp of being industrialized. And then at the end, I took the opportunity to just uh, put a slide together on, on my experience in the last 18 months, uh, what, what uh, I have learned living through leading a development and manufacturing organization through the pandemic. So next slide, please. So the first uh, technology that I want to uh, give you a glimpse of is what we call Agile. It is the integrated drug substance manufacturing uh, technology that, that most companies are uh, developing on their own. And some of uh, uh, we are also collaborating with Nimble now to come up with, with ways to advance this technology as in partnership with other companies. So this is a technology, next slide please, which uh, I don't want to uh, go through the benefits of it. It's, it's pretty self-obvious, but uh, the, the reduction in the cost of manufacturing, the facility footprint, uh, the flexibility, the increased ability to control our processes, and then the ability to introduce products that rapidly advance through the clinic into the manufacturing settings. I think all these combined are uh, offer a one heck of a benefit for, for the biopharmaceutical industries. So what we have developed is a end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing platform that we call Agile. If you go to the next slide, it is based on a perfusion uh, reactor up front and that combines with a continuous downstream process uh, uh, with, with our normal uh, unit operations that 
uh, for a, that are required for monoclonal antibodies, but they, they are conducted in a continuous way. And we can now go from a vial uh, thaw from a master cell bank all the way to a, a final purified drug substance uh, in, in one continuous loop. If you go to the next slide, this, this is a picture of the overall skid that we've built. Uh, this is fully operational now. Uh, if you go to the next slide, here's another, another picture. And we have demonstrated this now at 200 liter scale, which is our feed scale for this rig which is more than enough for producing uh, clinical quantities of, of antibodies. And we've now applied this to two uh, different active projects that, that are in the GSK portfolio and uh, have demonstrated comparability with standard fed batch uh, processes uh, with exquisite control of product quality uh, and the CQAs. So this is where we sit with our uh, upstream uh, continuous manufacturing technology if you go to the next slide, I just want to also give you a highlight of another technology that is coming uh, from our advanced manufacturing technology labs in GSK, and this is one we call Polykaeda. This is a technology for a uh, novel sterile drug product manufacturer. If you go to the next slide, one of the things that we, we found was the sterile manufacturing uh, has been uh, in, in a lot of demand and the CMOs are hit or miss. The standards are not usually held up and most of the regulatory issues occur in this, in this space. So the challenge that was given to the team was can we create a technology that completely encloses and is a continuous manufacturing uh, uh, setup that will get rid of the, the need for us to ensure sterility during filling. And the technology essentially is a very simple technology. Uh, if you go to the next slide, it is a long continuous uh, manufacturing uh, tube that has a feed at the front end, a depyrogenation tunnel, cooling, filling, stoppering, and crimping at the back end. And this is one tube that is completely enclosed. Uh, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> This uh, has no sensors inside the machine. It has a very small footprint. It is, it is uh, by its very nature, it's modular. We can de disassemble and, and wash each of these uh, units uh, completely. Uh, and e the entire machine is completely sterilizable by dry heat. There are no glove ports. This can be put in a con uh, completely uncontrolled, or at least we are saying a grade C, environment without any issues for particle contamination. And we have now demonstrated this uh, unit it, uh, operating at uh, the, the normal clinical scale. And we are looking to partner this with, with some equipment manufacturer because GSK is not in the business of uh, building, uh, building continuous manufacturing rigs. And th that's where we sit with this technology. But this is a very exciting technology that can, be, can also be put in the front end of a continuous LIO a technology that we are developing in our vaccines organization. So this could become an end-to-end, -end, uh, vial to vial. If we put this at the end of our agile skid, we can have a vial to vial, end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing setup for biopharmaceuticals as was uh, described by some of the committee members uh, right in the beginning. So that's, that's a technology number two. The third technology I wanted to uh, just touch on, if you go to the next slide, is, uh, is the so-called digital twin. Uh, do you have the next slide? We may be encountering another um, tech issue. Um, if you just give us one moment, Narendra, sorry. Okay. Okay, maybe I can I can just keep going while you catch up with your slides. Uh, digital twin is something that everyone is developing, and the benefits are are uh, immense. And ultimately, I think they they will be required to go to this Industry 4.0 vision that Mike described in his keynote address. Uh, but where we are uh, currently in GSK are we are building the foundations of establishing the digital twins. We have in the biofarm space, we have data-driven models uh, that are being developed for the upstream processes. 
with real-time multivariate statistical process monitoring uh, for production bioreactors across the clinical and commercial sites. We have these MSPM models uh, in use now uh, and are helping our uh, factories troubleshoot in real time. Uh, Raman sensors and other sensors are adding to our product knowledge and process knowledge. And then we are now scaling it out to additional drug substance uh, unit operations like the N minus one bioreactor, the harvest vessel, uh, the me mechanistic models in place uh, that can be characterized by first principles like LIO are being developed now. Uh, but many of these are empirical models at the moment and not, not first principles models. I think where we see uh, the technology going in the future is uh, to connect the building blocks and integrate into advanced process control systems to improve quality safety uh, of our plants. Uh, more robust processes uh, move from the monitoring type of an approach to a feedback control uh, and and with with new sensor technologies uh, that can directly measure CQAs in real time for antibodies, we can actually have a much more uh, direct control of our feed uh, uh, that goes into our reactors. We can enable uh, predict uh, we, we can predict first design and in silico optimization for our manufacturing processes, and then uh, we can also ultimately support the vision of this industry 4.0 that is laid out, which is the ultimately lights off, lights off manufacture of biopharmaceuticals. If you go to the next slide, uh, I think one of, uh, a couple of points that I wanted to make uh, from our efforts with Digital Twin is that we do need clear guidance for model verification and validation, maintenance and lifecycle management, including post-file. Uh, model optimization and updates. How how will the regulators uh, inspect these? What kind of data will be expected? I think there's a lot of ambiguity in the current regulations or lack thereof in terms of how these models are going to be get, get regulated. Uh, and then the second thing I would like to uh, reflect on is that the global regulatory divergence is a real significant barrier. I think this is one of the FASM reports uh, most important points that I would like to underscore here is to to the to the extent that FDA has taken the leadership position in in enabling and in, in emerging technologies. I think if they can take the next step and extend that leadership to coming up with international regulatory norms and uh, guidances that all the other regulators uh, are are willing to sign up to like the ICHQ-13, I think that will be a big step forward in enabling an innovation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just a few uh, reflections now that are not necessarily innovation or technology related that I want to leave you with, which are that we, we as an industry, uh, I think, uh, really stepped up and delivered innovations in, in a really fast way to enable COVID therapeutics. I would say that this would not have been possible without without the FDA's support uh, and guidance along the way. I think we've learned a lot in terms of how much data is actually required and how much data can be uh, supplied post uh, initial submission, either during review or post approval. And, and this is uh, continually a process of refinement that we're going through. I think we got on that journey uh, for oncology products with breakthrough designations, but I think now we have come uh, come a long way with, with COVID therapeutics where uh, the agencies have allowed us to, to uh, take very smart scientific regulatory risks and provide the data as we go. So I think we need, we need more of that uh, in the innovation space. Uh, easier to easier post launch change mechanisms uh, for enabling site transfers, scale ups, I think we already have uh, mechanisms in place for uh, for managing these, but I think for innovations, they become a, a much higher bar. So making it clear in terms of what kind of data expectations and knowledge expectations are there for new technologies will be a big step forward. I think one thing that all of us are struggling with is raw material shortages. 
and unfortunately we've had to uh, scramble uh, to uh, establish and work with long lead times up to 18 months for some critical raw materials and that has caused a lot of work on establishing uh, redundant suppliers and alternate sources of raw materials so how can we establish robustness in our supply chains uh, by allowing uh, alternate raw materials to be qualified and uh, and used in a much more facile way than it is currently done. Um, I think the last thing I would leave you with is the whole travel ban has exposed a key failure mode for our, our regulatory approval process where the inspectors cannot visit our factories. <clears throat> And I, I would say that the FDA also played a leadership role in this and, and worked with our, our sites to do virtual inspections. But uh, we are finding that each regulatory agency is, is in a different uh, maturity scale as far as virtual inspections is concerned. So this is something that can benefit from new technologies. If you can go to the next slide. We have a suite of technologies in GSK that we are already using for uh, connecting our operators, uh, uh, doing the training, doing the troubleshooting, and these technologies with smart glasses and some other software uh, tools can probably be utilized for uh, regulatory inspections. I'm just putting this out there that is there a way for the regulators to get together and, and pick a technology that the, that the industry can get behind and have it standard uh, available across, across the board. Next slide, please. So all in all, I would say that the supply chain agility uh, uh, will be enabled with modular and integrated drug substance and drug product continuous manufacturing technologies. We will uh, reduce cost of goods with process intensification and continuous processes. And we will have an enhanced process understanding and control via digital twin. All these things can only happen with a strong support uh, uh, and enabling uh, regulatory pathways. I think uh, I, I, I won't belabor the, in the, the international regulatory co cooperation is essential for us. Otherwise, the lowest common denominator always wins and innovation is, is what loses out. So I think I'll just leave you with the thought that COVID-19 pandemic and the innovation that, that the industry embraced as well as the uh, regulators enabled has op should open our eyes to what is possible. And I think we can use that as a blueprint for, for establishing new ways of working together. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Baum. Really a remarkably uh, uh, insightful presentation. Uh, really uh, appreciate you uh, sharing some of the new technologies and your ideas of how that should move forward. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, we will uh, defer questions uh, and elaborations to the discussion session, which will take place uh, once we conclude the next presentation. So um, without further ado, let me jump directly into introducing the next speaker. Uh, the speaker is Jessica Santimi. She is Senior Director of Continuous Manufacturing Business at Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, where she is responsible for uh, really the growth of the continuous manufacturing business. Um, she has uh, joined uh, Thermo Fisher through Patheon in 2013, uh, which was an acquisition, um, and uh, is, um, her ag educational background is uh, in, in uh, biotechnology, both at the BS and MS levels. So please, uh, Jessica, uh, we're eager to hear your presentation. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Wait slides to come up. So I'm Jessica Satimi. I'm excited for the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm representing Thermo Fisher Scientific, um, which is a global leader in serving science. So I thought it might be helpful to spend a second or two describing Thermo Fisher Scientific because I think uh, maybe a less known name um, from an industry perspective in a forum such as this. Uh, but we have over 90,000 employees, about 1.4 billion that we invest each year in R&D. And I think what's it's critically important is that Thermo Fisher Scientific is a broad partner to the pharmaceutical industry, supplying things like instrumentation, single-use technologies, companion diagnostics, 
uh, diagnostics themselves, reagents, especially chemicals, and it, in particular and relevant for today's discussion, a full offering of pharmaceutical manufacturing services. So I'm really speaking on behalf of our contract development and manufacturing portion of Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, which has a broad scale of, of offerings as well. Um, so also important from a perspective standpoint in that at Thermo Fisher Scientific, we're a contract developer and manufacturer of both small and large molecule, as well as cell and gene therapies. And this includes both the drug substance, the drug product, packaging and logistics. So really get involved all along the value chain and the supply chain for pharmaceutical products. Um, if we wanna to go to slide four, please. So I, th I thought today I'm taking a bit of a different approach. I thought my current role today is all about driving adoption, commercialization of continuous manufacturing for oral solid dose. And as a CDMO, we're uniquely positioned, right? And that we can provide access to this technology for pharma companies of all sizes and at all stages of development without internal capital investment. So we really feel like we're a critical part of the driving adoption of new technologies. And so we certainly have a perspective on that. But I wanted to provide some commentary that's more broad, broad from a Thermo Fisher perspective and the broad sense that we have in the supply chain around the particular innovations that were in the report. Um, so if we want to move to the next slide. Um, I really thought about this as the, you know, post pandemic, have we changed the criteria that we would use to evaluate what are the technologies we want to accelerate, decelerate, spend our time and energy on as an industry, right? And I'm not sure that the pandemic has really changed these, but it certainly has emphasized them. And so as I, I look at these technologies and I think about how we as industry would, uh, would think about if these are the right ones or what's missing, I think we really have to focus on are they going to enable speed? Are they going to enable flexibility? Is there going to be reduction in risk? And some of these comments have been made by earlier speakers. And so I think it, it's an interesting theme that we're finding here. I think uh, I wanted to define each of these because the rest of kind of my commentary really falls into what are these criteria and how do we think about innovation and pharma manufacturing as it relates to them. And the first one I wanted to, to define is really speed. And the commentary here is not on regulatory approval timelines. In fact, I, I did want to take a, minute, a moment to really commend the FDA for the response in the pandemic and the ability to maintain focus on safety and efficacy. It's a critical time for our industry to be able to respond and we really admire the, the response from the FDA. Really the comment here is on speed as it relates to speed to clinic or speed to market or overall agility and in particular around pharma, pharma manufacturing and the supply chain. We expect and are seeing already that the, the strong response times of the pharma supply chain in the pandemic has really set a new precedence and standard for our customers, meaning pharma companies of all shapes and sizes. And that's technologies that are actually gonna be adopted and are gonna drive uh, the industry forward have to enable speed in some way. So examples here would be things that would reduce cycle times or process simplifications such as continuous manufacturing that really help uh, eliminate waste from a time perspective uh, in the development or even commercialization cycle for, for molecules. Second comment here is on flexibility. I think that this here is really, I'm defining it in terms of scale and geography, and it's really the ability to react to changing market environments, changing market demands, supply security, and essentially speed, right? So examples here would be how do we create flexibility or maybe platform uh, solutions that allow us to scale into new geographies quickly? Or how do we think about automation and knowledge share that will create flexi flexibility along the, the supply chain for pharmaceuticals? Last comment here, and I think we've heard it um, already, but today is reducing risk, right? So this is really related to supply chain, but also process reliability. And I believe that it, visibility, control, redundancy uh, will continue to grow increasingly more important post pandemic uh, if it wasn't already, which it was, right? And so anything we can do from a technology front that's gonna reduce batch to batch variability, improve process reliability, are all technologies that can be critically important for reducing risk and therefore I think have strong legs uh, to drive from an adoption commercialization perspective. And I think we heard this um, 
a little earlier, right? I did, there's innovations that are focused around great, uh, great science, right? But they have to drive the business uh, case and they have to drive that to get the adoption that we would like to see within industry and really drive change. If we drive, uh, or if we move forward to slide seven or slide six, sorry. Um, so what I did was take a, a pretty quantitative approach for a qualitative uh, topic, but I wanted to assess you know, the innovations written in the report, where would they apply along the various supply chains and where would they apply against this new criteria in a post pandemic um, phase. And really what pops through for us from a Thermo Fisher perspective is that accelerating things like process intensification, process control and automation, as well as modular systems, we believe will have significant impact to industry along multiple modalities, right? And these will have a path forward for adoption or commercialization because there is that tangible, tangible business impact that's necessary. And that goes back to accelerating uh, timelines, building in flexibility or reducing overall risk. We go on to slide eight. Um, I also spent time thinking about what may be missing here. So we, as we come out of pandemic like conditions, what would, would anything change in the five to 10 year, year horizon with the idea that we want to be staying ahead of the curve here with our efforts? And I think that there are a couple of categories of technologies or innovations that may be worth time and energy. I think the first we, we, we just heard about, right, this idea, idea of traceability of starting materials. Um, certainly a challenge um, in the pandemic across multiple platforms, um, but how do we improve traceability and therefore reduce supply chain risk for non-GMP materials? I think that this is an interesting area to think about some of the technologies that have been deployed in the GMP starting material space or even in finished good tracking. The second uh, we, we talked a lot about internally was platform technologies. And I think this is an interesting one and one that I have conversations on almost daily in my own business for continuous manufacturing for oral solid dose, right? This idea of can we standardize platforms within modalities and within starting materials or components that would all enable speed, but also enable flexibility and therefore reducing risk, right? If you think about what you can do to, from a data perspective or modeling perspective also feeds into this, but how do we help enable tech transfers or how do we help better with post-approval switching of and adopting these new technologies and having a common set of platforms across industry may be a helpful way to do that, right? So you can see that being deployed in things like continuous OSD, but also things like resins and media more on the biologics or cell and gene therapy side of things. The last two um, are around digital. And I think about that a lot because I think, you know, we talk about Pharma 4.0 from a perspective of adding digital into our manufacturing capabilities on the, on the shop floor, but also digital becomes more and more important. And we just heard about digital twins. So this is the same commentary here, but how do we do more from a digital perspective so that we're doing more less uh, potentially in lab or on the manufacturing floor? But also, how do we make sure that we're exchanging knowledge at the same time? So I broke this into two. I think the digital piece around modeling, we just talked a little about GSK's efforts in digital twin. I call that a, how is a great example here as well of how to expand what we're doing maybe even earlier, right, in silico development. And then the in silico modeling for process, uh, processes themselves. Um, there's certainly things that are, are being done today from an advanced process and formulation modeling perspective. And I think the more time we spent here that reduces some of the risk or waste uh, earlier in development, uh, the better off we'll be as industry. The last one, uh, again, on digital, right? This is about knowledge share or knowledge management. And the idea that to drive adoption and eventual commercialization of innovative technologies, we have to come together uh, as consortium or collaboration across academia, academia industry, um, industry groups, as well as regulators, right? And there has to be that coming together of thought partnership, but also this free exchange and knowledge management so that we can continue to progress as industry. I think this has been done well in some of the new technologies that are being pushed through, continuous manufacturing for OSD, maybe being a great example here. But along the supply chain and value chain, we have to make sure we're doing this. So innovative technologies could be disruptive and have and a positive effect at one point in the supply chain, but kind of a negative effect 
down supply chain. So we have to make sure we're being very broad as we work together to advance uh, these innovations. Um, final slide, please. Slide nine. So I, I thought I would also take a moment here to talk about um, our experience with the Emerging Technologies team or the ETP program. Um, we have had experience as of partnering with our customers, uh, again, from a perspective of continuous manufacturing for oral solid dose. But I will comment here, right, most of our engagement with the, with the regulate, regulators has been on behalf of customers for a specific product. Um, and we felt like these engagements are very effective, very helpful for a specific product um, as we think about control strategies or overall regulatory strategies. However, I will highlight that I do think that there is an opportunity here, and this came through in the report, of how do we think about more engagement from a platform perspective uh, so that we can help drive down this perception of regulatory risk for adopting new technologies such as a, a CDC process. I think we, we applaud and certainly continue to value the guidance that the FDA has, has written on things like CDC, the ICHQ 13 guidelines. These are critical steps for industry. But what we find in our engagement with customers is there is still a lot of perception around regulatory risk here. And we feel like the more that we can bring it into kind of shop floor, have discussions around particular technology suites, the better off we will be as a, as a CDMO industry, for example, to support our customers, but the more comfortable our customers will be with the various technologies that they have access to out in industry. And I think this will ultimately help drive adoption. And within the driving adoption of an overall system like CDC, you're also driving adoption of things like process intensification, right? Advanced process control and automation and things like modular systems and, and specifically for the thermal Fisher uh, uh, continuous manufacturing line. So that would be helpful um, to understand kind of our engagement from our perspective. Um, obviously CDMOs are a little bit in the unique space and that we're not developing our own molecules. We're really working on behalf of our customers and in partnership. And therefore, our engagement with regulators is always from a product specific standpoint. And I feel like this may be an opportunity, especially in driving adoption of these more advanced technologies that I think we, we can do more um, as an industry. So with that last slide is just a thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to share some thoughts here this morning. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. That was a really a, a very concise and focused uh, response and particularly appreciate your assessment of those six technology areas, uh, which are relevant, which are not. Um, so uh, what we're shifting to now is a, a discussion um, by the community uh, to the three presentations that we've heard. And again, I would uh, encourage um, the community to use uh, you know, the, the, the Slido tool and, and, and the, you know, the chat uh, as, as vehicles for uh, raising your questions. But um, maybe in order to get things started, um, uh, I'd have a question uh, that either of you can address. Uh, I noticed, uh, Jessica, in your, um, in your table, you had included additive manufacturing. Um, but it, it did not seem to be an area where you see a lot of accelerated um, movement. Uh, could either of you uh, address this, um, you know, where does additive manufacturing fit in the portfolio that uh, either a CDMO or a, an innovator like GSK uh, might want to uh, engage in, in, in their manufacturing portfolio? Yeah, so I, it, it's interesting, right? I, we've recently, we've actually spent a good amount of time thinking about this particular technology. And I think if, uh, from a CDMO perspective, right, we were really driven by where are our industry partners going and what are companies like a GSK thinking about and driving towards. Because it's important for us to be adopting technologies where there's pipeline of product coming through. And it, it's interesting that we're still at the point where not quite understanding broadly how industry is thinking about things like additive manufacturing. Certainly there's an, an approved product that's, that's been 
uh, pushed through by Appreciate. And I think it's it's an interesting one to watch. Uh, and at this point, we're kind of taking the stance of we need to figure out how do we collaborate and get in some of this kind of consortia to think about advancing that. And how broadly can we apply that technology, right? And how many products does that actually help us solve a formulation challenge for? And then how do we scale? And those are some of our, our key questions still around that particular technology. And there's multiple iterations, right, of how you can do additive manufacturing. But uh, that, that's kind of where our, our thinking is at this point. Uh, and Dr. Baum, do you have any uh, ideas about additive? <clears throat> you need to okay. can, can you hear me yes okay yeah i don't have much to add to jessica i think that was an excellent summary of where the the industry stands with additive manufacturing we are not at the cusp of taking it uh industrializing it uh, we, we are dabbling in it but it's not showing itself to be a an area that that we are focusing on right now very good um, thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from the community? Uh, yes, we have a question from Alan O'Connor, um, and I'll also put it into the chat. Um, he asked, for established manufacturing processes, how do you incentivize new advanced manufacturing technologies? Uh, any any response from the the speakers or from the community at large? This could this could be under the same umbrella as my earlier suggestion of creating a separate breakthrough category for key manufacturing innovations and maybe giving incentive to the industry to ad adopt them in existing processes. Otherwise, I, I think it'll be hard to justify uh, capital investment in new technologies unless it, it's a quick payback, in which case we, we will go through the, the process anyway. I think for the technologies that are going to require some time to get adopted, I think there may be some innovative regulatory mechanism that might incentivize the industry. I would agree with those comments. I think we were often faced with what are what's going to be the cogs benefit, right, uh, of doing this. And there is a time cost for the additional regulatory approval. If you were to say, in my case, switch from the batch to continuous process, but we do see that as a rate limiter, and I think that's why we've seen more products come through for continuous OSD through development than we have seen commercial switches. Very. Um, challenging there's a perceived risk there too uh, of the the effort that goes in when you you're competing with a process that that gets you the same quality product um, at the end of the day and so for these manu advanced manufacturing technologies where there's a historic if you will uh, or a standard technology convincing the new it has to come with some some mechanism right to, to help from a regulatory perspective in addition to the, the value benefits to the product itself Well, if I could, uh, you know, inject another question, uh, uh, Dr. Baum, you you talked about uh, fill finish and and sterile operation and showed a really remarkable example, um, which uh, requires you know no hands on, uh, at least within that facility. Certainly, the idea of robotics was one that um, you know emerged in 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 our discussions in earlier workshops. Uh, and of course, often it is said that the ideal robot is a pump. Uh, you just turn it on and material moves. Uh, where do you see the role of, of robotics, uh, you know, in the industry in general, perhaps outside of, um, you know, fill finish? Thanks, Rex. Thanks, Rex. I think one of the things I would like to point out is even with the robotic filling sterile technology, the regulations are lagging behind. So some of the Annex 1 regulations that require us to put uh, saddle plates to, to show uh, particulate control, et cetera, for environmental monitoring, those are by definition not necessary, but we get caught in this regulate, regulations require it. So how do we get out of that 
out of that catch-22. And this is something that I would like uh, the regulators to maybe work and enable a uh, update of the reg regulations for environmental monitoring when you have a completely closed robotic system for sterile manufacturing. <clears throat> I'll just make that point. Um, Mike, do you have any comment in response to that? Thank you. I was uh, had a bit of a problem here uh, unmuting. I mean, there's, um, you know, we, we, one of the things we're going to do, as I mentioned before, is, you know, we're going to be putting together these white papers. We're going to be looking for, for public comment and public feedback uh, on those things. So, you know, it's duly noted. Um, you know, I appreciate the feedback. Um, we will take that back and take that into consideration uh, as we continue to move these, um, uh, you know, uh, different technologies forward and continue to flesh out our uh, regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. And some of these regulations are European, so it's not it's not under FDA's gift to change those. So my question is, how can the FDA lead in that change? Well, we, you know, we, we're working, you know, through Q13, you know, we're, we're the uh, lead on on that particular um, uh, uh, guidance that, uh, you know, again, it's it's been um, uh, shared publicly. So we're looking for comments around that. Uh, we do meet routinely with ICH as well as with other international regulatory bodies um, and, uh, you know, other, um, uh, I guess, consortium uh, to talk about these kinds of things. Uh, but as you can imagine, um, it's tough enough doing it uh, within the FDA when you start bringing in international regulators, um, it, it even becomes a bit more difficult because you're trying to meet the needs of um, uh, regulatory agencies that may handle things, you know, differently and have different opinions, obviously, than, than, than we may have. Um, so that's going to take a while. But, but, you know, it is our intent to be able to, um, uh, and we are working collaboratively with those groups and seeing how we can move that forward. Thank you. Next, there's another question from uh, Tim. He asked, can you suggest some ways that a high QMM rating might incentivize a company? Uh, I think, uh, please un unmute uh, Mike. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah, for some reason, it, it's telling me that I, I, I can't unmute myself. Uh, so. I'll, I'll keep the mute uh, button off. Um, you know, we're looking at ways to incentivize the uh, industry. One of the things we want to do is to get companies to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, give us the opportunity to come in, uh, take a look at their uh, quality systems and be able to start um, uh, looking at, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, rating those things so that the uh, public um, uh, perhaps, uh, again, we're, we're still trying to figure out our, our way through this. Um, so I don't know if these ratings or, or how they'll be shared or exactly whom they will be shared with, because uh, we, we need to work that out. But, um, you know, the, the incentive would be that companies, because uh, there's companies out there and right now, there is no way to know which companies are working at a higher level of quality. Um, you know, via their quality management systems. So by uh, grading that or rating those systems, it then gives um, some of the buyers as well as distributors uh, a kind of insight into the quality level of a particular uh, manufacturing uh, firm or company. What that then does is that, you know, the higher the QMM, the thinking is that the more reliable that uh, company would be to, uh, continually, to continually provide uh, uh, finished materials uh, to that distributor, to that uh, you know group purchasing organization, or wherever they may be, uh, you know, distributing their products to. So it gives them, uh, it gives those individuals um, some kind of uh, insight into perhaps the um, uh, continuity of supply that they can depend on. Um, granted, there there may be some additional costs that uh, uh, may be incurred because the company is working at a higher uh, a level of quality than others. Um, but again, all that needs to be looked at, all that needs to be uh, uh, figured out. 
but it is to incentivize um, companies to get to a higher state of quality so that they will have you know, perhaps less recalls, perhaps less drug shortages, um, and provide um, more continuity into the uh, uh, drug supply chain. Uh, there's a question for uh, Jessica and the panel. Um, this is from Janine Jameson regarding CDMO platform technologies. Please, can we hear some discussion about the opportunities and challenges around the approach? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think one that we wrestle with quite often, right? And that a CDMO could pick a platform, but unless the rest of industry has picked that same platform, right, we can't serve. Um, so, you know, very often, even now with traditional manufacturing, we're asked for a specific piece of equipment because it's a standard at X company, which is a different standard at Y company, right? And so this is why I, I talk a lot about this uh, knowledge, knowledge management, knowledge selling, sharing, and coming together so that we're together kind of as, representing these standards, because for a CDMO, we don't have kind of the, the capital basis to go invest in every variation that a particular company has set up as their platform. We very much have to think about how do we set up a platform kind of industry-wide, or if it's not platform, what are the technologies, tools that we can apply on top of a particular you know, piece of equipment, if you will, that will enable easier tech transfer? And that would eliminate the need for like specific technology suites, et cetera. So it's a tricky space to be in as a CDMO and that we have to really do an assessment of where's most of the industry going and also what works in a multi-product environment. And those are often not the same. Um, and we much like to spend time on what could we layer ahead of that, right? On top of it in terms of modeling work, et cetera, to enable any specific piece of the equipment to do the job. Um, but it, it is one that I think we have to continue to think about as we advance more and more of these kind of continuous processes, added to manufacturing being another where this is going to come up as a challenge for us. I would say that consortia like Nimble can play a key role to help industry mm -hmm. develop, uh, you know, common platforms around control strategies. What are the expectations from a continuous manufacturing setting? So I think we are engaging with Nimble with that in mind. And I'm hoping that at least for continuous biopharm manufacturing, that's going to be a key output that is going to enable the whole industry to agree on standards uh, and and not each, each company having their own thing. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Baum. Um, given the potential for the uh, continuous sterile processing approach, what would GSK's interest and role be in broader deployment by Todd P? Thanks, Todd. Uh, by broader, if you mean um, global, I think that is that is a that is an area that we are evaluating right now. Is can this technology actually open doors for local manufacturing in? Mm -hmm in areas of the world that don't have sterile manufacturing, it's a very low cost of entry. So we are doing those types of evaluations. But uh, at the same time, I said, we are not a equipment manufacturer. So we are also looking to partner with, with uh, companies that will help us take this technology uh, and industrialize it. Well, just to follow up on that, so you are currently working with a with a equipment manufacturer uh, to develop this. So, um, you know, uh, does that equipment manufacturer need additional incentives to to go outside and, and market this product? Or, uh, how do you envision that happening? So we have just uh, reached the point of having the prototype built and uh, and and established. Uh, that it, it it meets the criteria that it was built for. So who we partner with and how we scale this up for a global reach is something that we are just tackling right now. Great. So there's, there's a question uh, for the FDA, it's more general. 
What has been the FDA's response to the recommendations made by the report? Any additional feedback from Arnab G? Yeah, this is Mike. Just, um, uh, I just wanted to read the question again. What is the FDA's response to the record? Well, I mean the you know the the, the whole um, point. Well, first I, I, I appreciate the question. Um, the the answer to the question is that you know we've taken the uh, feedback that we've gotten and we've uh, uh, internalized that or shared it with the appropriate groups, and um, based on some of those recommendations, uh, we are uh, you know making you know the changes that that have come uh, across to us or that have been shared with us. Uh, we want to continue to get that kind of input. Hence, hence the reason for today's meeting to get involved in more discussion. Um, because sometimes just getting these comments back, um, it doesn't really provide us always with the opportunity to engage in a discussion and maybe get a little more clarity around some of those recommendations. Um, but as I had pointed out, um, you know, the, the emerging technology program, we're advancing that. And we're going into a second version, which you'll hear about, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the next two days. Um, and that was part of the feedback that we were given as well. Um, some of the things that we realized is that um, the comments that were made, we were working on internally, but we weren't at a point to really openly share uh, where we were in some of that, because some of it was in the infancy and in the uh, early stages of um, uh, addressing some of those concerns. Uh, one of the reasons for the follow-up uh, today is to be able to um, you know, share a little more openly with what we've been doing because things have matured since the report, uh, since we got the recommendations from the report. And also it informs us that we do need to do a better job of communicating externally. Um, so there are a number of ways for us to do that. One of the ways uh, we, we had um, uh, over the last two days, the previous two days, we had the Pharmaceutical Quality Symposium where we talked about a lot of these things that we are doing internally. So we're trying to use whatever avenues we have um, uh, that are appropriate for us to use to be able to communicate more broadly with the industry to let them know where we are, um, how we've uh, moved things forward uh, based on the feedback that we've gotten and to continue to engage like today in a dialogue uh, to try to get additional clarity around some of those recommendations. Yeah, thank you. I think Jim Agalaco has his hand up for a long time. Maybe yes, I, uh, I guess I remember a time when the CGMPs came from industry and regulation was adopted by FDA. I'm just thinking that as we look at innovative technologies, our guidance is more of a hindrance than an actual benefit. Uh, should we have more of the what to from FDA and less of the how to? Uh, I, I just struggle with that concern and question. Well, you know, that that concern has been has been going on for for, for quite a while, um, you know, in terms of how we deal with it. You know, we, we want to get input uh, from the um, uh, industry itself. But since we regulate the industry, um, you know, we do have to put out guidances. You know, we, we I, I can't tell you how many emails I get in the course of a day, literally in the course of a day. I'm um, saying, well, you know, what does the FDA think about this? You know, can, can the FDA give us some advice, guidance or help? Um, so in order to kind of standardize things across the industry um, and also to be able to, um, you know, hopefully standardize them where applicable and where appropriate on an international stage, um, you know, we need to provide guidance to individuals so that they know what the expectations are internally, because with that, you know, within the FDA, without those expectations being shared, um, and typically we do that through guidance, um, we would receive all sorts of, um, uh, you know, feedback and we, we'd start getting into um, uh, discussions about what's appropriate or what's not. So we've got to kind of, you know, set the goalpost so that individuals know what we're looking for, what the expectations are to standardize, harmonize and uh, uh, expedite submissions as well as the review of those submissions. Um, th there is a question that was posted uh, some time ago on how the FDA is approaching the introduction of artificial intelligence tool in uh, pharma manufacturing processes. Uh, I believe you touched on that, but perhaps you'd like to elaborate on that. Well, I, I think some of the um, uh, other presenters over the course of the workshop will get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, so I, I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, um, for what they're going to present, and they're probably better positioned than I to, to maybe get into a little more of the details there. But I can tell you, you know, in artificial intelligence, that's an area that's still evolving uh, within the FDA and, and how we deal with that. 
Um, so, you know, we, we only have, you know, a finite number of resources and we need to prioritize, uh, you know, the areas we're focusing on. Um, and while artificial intelligence is one of those, um, that's, that's an area right now that is not at the highest priority of, of um, you know, our, our focus, our time and attention for those limited resources. Um, we also need, uh, uh, in particular, the industry, you know, input from the industry uh, to be able to help us uh, and guide us in that area in terms of how that um, uh, how uh, artificial intelligence is being used um, and, uh, you know, kind of inform us so that we better understand it. Because let's face it, we're, you know, we're not the experts uh, in artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, we do need to get that input from some of the ex from the experts within both the industry as well as in academia. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I guess in the last seven minutes, there's a couple more questions. One question is from John E. Um, I also posted in the chat. What are the characteristics of FDA bioprocess research collaborations and the community that have been helpful and unhelpful to the FDA? Yeah, what I will do for the um... For the sake of expediency, um, I will allow that. That, that question uh, will be uh, uh, answered to some extent. Uh, you know, you know, as we go through the uh, workshop with the other FDA uh, presenters, uh, they'd be better positioned to to help answer that question. I, I don't get involved in that on a day to day basis. So we do have, you know, Joel Welch as as well as Larry uh, Lee are the ones that have been uh, involved more closely with that. So we'll leave it to them, uh, you know, either in their presentation or if the question's brought up again during their panel discussion to provide a little more detail around that. Uh, Linda, are there other questions that are in the queue? Uh, yes, well, Jeff Barker has four upvotes. Um, if you want to discuss this further, I uh, said a discussion of whether assurance of resilient supply chains, site sourcing and technology choices are within the FDA, re FDA remit may be in order. Yeah, and you know, the only thing I can respond to that is that, you know, yeah, it, it, it may be in order if that's indeed the way the FDA wants to go. Um, those decisions uh, in terms of the FDA authority are, are not within my, my purview or in my control. Um, so, you know, I would leave that to, um, you know, the, the, the powers to be um, that have more direct influence over that than I. Oh, um, also Tim uh, C asks, are there any impactful technologies that the committee report did not address? Well, it's kind of hard for our committee to respond to that. So I guess we need to have someone else, uh, um, you know, contribute. Rex, from my, from my stamp, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, sir. Oh, no, I was going to say, from my standpoint, I mean, what we received, you know, back in the report is is, is what we asked for. So it, it, it met our needs um, at that time. And again, we want to continue to, um, uh, uh, you know, we want to continue the discussion and the feedback that we got um, by, by, you know, here today and then as we continue to present on this area and as we continue to uh, you know publish and have public meetings or at least um, uh, uh, schedule public meetings get continued feedback from the industry as well as the public at large. I think uh, Tim has a comment. Yes, uh, thanks, Linda, and thanks, Mike and Jessica and Narendra for, for your uh, remarks. Really, really interesting. Uh, you know, I guess with regard to my question about the technologies, uh, perhaps something we can think about over the course of the, this workshop is how for those technologies that we feel will be impactful, how we can rally together to enable those specific technologies and what actions we can take collectively to push them forward. 
And Tim, in my eyes, that's exactly the reason why we want to have these kinds of discussions. So I couldn't, you know, I, I applaud you for the, for, for, you know, for the comment. That's exactly what we, we want to do and exactly what we need to do. Um, it does need to be a collaboration. You know, there, there's times where, you know, I, I've gotten engaged with discussions, uh, you know, with, with, with sponsors that have submitted applications. And they always want to know what is the FDA thinking? You know, how's the FDA going to handle, you know, all, all of these different things? And the thing is, you know, we really do want the input and we do seek the input from the industry. Um, you know, we can't satisfy everybody. We can't make everybody happy. You know, you know I, I think that's well known. Um, but, you know, we, we want to get that input so it can better inform our decision making and, and our um, uh, path forward. So, um, you, know, you know, thank you for that. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. Good. Well, very good. I think we've, uh, you know, we've we've gone through a, a fairly exhaustive list of questions. Um, I think, according to our schedule here, uh, the uh, the audience has earned a, a ten minute break, uh, and uh, will be um, reconvening at eleven forty uh, when uh, with session two, which will, um, you know, have a series of presentations, uh, as Mike alluded to, first from the FDA and then from, from the community. So uh, I invite you to enjoy the break and hopefully come back uh, in, in 10 minutes to rejoin our discussion. And welcome back everyone. I hope you stretch your legs um, and settled in for this session. Um, so session two is really about ex existing mechanisms to enable innovation. Um, hopefully you all saw the poll results in Slido um, that suggest that um, the community that's gathered here believes that um, the innovation that is most likely to have the greatest opportunity to advance pharmaceutical manufacturing is um, process intensification with a, a reasonably close second in modeling and digital design. Um, but in this session, I'm going to encourage you again to post thoughts for discussion and questions for the speakers in the Slido uh, poll. I think we had a question in the last session. Do you want questions you know, in a separate tab than the ideas? I think we're monitoring both, so don't worry about getting it wrong, but um, I would recommend that the questions for the speakers go in the questions and answers. Ideas for discussions, um, can be posted in that ideas session if it's not really a question, but a discussion theme. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to talk about the goals of the session this morning. And in this session, we will be discussing the existing mechanisms and frameworks that are available to facilitate the deployment of the innovations that have been discussed in the report and were covered in session one. So we're going to focus on examining the respective contributions and linkages of those mechanisms uh, so that uh, they can work in, and how they work to accelerate the Im implementation of innovation. Um, we're going to try to reserve session three for a discussion of what gaps in those mechanisms exist um, to lead them through the workshop on how we might address those gaps. Right. So the guiding questions we asked um, our speakers to consider are what are the current mechanisms that exist within this innovation ecosystem that contribute to the acceleration of innovation? And through what means are these efforts coordinated or linked to leverage the outcomes? And our goal is really to develop an asset map of existing mechanisms and frameworks that facilitate innovation in pharmaceutical manufacturing. And that landscape view will be used to inform that gaps analysis for the discussion in session three. So with that, I'd like to get us started by introducing Dr. Larry Lee and Dr. Joel Welch of FDA CBER as our first speakers. So Larry is the Deputy Super Office Director of Science and the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, as well as the Director and Chair of the Emerging Technologies Team. Um, Dr. Lee's been with the FDA since 2005. He served as a regulatory scientist, team lead, associate director for science, deputy office director, and now super, uh, deputy super office director. Um, in 2016, Dr. Lee was appointed to the Senior Biomedical Research Service because of his extensive regulatory and scientific contributions to manufacturing science and uh, complex drug substances and products and emergency, uh, emerging pharmaceutical technologies. 
Prior to joining the FDA, Dr. Lee uh, received his BS in chemical engineering from the University of Virginia with a minor in material science and a PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University. So Dr. Joel Welch is the Associate Director for Biosimilar and Regulatory Strategy in the Office of Biotechnology Products within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality at CEDAR, at CEDAR excuse me. Um, he's responsible for assessing emerging, complex, or precedent-setting issues impacting science policies of the office with a particular emphasis on the Biosimilars program. In his time at FDA, he's worked as a regulatory project manager, a product quality reviewer, and a product quality CMC team leader. He received his BS in chemistry from the University of Kansas and a PhD in bioinorganic chemistry from the University of Iowa. Prior to joining the FDA, he spent six years in industry supporting late stage analytical development of small molecules. So we welcome um, Larry and Joel to our virtual podium. Uh, Larry, um, if you can um, show your camera so we can spotlight you. Sorry for having. Yeah, I'm doing it now. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Um, it's it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. And on behalf of my co-presenter, um, Dr. Larry Lee, we'll be discussing how the Emerging Technology Program works, um, the future of the program, and how we are already addressing many of the recommendations on the NASM report on innovations in pharmaceutical manufacturing on the horizon. So let's take a step back and ask, you know, what actually is the Emerging Technology Program? In terms of, of the what, the Emerging Technology Program was established at the end of 2014. And it was designed to promote and facilitate the adoption of innovative approaches to pharmaceutical product design and manufacturing. In terms of the WHO, the team currently has approximately 30 members who represent the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, the Office of Compliance, and the Office of Regulatory Affairs. We do also invite ad hoc subject matter experts to join when specific knowledge is needed on a certain novel technology. In terms of how they interact, the Emerging Technology Program functions by engaging and collaborating with industry members as they develop novel technologies. The ETP will discuss, identify, and resolve technical and regulatory issues as the technology is developed and ultimately adopted. This happens from the earliest development stages all the way through an application's regulatory approval. Next slide. In terms of the program objectives, it has multiple objectives that are highlighted on, these slot, on this slide. This includes serving as a centralized location for external inquiries on novel technologies, providing a forum for engagement and early dialogue with, with us to support innovation, aiding in the consistency, continuity, and predictability of review practice, engaging international regulatory agencies to, to share learnings and approaches, identifying and evaluating roadblocks relating to existing guidance policy and practice, facilitating knowledge transfer to relevant CEDAR and ORA review and inspection programs, and ultimately helping to establish scientific standards and policy as needed. In terms of accomplishments to date, the, experience, the program has experienced much success over the last several years. This includes an increase in the number of proposals received, the number of proposals accepted to work with the program, the number of sponsor meetings, and the number of ETP site visits. Other successes include industry feedback, which gave the program a satisfaction rating of 8.9 out of 10, and ultimately publishing guidance on continuous manufacturing, which was in part based on what we learned in our program. More importantly, we have approved 12 regulatory applications that utilize emerging technology, such as 3D printing and continuous manufacturing for drug substance and drug product. This includes both small molecules and biologics. Next slide. So with the success, why, why did we identify a need for a change? So while we, we highlighted many of the successes, we also noted that there were several challenges for the program as, as it continued to grow. And these included an increased workload that was expected to begin to limit the program's ability to effectively support necessary development of new technology and its industry members. Moreover, industry began to simultaneously request more support from the program. They wanted more dedicated time from ETP members. They wanted new mechanisms for CEDAR to evaluate technologies outside of product approvals. And they wanted more engagement, namely to facilitate innovation. 
Finally, the team experienced turnover as FDA team members left for new opportunities. This had the potential to create gaps in institutional knowledge. We identified this as an opportunity to improve continuity of the program in cases of attrition, as well as potentially further improve communication across our work units. Next slide. So what was the solution? With all these challenges and opportunities, we realized that the EPP needed to adapt to its new reality. The program needed to transform itself from an upstart environment into a scaled and more mature model. To accomplish this goal, we implemented a three-step process to guide ETP to its desired future state. The first step, to conduct a thorough state analysis of the program. This included documenting current processes, building out a visual current state operating model. By documenting this current state, we were able to identify our pain points and potential inefficiencies. The second step was to create our future state operating model. This new model will support the continued growth of the program and provide standard and scalable processes to support the sustainability of the program for the long term. The third and final step was to create a roadmap with specific tasks and actions that will move the ETP from its current state to our desired future state. Next slide. The ETP 2.0 roadmap is a detailed, actionable document that describes the specific actions, tasks that we will complete in order to achieve the program's future state. Specifically, it highlights not just tasks and actions, but also expected level of effort, expertise required, contributors, level of impact and complexity, and potential risk and mitigation tactics. The roadmap prioritizes important areas of, of emphasis, including graduation, knowledge management, governance intake, engagement communication, technology and tools, skills and training, workload management, strategy, and awareness. These priority areas were identified during a holistic evaluation of the program and include particular emphasis on our critical needs, which includes process, graduation, knowledge management, including training, and ultimately communication with a variety of stakeholders. Next slide. On this final slide, you can see the timeline towards our program's maturity. It depicts the step beginning with establishment in 2014 through creating the model and our final implementation of 2.0. As noted in our progress, we are currently in the process and already implementing ETP 2.0. So with that, I will pause and now invite my co-presenter, Dr. Larry Lee, to present on how the development at ETT 2.0 addresses recommendations in the NASM report. Thank you, Joe. Um, this is uh, Larry. Uh, in the Academy report, there were several recommendations made for FDA and CEDA to consider related to advanced manufacturing and the emerging technology program. I have summarized some of the recommendations here into five major different categories. First, strengthening expertise in innovative technology throughout CEDA. Second, expand the scope and capa uh, capacity of the emerging technology program. Third, uh, advance innovative mechanisms for evaluating technology outside product approvals. Uh, then increase external engagement to facilitate innovation and increase awareness of CEDA readiness to evaluate innovative technology. And finally, expand the leadership role in global regulatory harmonization effort. I will go into more detail on the following slides about how FDA and CEDA are supporting these recommendations from both strategic and tactical perspective. And I also want to emphasize that we really highly appreciate the uh, National Academy of Science to provide this recommendation, make us uh, recognize some of the communication gaps as well as the area we need to improve upon. Uh, next slide, please. With regard to strengthening expertise in innovative technology throughout CEDA, uh, in response to Academy's uh, recommendations on the left-hand side of this slide, we are currently developing a system approach, the so-called knowledge aim structure assessment uh, system, CASA, for quality uh, assessments, which will include emerging technologies or new technologies. So our quality assessors can use such a system to apply a risk 
and science-based approach consistently to evaluate new technologies so that the uh, industry will know uh, our expectation uh, in a very predictable manner. We have been developing and providing targeted trainings, including utilizing the laboratory within our, uh, within our organization, as well as a partnership with academia to uh, quality assessors and ORA investigators. And we will be working with ORA to train investigators in a larger scale, especially for the technology we start to see in many uh, uh, applications in order to ensure consistency of FDA inspection of new technology. Note that, that I do want to point out that under the Emerging Technology Program, ETT members already coordinated with ORA investigators to conduct the pre-approval inspection of uh, new technologies such as uh, continuous manufacturing uh, in some of the facilities. Next slide, please. With regard to advanced innovative mechanisms for evaluating technology outside product approvals, the academies recommend the following opportunities. Create, a new uh, create new mechanisms and evaluate, expand, and consolidate existing pilot programs that allow consideration of innovative technology outside individual product submission. In response to these recommendations, first, I would like to point out that ETP or Emerging Technology Program is not a pilot program. We approve products, not technologies, and FDA will continue to approve application based on the drug products because we all know that we need to account for product specific risk and understand and evaluate interactions between the product characteristic and manufacturing technologies, as well as looking into some of the control strategy elements as well. However, I do want to point out that the Emerging Technology Program already offers a long product specific track that allows feedback on a proposed technology without the need for a sponsor to identify a product or molecule associated with the new technology. So let me just re-emphasize this point. Under the Emerging Technology Program, you can talk about innovative platform technology. Now, because I do want to emphasize this point again, because I have presented in many conferences about this is the key feature, but it seems like I think uh, there's a communication gap we need to adjust uh, because most of still seems uh, to me the industry thing, emerging technology only talking about the product specific technology, which is not correct. Throughout the emerging technology program, OPQ has adopted risk-based approach to help streamline implementation of technologies over multiple products using the existing regulatory framework. Let me just give, in, uh, let me just give you one example. We have a user suggested using a group submissions to implement a novel container culture system for multiple products as post-approval changes. Next slide, please. With regard to, the, uh, to expand the scope and capacity of the Emerging Technology Program, the Academy uh, will commend the following opportunities for the Emerging Technology Program. Delegate independent funding, uh, increased number of delegated full-time employees, broaden criteria for entry, increased transparency of the program capacity. In response to this recommendation, FDA, uh, thanks to uh, Congress as well as uh, um, other uh, funding sources, FDA has received uh, funding to support advanced manufacturing, including the Emerging Technology Program. So we do appreciate uh, the, for those uh, sponsors. And I do also want to emphasize that Emerging Technology Program, even though we have a core member, this program utilizes 
all 1,000 employees in OPQ uh, all, uh, in, this, uh, in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and select appropriate subject matter experts to evaluate a new technology. And therefore, we believe that having dedicated uh, staff could limit the agility of this emerging technology program. Especially, we anticipate there are a wide range of uh, emerging technology we need to deal with in the future. And that this uh, the way we operate in this way, because we also had uh, experience during our PAT initiative, we have a very dedicated group, but we receive a lot of complaint uh, from the industry to, to say that there's a disconnection between the review staff and the PAT staff. And the criteria for entry into the emerging technology program, I want to emphasize a broad and high level. And it is really up to the sponsors to justify why their proposed technology is novel and has positive impact on product quality, which warrants acceptance into the emerging technology program. We set it up in this way because we want to provide flexibility for the industry to propose the new technology. Because if we do have a too prescriptive uh, criteria, that may preclude some of the new technology like uh, AI and some other like, innovative approach from uh, joining this program. Uh, but however, I do, we do recognize that uh, from this, uh, the Academy report, we have communication gap here. So this uh, ETP will increase external communication to educate industry regarding the criteria for acceptance into the program. With regard, uh, next slide, please. With regard to increase external engagement to facilitate innovation and increase awareness of CEDAR readiness to evaluate innovative technology. In response to Academy's uh, recommendation on the left-hand side, first, I want to point out that consortia can apply to the emerging technology program to discuss and get recommendation from OPQ. I also want to emphasize that this is already happening. And think about this, we will allow them to do it. And, and also, as I mentioned before, ETP does not have to discuss the technology associated with particular products. So together, you can see that we are already doing it. So uh, I just want to take the opportunity here to clarify this point. As mentioned by Joe, we have a plan under the Emerging, Te uh, Emerging Technology Program 2.0 to further enhance communication with external stakeholders to share our learning and exchange information. We are also planning to update our ETT website uh, to make sure to provide the latest update on this program. OPQ already also support the extramural research and training in the advanced manufacturing area, as I mentioned before, through a uh, very strong partnership with external stakeholders, such as, uh, such as uh, academia like uh, Purdue and Rutgers University. We are currently considering additional opportunities, including further improving knowledge transfer from inter uh, in internal as well as external research to aim quality assessment of new technologies and offering more training opportunities to our assessors and investigators. And next slide, please. And finally, with regard to expand the leadership role in global regulatory harmonization efforts, in response to Academy's uh, recommendations on the left-hand side, uh, I want to point out several things we have been doing and we will be doing. OPQ already worked on ICH, uh, several, uh, 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 ICH to develop several guidelines on continuous manufacturing, analytical procedure validation and development, and also viral safety of evaluation of biotechnology products. OPQ already uh, share is learning and expertise in advanced manufacturing with international regulators 
such as uh, PMDA. And I also want to emphasize that we have already have a couple uh, meeting with a PMDA to discuss about what we should do together to advance, uh, for example, uh, the technology like continuous manufacturing. And we actually did plan to reach out with our other regulatory agency like Anvisa as well as our EMA. Uh, unfortunately, at this moment, that put on hold because of our COVID-19. Uh, the reason is that because we do want to travel, have a face-to-face -face meeting, to have a very meaningful discussion with other regulatory agency. So we will definitely continue to do uh, this type of uh, outreach and collaboration. We will continue to work with other regulatory agencies to move to a global regulatory conversion through a variety uh, additional venues such as PICS as well as IC MLA in addition to the um, uh, in addition to the ICH. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation. And once again, I really appreciate uh, the academy to put a lot of our effort to put this uh, report together. And I will also want to emphasize that this is very in line when we actually plan our program enhancement for um, emerging technology program and also really help us to identify some of the communication gap we need to address in order to uh, make uh, the industry as well as other external stakeholders to be aware of some of the work we are doing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry and Joel. I know that the community really appreciates um, that description of what's happening with ETP 2.0. That's exciting. Um, I would encourage the community to use the Slido to pose questions for Larry and Joel and others and to capture some themes um, for a community discussion later. Um, but we're going to hold questions until um, the end of this, the talks. And so I'd like to, at this time, introduce our next speaker, who is Rohan Mahathre. And Rohan has worked in the pharma biotech industry for the past 30 years, the last 25 of it with, with Biogen, where he is Senior Vice President of Product and Technology Development. His department is responsible for the process, uh, process and product development of all the Biogen products, including associated devices and digital tools. Prior to this role, he's also headed the global engineering and manufacturing science departments. Rowan has also managed the regulatory CMC department and has been involved in the approval of over a dozen products. He has several publications and patents in the area of biopharmaceutical development and analytics. So uh, we welcome Rohan, thank you very much. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, I have just a few slides to share, but I just wanted to maybe highlight, you know, things, mechanisms sort of for innovation that have worked uh, at Biogen and just in my overall experience. And uh, just kind of share with you sort of specific examples. And uh, my idea was to really talk about what the outcome has been and then maybe go back and, and probably discuss a bit in terms of how we actually got there, what were all the tools available and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, so let's start there if you can have the next slide. So really, I think many of you folks have uh, that know Biogen, we're a company that's been focused in neuroscience for uh, quite, a, quite some time now and uh, for the foreseeable future as well. And uh, these are disease, uh, you know, unfortunately, with rather devastating outcomes, there really isn't anything out there uh, um, that's uh, effective enough. And if you can just click one more. And the, uh, the outcomes here, the numbers that you see are rather disheartening uh, in terms of leading cause of disability, uh, just the number of patients. So seeing all these things, I think this sort of, uh, you know, dawned on us, uh, thankfully, a number of years ago at this point, probably close to 10 years ago, just looking at where the portfolio was going, 
Uh, I want to talk specifically about how we developed our processes in this case, the biological processes and how all that came together. So roughly about, I would say close to 10 years ago, um, what we were looking at is sort of anticipating how the portfolio is evolving and how do we really stay ahead of what the needs were going to be. And at that stage, uh, believe it or not, you know, the, 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 the platform itself, Biologics end-to-end, -end, I would say, was fairly robust. Uh, we had very good success rates in manufacturing and, you know, the facilities were fully utilized and so on. And I think it's really at that time we said that this, in fact, is a good time to step up that effort. And uh, really the, the, the objective was figuring out how do we significantly improve productivity from where we were. We are roughly three to four grams per liter at that stage in antibodies and uh, didn't have as much, one could say, automation, as many predictive tools and so on. So we sort of decided to kind of really take a holistic view and say, let's put out what we believe would really sort of change the whole game and enable us to better serve the, the, the patients that we were developing all these drugs for. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, so I think the key for this, I mean, this has sort of existed in our organization for a while and something, this is not just put up because it, it's, it's a good thing to show, but we've actually really held ourselves accountable for this, both, both through management, including uh, folks at the bench or on, on the plant, that uh, it really was, was key that innovation had to be the core of everything that we did. And by innovation, I don't just mean developing technology, but it was just the ability to look at how we were doing things and how one could sort of think about constantly sort of keep that back of mind. How could you do this differently? How could you bring efficiency in the overall operation? And that's really how we looked at innovation rather than just a fancy tool to be evaluated or some such thing. It was really an end-to-end -end, uh, holistic view of how one could evolve our whole way of working, interacting and so on. And for many years, you know, there's something I've, I've appreciated, uh, you know, working at Biogen is that we've, we've enabled this and, and there's been an expectation really whether that goes through you know, the kinds of goals we expect individuals to set and so on is really empowering across the boards. You know, this is not sort of a top-down view in terms of how uh, you know, things should evolve, but really getting everybody into this and, and, and actually measuring this. I mean, for, for, for some years now, we have a whole system and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, there's, there's a separate office looking at sort of continuous improvement evaluating all the processes that we have and, and trying to sort of figure out and, and to a large extent looking at investments, returns on investments and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly sort of involved process and, uh, you know, and I think on hindsight, thankfully so. And one thing that we've kind of uh, really believed in is if we feel that there is the right science and we feel that that actually is going to help us out uh, we have been willing to take those risks and really accepting the consequences. I, I, don't, I don't try to kind of use the, word, use the term failure because in a way, when we are in this particular space, any kind of learning that comes out of it, I, I, I look at that as an outcome rather than a failure uh, because to a large part, we've, we've, we've embarked on several projects over the years and the outcome hasn't been as expected but what's been very important is a lot of learning that's come out of it. And uh, that's something that has really helped us navigate through where we wanted to go. And as I had said earlier, the core for innovation here was not necessarily putting out tools, but more importantly, to be able to anticipate the business needs and figuring out how one could stay ahead of those business needs. So that's that's really in, in a nutshell is how we've been evaluating this. And it's clearly is a, is a you know, process which one has to look at and figure out how does one uh, you know, possibly change or, or, or uh, you know, bring about certain uh, different approaches. So next slide, please. So this is, this is what I wanted to show you. 
you know, we've been talking, I've been talking about at conferences and all for a while on this, but this, this is really, one can call it been the outcome of this particular, uh, where one aspect of this innovation led us. And this is our new manufacturing facility that's up and running in, in Switzerland. And also most of these tools have been in another facility, which is in North Carolina as well. These are large scale manufacturing facilities, 15 to 18,000 liter reactors and so on. You know? So what, what I'm trying to get at here is with the 10 plus years that we have been in the space, we had looked at it truly as an end-to-end -end piece where uh, I don't want to go through every, every unit operation here, but sort of looking at sort of raw materials, spending a lot of time on initial modeling work on complex raw materials, trying to be able to decipher how changes could impact product quality, figuring out uh, real-time um, you know, supplementation strategies. Uh, and as I said, utilizing even some of the predictive models, looking at sort of a bulk analysis rather than looking at it in, in, you know, in, in a more sort of granular way and trying to correlate those to product outcomes. I've talked about this at other conferences before in terms of upstream and downstream controls, where in at least two of these facilities, we have sort of a whole automated loop looking in, within the bioreactor using simple probes like Raman, but looking at multitude, multiple attributes in this particular case would be shown as glucose, could be lactate, so on. But being able to figure out when the feeding has to occur based on what the conditions are rather than sort of fixed feeds. And this is all done through uh, 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 control loops, uh, feedback loops, and it, this is something that's been working. Likewise, when you look at downstream, uh, in, in one particular case, what we have talked about is control of aggregation, where you're in fact measuring levels of aggregates and changing loading conditions accordingly. All this happening real time, something we didn't quite have in our facilities in one could call the previous generation. And likewise, using things like refractive index, figuring out you know, concentrations, uh, using all kinds of modeling. The, the idea that we got to here and which is what we're implementing is understanding what the product looks like at all times. And this is not necessarily by measurements. Initially, it could start with measurements, but then moving into truly predictive models, looking at some, in some cases, maybe even random associations to be able to figure out what the product quality looks like. And this is sort of what I wanted to show you is the outcome. I'll talk a little bit in terms of what tools we had and how we've approached this and other innovation as well. So if you can go to the next slide. So our new way of working that, is, that has emerged is, you know, as I said, we are going into, you know, previous is really high productivity processes, intensifying the culture. And this is just sort of, I'm just showing you what the current stage is. We are already looking at what it will be in the next five to seven years. And it could be maybe even four to five fold higher than whatever the 10 to 10, 12 grams that we are today. I could easily see it being much, much higher than that. It doesn't have to be in mammalian systems. And so we are, we are also ready, even as things are settling in into the second stage, looking at what it could be in another five to seven years or so. Uh, something I have strongly believed in, and fortunately, so does many, many in the organization, is in order to get the kind of control that we're trying to do, is we need, we need to have, to, in order to get a con the consistent output, is to be able to self-correct as processes are running. And particularly what I talked about in the upstream is getting to a state where you can have consistent cell growth with the, with the understanding that that would lead to a consistent product quality. And through all of this, the, the operations have changed. There's a lot of localized testing, testing happening where it needs to happen, uh, technology available everywhere, simplifying more recipe driven operations and so on. So this is, it's a whole integration of technology processes and, and people. Um, can shift to the next slide, please. So this really goes through the mechanism. One of the, one of the pieces that has been very, very effective is the early stage. And uh, 
what we have is a program called technology investment. It's been around for, for a long time now. And it's very little money. It's a few million dollars that I have in my budget. And we, every year, we, we have a sort of proposals being presented by anyone, anyone in the organization, it doesn't even have to be in my group. And it's, it's a committee that looks over it. And these can be proposals, I'm not something that is needed now, but in many cases, it could be very blue sky approaches. And you know, we fund about 20, 30 projects depending. And these are all short-term funding, it's just seed money. Seed money, either if you wanna form academic collaborations, if you wanna get a postdoc in there, or you wanna get interns or co-ops, whatever, to do some of the work so it frees you to do other things. Many of the, this funding can go anywhere from a few months to probably up to a year, but it's, it's just basic funding for an initial proof of concept. It doesn't even have to be where everything is, is sorted out because if something looks promising, we then take it to the next phase where now it becomes more part of our budgets, our annual operating plan. And based on the promise, we would then, then fund it. But along the way, I just wanna go back way we found it very, very effective for, for all this work is little investment at the early stage has, has, has led to a lot of very uh, productive outcomes. And a program, again, speaking of academia, that's also been very helpful is we have sort of a formal PhD program whereby uh, anyone in the organization, if they wanna pursue a PhD, we will fund that entire thing. You know where they will be working on a full salary. But what we do is they will write proposals. We would appoint an internal uh, uh, committee member, any one of the, uh, the, the staff, and then they will work with the universities. We've had about multiple students go through that. And it doesn't always have to be completely associated with what we are doing at Biogen at that time. It could be some forward looking thing. It could be maybe some tangential association what we're trying to do. But the idea here is we, we create the time and the facilities. Most of the students work at, at, at one of our campuses and they, they would go to universities off and on, depending on whatever arrangements that they have. But it's been extremely, extremely productive in, in, in some years. And it's, 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 a, it's a great sort of a value for people that are going through this. But then going through the next stage, as, as we start, you know, where more of the funding comes in, as things come up, we've, we've engaged several, you know, speaking at meetings, obviously, but through, you know, uh, programs at the agencies, what we just heard of, that has been very productive. And this is really where we then start in some ways, I wouldn't say operationalize, but bringing a system to innovation, because this is uh, at, at sort of the mid to late stage, uh, or maybe if like a phase two of this development, is where we have organizations within the company trying to put a business case around it, looking at what the investment is, what the outcomes are, trying to sort of figure out, you know, uh, where this would be implemented and, and what, some, what some of the implications would be, and this goes on. And interestingly, you know, even as I showed the previous slide, I've been talking about where we want to take a manufacturing, which has now been implemented for a couple of years, there was quite a bit of, I mean, you know, there were questions asked, like, you know, is the agency going to buy into this because you're really trying to kind of move things that they may not have seen before? And is it really likely or is this just for a good presentation that you guys are coming to these meetings? And interestingly, at least through my experience, and I would like to hear what others may have to say during our discussion, I, through all the innovations that we've put together, I actually have had in my experience, very little resistance from agencies, particularly if the science has been strong. A lot of the anxiety I feel has come from within the company or through the industry in terms of what this would mean and you know how could this be perceived. But to a large part, when science has been on our side, it's, I, I have actually not encountered much resistance at all. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been discussions or questions, but that's just, my, my opinion here. So you can go to the next slide. And this is what I was talking about earlier, what, something that we've really been very, very aware of that innovation by itself, you know, can happen randomly, but there have to be pieces come, that have to come together. One is the overall strategy. So clearly 
you know, we try to tie where we are going once we know what the strategy is. To a large part, we try to also stay ahead of where things are going. Uh, the people have to come together. And to a large part, where this has helped is management needs to be completely on board, to be willing to accept risk. And more importantly, as I said, being willing to accept the consequences, you know, to a point where over the past many years, we have actually rewarded and, and uh, acknowledged the effort irrespective of what the outcomes have been. You know, even the less than ideal outcomes, we have rewarded those efforts. So that's something that, that is very important, the people aspect, which includes the management as well. Then you also need to have systems. You know, you can't have things getting in the way of progress. And maybe it's the size of our organization or what have you. You try to kind of navigate around that systems, technology, and processes all coming together. And I think it's really when all these things work is when things start to happen. So next slide. This just gives you, a, you know, something that we've, we've introduced in our in my department. Uh, it's called the technology hub, because you know we we realized, you know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of good ideas, things moving around. It's very hard to keep track of those things. So this is not necessarily to say that we want to operationalize it, but some extent bring some kind of a uh, uh, oversight, if one can call it that, so that there's awareness with a multitude of things going on, where things are, uh, you know, what, what the learnings have been. And so it's the idea being that at some point, if you park something, we don't sort of restart it, go back to square one. And we feel, you know, bringing a continuous improvement program again, which is a formalized program, uh, through the entire organization, things like the innovation hub and so on are important as much as one may think that, you know, they may be getting in the way or creating too many systems. They do enable uh, in our experience, things to be sort of coordinated better. Yeah. So I think that's probably one of my last slides and go to the next one. So just really, I just want to end by saying that this is the facility I was talking about, our new facility in Switzerland, uh, it's up and running for the last uh, year or so. And all the things that I talked about have been implemented there. And uh, likewise, another facility that's been running for a while, We're using all these for late stage and commercial programs. I just want to thank a few people, Dan and Aona, who are on this call today. Uh, they've been heading uh, you know, Dan heading the, the technology invest, investment initiative, you know, is heading up the innovation hub and a large number of people, the process analytics, protein development, regulatory manufacturing sciences made this happen. So thank you for your attention and thanks again for this invitation. Looking forward to any questions. Thank you, Rohan. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, we appreciated that fascinating view into how Bi Biogen um, views innovation and values innovation. Um, so I think we're going to hold talks until our community discussion um, following the, the next talk, which will be by Sarah Arden. Sarah is Director of Global Regulatory Affairs at GSK. Um, Let's see, she serves as, um, at, well, for the discovery and early development of, the, of projects in that unit at GSK. She has 15 years of combined experience in regulatory affairs, intellectual property, pharmaceutical, and vaccines development and research. Um, Dr. Arden previously served at the US FDA as a regulatory reviewer and facility inspector and directed emergence, emerging technology research, policy, and development programs. Prior to joining the FDA, Dr. Arden founded an AI-based technology startup, served as a life sciences consultant and IP advisor to startups, law firms, and government clients. She received her PhD from Johns Hopkins University and her BS from the University of California, San Diego. So uh, we look forward to hearing your talk, uh, Sarah. So if you'd like to take the podium. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Kelly, and hi, everyone. 
so I'm, I've been asked uh, along with my colleagues, Ben Stevens and Jean Hugh Primer to present on some of these uh, existing mechanisms as well. And we've put some slides together to um, go over what we've identified as some currently existing mechanisms that are in use today by the industry and, and provide uh, ways to uh, collaborate early on with uh, regulators and other stakeholders in the industry. So next slide, please. And I mentioned Jean Hugh Primer and Ben Stevens and myself put these slides together. We're all at GlaxoSmithKline. Next slide, please. So in, in looking for existing mechanisms, we identified several different categories that we could uh, parse out uh, the ways in which uh, sponsors, firms, industry can engage quite early with uh, regulators and other stakeholders. And the first category we identified were these direct sponsor interactions. So the first thing that came to mind, and Larry and Joel gave a really nice presentation earlier on the Emerging Technology Program, of course, um, you know, they, they are the, the first uh, uh, program that came to mind. We have engaged with them ourselves at GSK, and Narendra spoke a little bit to that. Um, the next one is CBER's Advanced Technologies Team, CATT, and uh, we've, you know, we've had kind of mixed reviews about, about that particular program. Um, the Center for Devices also has its innovation group, um, which uh, is also developing and moving quite rapidly to, and I'll get to some of that as well, to provide other platforms that enable industry and other stakeholders to engage really early on and have joint learning with the regulator as well. Uh, so other national regulatory agencies, the EMA's uh, Innovation Task Force, the UK's MHRA, and Japan's PMDA all have their own innovation offices that enable uh, early engagement for sponsors. Next slide, please. So the next category we identified were these guidances. Um, and and these, these are interesting because they provide uh, some thought leadership that comes together uh, by dealing with what, knowing what the agencies uh, dealing with industry and what are some of the pain points that industry might be having in areas that they want to move forward in. Uh, and so some of these guidances that have come out recently uh, are the PAT guidance, the continuous manufacturing guidance, which came out before uh, Q13, the ICH community had uh, just recently um, put the Q13 out, and of course, the advancement of emerging tech application, which is kind of the backbone of the ETT, um, Q12, and then divide, additive manufacturing for medical devices. So all these guidances are uh, providing this uh, framework that industry can certainly go to when uh, they are at a at a crossroads and, and trying to determine how best to move forward. Um, but they are just, you know, information that's provided, it's, it's one directional. So uh, it doesn't provide that engagement, but at least there, there's a framework to, to work from. Next slide, please. The next category we identified were these innovation initiatives. And, um, you know, particularly the FDA, there, there are a number of initiatives that exist. Um, they may not all be well publicized, but they nonetheless are ways that the public and stakeholders can engage quite early and have a say in the direction of um, how, in, how the, regulator, the regulator can innovate its own um, regulatory policy, as well as how the industry can move forward in terms of their innovation and commercial strategy. Uh, some examples of these are using uh, the uh, dockets that CD CEDAR and CDRH are using for public comment. Here's an example in the Federal Register uh, for quality management maturity, which Mike spoke about earlier. Uh, and so th these provide this opportunity for public to engage early on and comment. Uh, there are also initiatives such as this one, right? This is a platform that is, is a really nice platform that brings various stakeholders together, academia, industry, regulatory. And the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy is another one such platform. Uh, recently, for instance, the FDA had one uh, uh, workshop there on establishing high quality real world data ecosystems. And these are really nice meetings because there is a really kind of 
mutual uh, discussion and hopefully some ideation that can happen at these venues. Uh, another interesting one is really looking at within the agency, uh, different various offices have their own annual reports. They publish annually. This is an example of one annual report. There's also um, other reports that are published regularly. And you know, going through these, you can identify some of the initiatives that are being developed uh, yet to come, and also uh, observe and monitor some of those that have already been uh, uh, in place and see where the, um, how they're impacting industry and innovation. And there's also a, an interesting initiative coming out of the Digital um, Health Center of Excellence, which is actually part of CDRH, Center for Devices. So this is a center of excellence that was recently organized and launched as a platform that enables all stakeholders to kind of come in, interact with the center. And as it's, a, it's you, you, know, you know exactly where you need to go if you have some particular questions. Um, and the process allows both the agency as well as the stakeholders to grow, learn together and uh, really allow the community to uh, move forward. Next slide, please. Another uh, area we identified are these FDA extramural funding opportunities that exist. Uh, these are in the form of contracts and grants. Uh, CEDAR has its own uh, BAA and uh, grant opportunities, so does CBER. And uh, throughout the agency there, it's not at the level of course of NIH, but you know, nonetheless, there is a bucket of funds that exists for funding and supporting new technology development. Um, here we have a certain uh, priority areas that we've looked at, such as supporting new approaches to improve product manufacturing quality, and, and then the other priority area, ensuring FDA's readiness to evaluate emerging technologies. These are uh, some examples of, of where funding goes. Um, the CBER, CBER had uh, an RFA out recently for enhancing innovations in advanced manufacturing technologies for vaccines against influenza and emerging infect infectious diseases. Is another interesting area. So these provide an opportunity where um, oftentimes academia comes in and put, submits a proposal. The agency reviews those proposals and determines you know, how best to distribute funds and, um, and also meet some of the mutual learning goals that can advance uh, both regulatory review side, policy side, as well as, of course, the commercial side and just generally moving innovation forward. Next slide, please. And lastly, we, we also look to public-private partnerships. Um, you know, these are great platforms where uh, multiple stakeholders that are uh, at the forefront of innovation can be engaged in discussions together. Um, the MEP National Network, uh, Nimble, uh, Biofab, Biomade, and the Medical Device Innovation Consortia come to mind, of course, Manufacturing USA as well. And NIST is, of course, it's another sort of, uh, uh, it's an agency that can provide uh, uh, a role as an independent uh, party when uh, different industry members need to meet and discuss a particular topic and move that uh, particular area forward. So NIST is also engaged in a lot of that. Um, and next slide, please. So, uh, I want to speak a little bit to the recent experience that GSK has had with EDT. Uh, some of this was discussed earlier. This is a high-level overview. And we did find that the you know, engaging with ETT was really a useful pathway to integrating the novel manufacturing and testing platforms that we presented. Uh, the, we submitted a meeting request to discuss the novel microbiological testing platforms with ETT. And we had discussions that were centered on leveraging prior knowledge for method validation, approaches for product-specific method validation and verification following method transfer, sample prep and bracketing of the evaluated species, and comparability to compendial methods. And in this process, uh, subject matter experts from the different FDA divisions were assembled into the meeting package review, which is also a really unique way to engage very early with the agency and get the multidisciplined perspective and identifying those early risks um, that can impact how you are going to move forward in terms of your go-to-market strategy. Um, 
and this is all prior to getting to that uh, IND stage. So uh, we found this to be very useful. The feedback was robust and uh, the agency provided us with actionable responses and encouraged us to seek additional interaction as we continue to develop the technology with uh, that feedback that they had given us in mind. Next slide, please. So here, um, you know, we sat down and we thought about, well, what works and, you know, what can be improved or, or enhanced to maybe make things a little bit easier um, and more efficient uh, for the community uh, and, and all stakeholders. And the first, uh, going back to that first category of sponsor, direct sponsor interactions. Um, you know, when we looked at those centers and the different mechanisms that are in place for engaging early with industry, you know, one of the areas that we thought could be a, an area to look at to improve is the consistency across the centers and maybe uh, using something more formalized or, uh, you know, like a pre pre IND sort of situation, a, pro a type C process that could uh, enable all the centers to have a similar approach, uh, depending on the product type that uh, the sponsor is uh, working on. Uh, for instance, some of the issues, some of the uh, I guess the mixed reviews that have come in about the CATT are that those informal interactions with them may not uh, that's presenting a new uh, technology. And um, that's one area is that consistency. Another is really having uh, a, somebody who is a well-publicized, clear champion, a point of contact, or an office that has um, that is directly associated within the centers to facilitate sponsor interactions. We thought that that could also be beneficial to, uh, to the industry. And uh, another thing that has come up, and, and I've, uh, I think this has come up in the past as well, is kind of considering a technology master file. You know, is that something that could be considered as uh, a, a mechanism that we can review the technology in the absence of you know, application cross-referencing. And this is something that potentially manufacturing uh, equipment vendors, they might be able to use something of this sort. Uh, but the, those are the three areas we thought about for uh, opportunities to, to improve on the sponsor interactions. Uh, the next area is uh, global alignment. And uh, not there yet, <laughs> global alignment. Uh, so that, you know, we thought, it, just like the consistency across centers, um, it would be really helpful to have more global alignment. I mean, one of the barriers to and concerns I think many industry members feel with innovation is if we take something to one agency versus another, it's going to have impacts uh, with the different, different perspectives, different risk uh, 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 um, assessments on how we approach the bringing something to market. What is the commercial strategy going to look like? And it's not consistent across the board. So having you know MOUs between the agency and counterpart innovation task forces at other national regulatory authorities that enable parallel scientific advice consultations, for example, to achieve more alignment on regulatory risk and 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 paths forward for a particular technology, we think that could be very useful. And we've just recently seen something like that come out of the Center for Devices just this week, um, where they jointly published a um, best practices for machine learning uh, in, in digital health with the UK's MHRA and uh, Health Canada. So we know that there's precedent for that, and that could certainly uh, facilitate some of the concerns uh, with bringing something to market across uh, different regions. And then lastly, we have innovation centers and test beds. So the agency does support academia and maybe some smaller uh, companies that come in through the form of those contracts and grants. But we really were you know, questioning how impactful some of these contracts and grants are when it comes to commercializing a new technology and how does that impact really the private sector. So uh, something to think about there. Uh, and then lastly here, a, the agency can also consider more collaboration with private sector R&D that's in that pre-competitive space with CRADAs or using test beds. Uh, these are already in place in some cases, but it's not something that's widely done um, or uh, really publicized. 
So that covers some of the, the areas that my colleagues and I had uh, come up with that you know, could potentially improve what's currently out there and make things more efficient for the community. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all. I think the next slide is the uh, last slide and I'm happy to take questions and engage uh, in the follow-up discussions. Thank you, Sarah. That was really helpful, and I, uh, it was a terrific summary of all the different mechanisms you know that that you can see from your perspective. Um, so, with that, I would like to invite um, the speakers, Rohan and um, Joel and Larry, to join us in the spotlighted uh, part of the discussion. And I would also like to encourage all the participants in the workshop to use the Slido uh, function. Um, to pose questions or ideas for a discussion in this thread. So um, one of the things, you know, to, to start us off, one of the observations that I've had that I think is, um, you know, Larry mentioned the communication problem, right? There's so much going on and it's difficult for external stakeholders to have insight into all those different mechanisms, what is currently being done. And so I would suspect that part of that challenge is that um, when you hear, you know, when you consider from Sarah's perspective as, as prevent, uh, presented and um, that Rowan had pre presented about all of the, the different mechanisms that are on the table, it seems that often FDA defaults or CEDAR defaults to the ETT, right, as the mechanism. And while that's certainly an important gatekeeper um, for, well, I don't want to use the word gatekeeper enabler, right? And it's a very important program. It is not the only mechanism that is there and um, shouldn't be the only one that should be considered, I would imagine, um, at, at this stage in the game, even though that might be the intention to grow that program to sort of be the all encompassing face of, of CEDAR for innovation. Um, so I, I just wondered if the community would like to react to that, if any of you um, would, would like to share your perspectives on sort of the sufficiency of the FDA, because it, it does appear that it's very much of, of the ETT, excuse me, um, does appear that it's a very appreciated mechanism, but is it a sufficient mechanism? And I recognize that I'm bleeding over into session three. <laughs> so just, just a flavor of that. And I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, in terms of you know defaulting to ETT, you know I think part of part of what we've had success in, in the past and part of what we're continuing to build is you know robust not just engagement but processes for intake, and that's something you know we highlighted in our presentation. And I think a, a lot of the technologies applications that get rejected, it's because it's not quite a right fit for ETT. So I feel like a lot of a lot of the important logistical things that happen on on the back end is really finding those things the right home. So I, I guess I would push back on the idea that we're, we're defaulting to, to ETT. I think we're really being thoughtful about what's included and, and where, where there's an interesting development program that, that ETT is not the right fit for, for a variety of reasons, trying to steer it in, in the right direction. Yeah, I, I think so. I think when ETT established is really to give uh, people about the clear point of contact, you you do want to develop technology for future regulatory submission, right? So it, it, I think we really need to think about like this is the scope of, of the, that program uh, because like in the past, like people had no idea where to go. <laughs> so, so, but I agree with you, with you that I think it depends on the purpose, right? like what type of innovation you want to communicate. Uh, the purpose of uh, the way of uh, you want to communicate with the agency. Other, other platform maybe uh, is uh, suitable. Like let's say if you do want to advance uh, regulatory science, then like it's not going, this will not be, uh, uh, go, will not go to ETT. We have uh, the BAA and also grant processes. I think Sarah actually did a very nice job to organize to do uh, a, a lot of stuff. And then also I think Adams and Tom will actually 
also talk a little bit more about the regulatory framework and also uh, rec uh, regulatory science. Uh, so they, they will actually also let you know like how do we communicate those uh, because I might already mention we want your input on the regulatory framework part uh, so, so far. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, one question that I, I believe you can quickly clarify. Um, is the emerging technologies team, ETT, part of the emergency, emerging technology program, or is this a separate team in FDA? So I, I know Larry or Joel would like to just clear up any confusion on that point. Uh, yeah. I I can clarify and then Joe, please uh, feel free. Yeah, I, I guess it's my apology. I think they are the same thing. I think we have an emerging technology program, but mainly it's uh, driven by the emerging technology team. But as, as I mentioned before, like this team is the core team, but we can have an ability to recruit any subject matter expert within the OPQ as well as the outside OPQ, uh, depending on the nature of the new technologies. So Joe? Yeah, no, I, I think we sometimes use the terms a bit interchangeably, but it's it's really the difference between the individuals who, who are, are the team and then kind of the, the thematic program, which is, you know, the entity to himself. But obviously there's there's a lot of overlap there between the two. So we have one question in the Slido um, that I, I think is more more general, but I, um, I suppose this this community um, or the speakers could respond to this. What's the primary part of the process that biomanufacturers would like to see more inter innovation introduced and why? Um, so that perspective on where it would be most useful to see an innovation appear, I suppose. I mean, I can. So you're asking what area is that, right? I, your initial... no, I, I believe that's the what the question is asking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's necessarily it's hard to generalize. It also depends on where your current platforms are, where your network is, and so on. I mean, manufacturing network. But uh, I mean, I've, I mean, you saw from the poll. I mean, there is a good amount of effort on improving, you know, intensification, improving productivity and so on. And I think this is where things like continuous come in because the other idea being is how long do you want to build larger and larger facilities? You know, so I mean, if there's ways in which you can optimize that and clearly there's, you know, science isn't advanced enough where we can start thinking beyond just the traditional choke platforms and so on. So I feel that's where it is. But the other piece I, I, I do think, I mean, at least in our organization, we believe that whether you call that digital or what have you, is really around process predictability, you know, because there's just so much advance been made there, you know, whether that be through predictive modeling and so on. But I do think that that has very, very big value because if you're producing at the rate at which we are and at the productivity that we are, a batch going down is, is, is a large expense. And, you know, without all these predictive tools, you could have many batches go down the drain before you actually uh, assess it, so. Yeah, um, if I could add to that, I would second certainly what Rohan said. Um, you know, I think some of the considerations that, of course, they're related to de-risking earlier. Um, you know, if that's related to um, applying models, and I, and I think the agency has recently um, been more uh, endorsing of using models earlier on um, and uh, being able to apply those models early so that you can reduce time, you know, or fail early, de-risk stepwise. Um, I think that that's an area of course process intensification is related to that because, you, you know, you, um, there are specific areas that could be uh, uh, more streamlined, and then in consideration of that, are also you know how AI plays into this, how di digitization of processes and um, systems that can become that are that are mature enough to handle data rich uh, 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 you know process technologies, and understanding how the data is handled 
versus just collecting all of it um, and you know putting together systems and mechanisms in which you know exactly how that data can become meaningful and useful for your process to apply it towards process intensification or de-risking um, and also uh, being able to scale uh, much earlier without all that risk. So I think those are um, clearly high priority. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I, I'd like to loop back to a question, I believe it was John Erickson um, that asked, and I'd like to invite John if he's willing to come and elaborate on that. It, it was effectively, what are the characteristics of successful FDA collaborations with external partners? Um, and um, I believe it was that question was posed in the Slido during Mike Kopchus uh, talk. And he suggested it would be good to punt it into this, um, this discussion. So uh, let's see, if it was John Erickson who posed the question, I'd like to invite John um, or really any in the community who'd like to raise their hand and give a perspective on that. But first I'd like to ask our speakers for their perspective on that. So you're saying external program that has been successful with the agencies? I, I, I think it's more um, if, you, if you view one mechanism for fostering innovation as an external collaboration, uh, what are the elements that make that collaboration successful? Okay. So they might say they, uh, he will punt the question to Joe or to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> or both of us. So, I think it was both of you. So. Okay. Joe, why don't you go first? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of a hard. It's kind of a hard question, right? What makes what makes it successful? So, I think, you know, um, and I think you know, Tom and, and Adam will I think speak a little bit to these kind of concepts too later and later in the program. Um, I think, you know, we, there are a variety of processes, and I think Sarah did a nice job highlighting that. So, I think. You know, it's hard to hard to generalize what makes one successful. I think certainly having having the processes we do that that try to identify up front what what success factors, you know, should be considered and, and making making sure we're making informed decisions where we make investments. I think I think the process itself is part of what drives that success. Um, and you know, I, I think. Sometimes these product projects, you know, there's always uncertainty about, you know, where the industry is going. So I don't know that I, I'm able to generalize much more than that. Um, Larry, do you have any thoughts? It's kind of a challenging but interesting question. Yeah, I do have uh, some uh, thought to that based on the interaction we have with industry, uh, many experience. I think the key for the successful collaboration is really be direct, uh, be honest and be transparent. Uh, I think this to me will be a key success factor because so far I think the program we have is, is successful in a way that because I think there's a lot of contribution. I have to acknowledge a lot of contribution from industry because they came in, they share the result with us, right? And, and really transparent because like remember FDA is not the one who do a product development. Right. So sometimes I have to say that like we can only make a good decision or risk-based decision based on the information provided by the industry or by the manufacturers. So I, I think be really transparent. Um, and then also from our end, I think uh, Joe like uh, and I always try to uh, make sure that if we disagree with you or we agree with you, with you we give provide very clear reasons why we do so, not just like quote the regulation, because of regulation, we cannot do this. We try to be scientific and risk-based. So I think those are really important factors, at least based on my experience. And then if, if I could add something, I think from, from the industry side, I think it's really helpful to know uh, what kind of questions you, need, you, you wanna get answers for from the agency. Um, you know, making sure that you're asking the right questions and uh, that you have, uh, if you do have some supportive data to, to kind of go in with those questions, or if it's early in concept, you still have some kinds of questions that the agency can really provide feedback for. That's, that's very helpful. 
Sarah, anyone in the community who would like to join this? Oh, Rowan, I, I forgot to um, give you an opportunity to answer that question. I mean, I think I agree with what everyone has said. You know, in this particular instance, what I showed you are manufacturing, um, whatever the reframing. What helped in those discussions is that when we were proposing new things, we weren't saying we'll do this as a result of this, we won't do that. You know, and I think that's sort of where a lot of sort of uh, maybe one sort of debate or friction has come in the past where I've seen proposals go forth to say that, you know, if we do this, this is what we don't want to do. And many times when it comes to control strategy changes from the uh, norm is when issues come up. So at least in, in much of the technology is not like that we would just want to keep doing everything, but the way we had approached it was that we want to do this to get a better outcome of a process and a product uh, and just left it there. And that actually enabled for a much better engagement. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Tim Charlewa in the Slido. And Tim's question is, cons could consortia bring forward non-proprietary archetype products with detailed data sets to collectively de-risk technology? And I think that's for you and the ET um, Emerging Technologies Program and team, Larry and Joel. Larry, would you like to start or should I? <laughs> I was waiting for you, Joe. Okay. No, I, I think Larry highlighted, you know, that, that there are different tracks for engagements in his talk. And I think, you know, there is, there is the possibility of having, I think, engagement on, you know, if not a you know, specific product, at least some data to, to, to have some, some meaningful back and forth in terms of providing some specific feedback. I think one challenge anytime you move outside of having a specific program, a specific molecule, a specific set of questions, a specific use case, you know, the, the questions become more general, but then the feedback has to become more general too. And, and there's that's just scientific reality. So I do think there are places where we can engage in a different way on this. You know, obviously it, it still needs to have enough meat there for I think discussion, but I think, you know, there, there are different groups that we have engaged in this pathway, as Larry mentions. And I think, you know, that's that's certainly a tool, but again, it's it's, it's still gonna be, I think, driven based on, you know, the type of engagement and questions we need to discuss and also how much data and how much specificity we can bring to the conversation. Yeah, I think I agree with Joe. I, I think we definitely have no problem to entertain this type of uh, meeting uh, in terms of uh, even uh, under emerging technology. Right, uh, but Joe is correct, right? At certain point, um, I think we can talk a little bit, share my experience with you. We have a lot of uh, this type of a discussion already, right? Uh, uh, very productive. I mean, like some of these are very, very early technology development. And, but uh, we, we, we give a high level feedback and then also like uh, the company did a very good job to provide high level background information, right? But I do want to point out that some of the specific, like you really cannot assess the risk until you identify certain product and molecule due to the interaction with the specific uh, technology. Like for example, I can give you the fact that like for direct compression, continuous manufacturing process, your high dose drug low and the low dose drug low, the risk will be very different. So if we talk about the technology platform, it's very difficult to get into those uh, area. So I just want to sort of uh, share this to point out some of the limitation we may have. Uh, but if you start to suggest some, uh, like in the things can still provide information about certain product characteristics, not naming the product, but certain product char characteristics, you are interested using this type of a technology, I think that will also help, uh, help, very helpful too. But I think in the emerging technology program, there's a lot of flexibility, uh, really depends on what type of uh, feedback you want from, uh, from, the, from, from the agency. Thank you for that. 
Larry and Joel, any, anyone else? And again, I'd, I'd like to make sure that anyone in the community um, that would like to contribute to the discussion knows that they are welcome to do so. They just need to raise their hand or um, enter through the Slido chat or the ideas in the Slido chat so that we know to call on you and, and highlight that idea. While we wait to see if anything, um, if, if anyone raises their hands, we had another question for Rohan in the, the chat from uh, Tim Charlebois. And that was a question um, as to whether your phases of innovation that you showed on your slide track with clinical development of a product or are they also applicable to introduction of technology for approved products? Yeah. Tim, where have you been? I haven't seen you in a while. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, so when it's associated with a product, right? I mean, if, if we time it, we do time it with the clinical, which is uh, the idea being that whatever new technology or platforms we put in to make sure that product for pivotal trials is made accordingly. But there are a number of cases where, in fact, we use it for commercial products, you know, including a, yeah, you know, including some of the, the modeling work that I've shown. We, we've, uh, we've used it for a product that's been in the market for about seven years or so. Yeah. Thank you. And we have just a minute. Um, a few minutes left before we go to lunch. And I don't want to slow us down, but I thought Sally asked a really important question. Um, and so I'd like to ask Sally um, if you'd like to, to pose the question yourself or bring that up for discussion. I think um, Sally, if you can um, be on camera and we can spotlight you, um, that'd be. Also wonderful. Can you guys hear me right? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I, it's just a general question. And I think that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there, there are changes and when we talk about certain things and we, because we, we think that we understand them, then we don't take enough time to really digest and harmonize the concept at the point that everybody's gonna be aligned with what we are really intending to do. So this is, this is, again, goes back to change management. Um, my question is, you know, I have, I have worked with multiple filings and, and, and we talk about science-based and risk-based, um, but in particular, I, you know, I think that people understand a little bit more about what risk-based means, but I have seen in multiple occasions when, when folks talk about science-based, you know, many occasions I have seen folks talking about just the data, right? If you do an analysis and well, I calculate a p-value for that or I calculate some sort of like statistics on that and they assume that it's because it's the science of statistics is science-based. Um, so, and then I have seen in other cases where people try to use, you know, like the understandings of the process itself and the engineering and concepts of mass balance and just the fundamentals of that process to define what science-based is. So I might be not, I don't know if it's completely out there. I have seen it in multiple guidances that we talk about science-based. I just don't know if folks are still, if we have made some sort of um, agreement of how we're defining science-based for people. That's more towards the folks from the FDA because I think that I, I think that there's, I have seen that gap and, and, and it ha I have seen that gap trying to put a filing myself working with other colleagues who are helping out. Yeah, I can address this question first and then Joe, feel free to chime in a little bit. I think in terms of, uh, you are talking about the consistency in the post-approval, uh, even like let's say the evaluation, right? Yeah, I agree sometimes like, 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 just want to let you know the amount of work we are dealing with is uh, more than like uh, uh, ten thousand uh, supplement uh, per year, as well as uh, as well as uh, the even uh, for the original is the number. I, I don't really remember the number, right? I think a certain type of uh, inconsistency. I think definitely uh, from from our from our end, it is expected. Um, 
And, and I plus also considering that uh, we have acquired a lot of uh, large pool of uh, quality assessor, some of them are with a little bit background, those also uh, um, can may contribute this uh, as well. Uh, but we do actually try to, our best to ensure consistency, uh, apply the risk and uh, science-based uh, approach in our assessment. So what we are doing, like, like we, I'm not saying like we finish in this area, uh, but what we are doing is that uh, in the, we start to, we have already incorporated more like a team-based approach uh, based on different disciplines to evaluate those type of uh, application. So to ensure really the science-based approach. And then to your point, Sally, I think some of the things is that like, even though for the individual, uh, they may have a different type of uh, risk uh, assessment framework they use uh, uh, vary from uh, one reviewer to the other reviewer. That is where, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in my talk a little bit about the program, like the CASA program we are going to develop. And basically really to develop more formalized risk-based uh, algorithm using the latest scientists. And then this, uh, this uh, system is going to be maintained and continuously improved based on the best practice we have here. Uh, it's, not, it's not there yet, it's still in the development and initial implementation, but that's where we try to that get to. That will actually help us to improve our consistency in the near future. But Joe also is the person who developed uh, this type of system for biology, so he may be able to give you a little bit more granular level information. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of this always this, you know, turns back to, to communication and we have, you know, training really, you know, good, good understanding of, of what we're talking about. But I think all the tools that we're developing, I think, aren't necessarily ETT or even technology specific, but really are at the core trying to address this, this communication and this back and forth, you know, challenge. I, I would throw besides cost, you know, PQCMC in, how we think about information being submitted. I would throw in, you know, Q12, where we talk about trying to identify you know, concepts, data, expectations, shared understanding of risk up front. Um, but I think all this is is driving towards a better shared understanding of, of that. And, you know, the idea of what's new data, what's existing understanding, right? The, the definition of, of prior knowledge, we've all agreed on for a long time in, in ICH as it is. So I think all those all those tools are, are enablers for us to continue to move forward in terms of, of sharing this vocabulary. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank it is time um, for lunch we, break, but Sally, yes, you, you yeah, have one more question. Very right. quick, I um, you know, just I just wanted to say thank you to um, you know both gentlemen for um, answering that. Um, to that question. Now, one one thing that I would like to add is you know like sometimes we think about these consortiums um, that we tend to work with and these other groups that are you know apart from the uh, regulatory agency as in like sharing data and doing things that are very um, ambitious, right? I think that I have found that some of these consortiums are very effective just sitting down and having everybody in the room and just saying, hey, this is what we're gonna be agreeing to, to call this one moving forward, like what we did with the APC workshop, right? Um, so I think that that's, you know, one recommendation that I can give that I don't know if I, I, you know, the committee gave it during our document is, you know, using this consortium just to find alignment uh, with regards to some of the new terminology that is coming, because I think that that's going to be able, that we're going to be enable, enabling folks to share best practices way better if we align with the same, you know, uh, concepts at least. So just, just was thinking about that while you guys were talking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally, for the for, for the suggestion. Sure. Yep. And thank you. Um, now, the only thing we have left before lunch is to say thanks again to our speakers, Sarah, Joel, Larry, and Rohan, you know, for the time and the thoughtfulness that you put into your presentations. I think it'll set us up really well for our next session on where the gaps and, and opportunities lie um, in building these mechanisms. So thank you all very much. I think Linda wants us back at 1.45. Thank and th thanks everyone. Welcome uh, back from lunch and welcome to session three. Uh, Linda, do you wanna display the poll results for a minute?
Yes, we are going to pull that up in a bit. I think there's some interesting poll questions there. We'll just let people look at them. Are we able to see these? I look back in Slido and it's, it, I, could, I could see that I responded, but I couldn't see the results in the, in the Slido app. So I was just wondering if people had, were able other than when we display them on the screen, if they'll be able to see them. Um, it's just the, uh, on the main screen here. Uh, okay. Everyone else has a particip our participants, yeah. Okay, so well, this is probably the right time to, to quickly uh, look at and reflect on these poll questions. And thanks to the folks that have responded. Uh, we just, these are just to stimulate a little bit of thought. And I think we could certainly come back to this in the uh, community discussion at the end of this session, as well as in the other sessions. Uh, this question uh, about the extent uh, that changes in regulatory policy procedures, practices, or culture could, could uh, affect uh, innovation in pharmaceutical manufacturing, as you see, uh, some extent, uh, and and or to a large extent. Uh, so that's still still uh, you know some some opportunity you know at least reflected by the community there. Moving on to to number six, uh, which which uh, sort of focuses on the, the how part of that uh, question, and it's kind of split between regulations, review practices workforce training and, and uh, guidance with emphasis, you know, a little bit higher on the, on the last two. Uh, thanks for those responses. Uh, number seven moves over to uh, industry practices. And here there's an even louder voice, I think, to a large extent, uh, innovation can be enabled by practices in industry. Uh, so that's kind of a strong vote there, I think in that direction, which is not surprising based on the conversations we've had earlier. Uh, and looking on to, to number eight, uh, uh, greater, greater, this was sort of split uh, vote, but greater willingness to accept risk, uh, not at all shocking based on what, you know, the perceptions of the pharmaceutical industry are. Uh, but I do like seeing increased pre-competitive collaboration to substantially de-risk implementation. And, you know, something that I think has certainly been enhanced and accelerated by the pandemic, uh, increased recognition of manufacturing as a value driver, uh, and also, you know, a lot of votes for, for uh, greater transparency regarding innovation activities, uh, which is something maybe we can come back to talk about. And is that the end of our questions there? We have one more. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, some extent academic practices uh, uh, could also enhance, and, and is that the end there, Linda? Yes. Yes, thank you uh, for, for that. So thanks to folks for responding. This is to get people thinking and, and we're hoping to stimulate some discussion there. So welcome to, to uh, session three. And I just wanted to take a second, you know, first to thank uh, the, the uh, speakers and participants uh, in sessions one and two this morning. I thought it was uh, uh, thought provoking and, and uh, very useful, those sessions. Uh, I appreciate the engagement. And for those that are hanging in with us uh, for this afternoon, I uh, really look forward to continuing and enhancing that discussion and on into tomorrow. And, and so as we look at the overall flow of the agenda, uh, this is kind of a pivot point in, in the agenda. So this morning uh, we wanted to uh, have the opportunity to uh, basically disseminate uh, awareness of the report itself uh, and to talk about and reflect on the technologies that were emphasized in the report as being those that are most impactful uh, in the near future, uh, and then to reflect on the existing mechanisms uh, for accelerating and enhancing and enabling uh, manufacturing innovation, and to give uh, FDA a chance to uh, give visibility to what they're doing, uh, which was very, very useful. And at this point, we wanted to pivot a bit uh, toward uh, what gaps do we see? This is, uh, uh, Kelly mentioned this earlier, what gaps uh, do we see uh, in the community as a whole for uh, enabling innovation? And that's what this session is intended to be. And as we move toward the flow, we're trying to use this session and the discussion to say, well, these are the real problems in front of us, uh, you know, as it relates to the, 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 the hurdles uh, that we face and, and really hear from people. The report uh, did weigh in on this a fair amount, but we, we wanna hear from the community and, and uh, draw energy out of that. Uh, and, and, uh, and then 
as we move through into tomorrow's agenda, uh, we'll be talking about solutions uh, that should address these gaps and then the path forward. So I really urge you to continue to stay with us and participate because as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, we're really looking for community engagement and ownership over this problem statement and very much appreciate your, your attention to this workshop and ongoing attention to uh, the issues that we face as a community. Uh, so with that, uh, the introduction to this session uh, specifically, we have a series of four short talks you see on the screen. Uh, these are intended to be approximately 10 minute uh, short talks uh, and they're there to provide uh, some opportunity for additional reflection on the topic of, of what gaps, challenges, and opportunities do we see uh, in, in enhancing and advancing innovation, uh, uh, and, and uh, also to use these talks as a springboard to stimulate the discussion. So we will have the, the, the four 10-minute talks uh, serially. I'll introduce them in turn. Um, and, and then uh, we, we will hold questions uh, until the community discussion at the end. Uh, I think we have 45 minutes for that at the end, which will, uh, so I ask you to please, you know, continue to use Slido to input your questions to the speakers and your ideas for discussion. Uh, use the upvoting feature for that. Uh, and, you know, remember, you know, raise your hand if you want to speak uh, as well, and we'll try to recognize that and the extent possible, we're going to try to, you know, get voices in out here and, and really hear from people uh, and try to stimulate some discussion. Uh, so uh, with, with, uh, with that as an intro, and I hope I haven't forgotten any of the, the, the ground rules there. Uh, uh, first, our first speaker is Tom Ransohoff, uh, who is, is uh, co-head of the Biologicals franchise at Resilience, a manufacturing and technology company dedicated to broadening access to complex medicines and protecting biopharmaceutical supply chains against disruption. Tom? Welcome. Thanks, Tim. Uh, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Great. Okay. Well, uh, I think we can advance uh, to the next slide. I'd like to just start by saying it's it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I've really enjoyed this discussion, and 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 I really appreciate the opportunity to provide just some brief uh, thoughts on some of the challenges related to new technology adoption in in our industry. Uh, and, and because we're all products of our experience, uh, and this is, you know, my own perspective, I wanted to, you know, start by sharing, you know, my, my experience and, and uh, so you can, uh, you know, then judge uh, the, the relevance of, of my comments, uh, uh, you know, based on that. But uh, my, my career has uh, been primarily uh, focused in the recombinant protein and monoclonal antibody uh, field, uh, you know, over 30 years in bioprocessing, and and I have um, worked on a number of um, new technologies that have, you know, been successfully introduced at some level to the industry. Um, most of them in the downstream processing area, um, and and obviously uh, all focused on um, bioprocess or biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, and uh, I'll start by dating myself. Uh, uh, by uh, uh, acknowledging that one of the first new technologies I worked on, which uh, is now obviously considered a conventional and accepted technology is protein A. Uh, but at one point uh, when I entered the industry in the, in the mid eighties, um, you know, the uh, uh, conventional accepted approaches for uh, purifying proteins from complex mixtures were uh, primarily ion exchange chromatography and, and precipitation. And the idea of using uh, a coat protein from a pathogenic organism as an affinity ligand to purify a therapeutic injectable was viewed by some as a radical and risky uh, new technology. But obviously now uh, we all you know, know and appreciate the value of affinity technologies. And uh, I was involved in some of the early evaluation of protein A and antibody processes and later in the uh, development of recombinant forms of protein A. And obviously that field has continued to evolve uh, as we now have, you know, base stable uh, protein A-like ligands that uh, have been successfully adopted by industry. Uh, I, uh, a little bit of a theme here also involved in novel affinity ligand discovery, uh, in particular, uh, you know, collaboration between DIAX, one of my former employers and Wyeth, 
uh, and discovery of a novel affinity ligand for purification of a factor, factor eight uh, products. Um, and as well in single use technologies, uh, pre-packed column technologies, and more recently in, in continuous uh, uh, chromatography. And, and in all of these cases, you know, my role was, you know, uh, a role in combination with many, many, many other people, obviously. And, and so one of the points I think that I want to make is that it really does take, I think, a community uh, a, and uh, to develop uh, a, and successfully introduce, you know, a new technology or a new way of operating into our industry. And I, that theme, I think, has, you know, been shared by many of the speakers uh, uh, you know, today and, and the importance of communication of standards of, uh, you know, developing strong communities of practice and, uh, um, you know, common language and common guidances, I think is really critical to this process. So these types of, uh, you know, forums are, are important to that process. Uh, and I think it's important also to I stress that these are my own personal uh, perspectives, but I think they're aligned with, you know, my current employer resilience, who's really focused on uh, leveraging innovation and, and new technologies to develop evolved and, and new platforms for production of, of biologics. So, you know, bottom line up front, my overall conclusions are that we can, as an industry, introduce uh, new technologies. Uh, we have demonstrated that ability, uh, but they, there are some challenges to the process. Um, and, and I think one of the things I've learned is that the, the benefit really needs to be consistent with the level of effort. If we're talking about a technology that's going to require a lot of work and effort to implement, we're unlikely to do that for a modest benefit. So that's part of the evaluation, I think, of, uh, of new technologies as, as, we, as we look at where we might implement them in our processes and our product development programs. And finally, the timelines for adoption of innovation are long compared to other industries. I think uh, um, that's uh, been true throughout my career. I think it's it's still true, although I do think we're we're getting better at it. Uh, but uh, I do think that, uh, you know um, this is this is uh, in part uh, due to the um, timelines for our product development. Uh, you know, my friends in the software industry talk about uh, you know being disappointed if they don't launch a new product uh, a year from when they start. Obviously, we think in terms of decades, and I. I think it's hard for the new technology introduction process to move at a very different cadence from the product development process. So to some extent, I think uh, that is part of the, uh, um, the, the recognition of those long timelines it needs to be part of our um, uh, approach to new technology introduction. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I just have a few slides here, but uh, this I thought was one uh, useful example that uh, I've been tracking uh, and I'm sure many of you have, is the adoption of single-use uh, bioreactor technology in our industry. Uh, but just uh, thought it, it's a, a useful example in reflecting on how long it does take uh, to really truly adopt a, a new technology. And, and thinking back to the first introductions of single-use bioreactors uh, in the late 1990s uh, with the wave bioreactors, which... Uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with it are a rocking motion bioreactor, not really representative of the uh, stir tank bioreactors that are used uh, in most bioprocesses. So, you know, uh, that led to enough in interest and, and excitement that the first uh, uh, CSTR uh, stir tank type bioreactors, uh, single use bioreactors, were introduced uh, a little less than a decade later. And then the first uh, 2000 liter single use bioreactor, which is sort of our uh, current uh, uh, most commonly adopted uh, uh, production scale for single use right now uh, was introduced uh, about uh, 12 years after, after the wave introduction. And then finally about 15 years later, uh, the first uh, FDA approval of a, uh, biopharm a commercial biopharmaceutical Manufactured in a single-use uh, production bioreactor um, was uh, uh, was successfully accomplished, and and even now uh, the slides up here show, um, you know, sort of a, a fifteen-year view of the installed capacity of single-use bioreactors compared to stainless steel, both in in volume on the left and in in number of bioreactors on the right. This is from a database uh, trending uh, um, supply and demand trends for biomanufacturing capacity that I helped. Uh, 
develop at a, a consulting company uh, uh, called BPTC, which is now part of BDO and it's still a database that I find useful. Um, it, you know, it shows that even now we're continuing to adopt at a greater rate single use bioreactors compared to stainless steel, but this is uh, 20 years later. So adoption cycle of a, a you know, very successful new technology in this case, uh, some, somewhere in the order of one to two decades, depending on your perspective. Uh, so finally, next slide, um, and we'll get to uh, my last slide, which is really just an overview of uh, the challenges as I see them to uh, new technology adoption <clears throat> and the opportunities and things that we can do as an industry um, to, to improve our ability to do this. So, you know, one of the most important challenges is the risk associated uh, with uh, new technology adoption. And this has been highlighted well in the, in the NASM report and also in the discussions this morning, you know, um, they're, they're, penalties for delays and setbacks in any pharmaceutical development program. And these are significant. Uh, and uh, as a result, you know, um, the perceived risks for new technology adoption um, are, um, you know, perceived in the context of what if it delays a important, uh, you know, biopharma development program. Uh, as a result, you know, if we can develop a, pro a product with conventional technologies, we're more likely to do that. Nobody wants to be the first to develop a new technology. And as was highlighted uh, in the report and before, the, the first person to, to go through that approval process or the first company to go through that approval process, you know, faces the, the double burden of, uh, you know, justifying and supporting the new technology as well as their own product. Uh, which is a, a heavy lift. Um, second uh, challenge is there, there's there's no good time to implement new technologies, and I think Todd uh, mentioned this at the very beginning. You know, as as our timelines get compressed, this becomes maybe even more and more true. It's it's hard to find a time to slot in. You know, the time that's required uh, to implement a new technology when it it may require more time to qualify new equipment, to train uh, operators on a new way of operating. And uh, uh, this, this uh, inherently will slow down the first uh, few times uh, a new technology is adopted. So how do we manage that? Um, I do think has been highlighted before, our industry invests relatively little compared to our revenues in new technology compared to other industries. And, and I think that's also perhaps a, re uh, a reaction to the fact that our manufacturing costs are quite low compared to the sales price of our product. So, you know, I think uh, we are seeing that improve. And, uh, you know, the Rohan and uh, Narendra's talk today uh, gave some great examples of, you know, the potential impact uh, that proactive investment can provide as companies, you know, really do develop uh, exciting new technologies, uh, as was highlighted uh, this morning. I think, uh, you know, uh, part of uh, being better at this is, is being more proactive at investing in new technologies as an industry. Um, and part of that is, you know, justifying the value. And I think the benefits are often underappreciated. We, we focus too much, I think, on the cost and timeline benefits only while underappreciating the potential to add real value to our programs and products and, and to the supply chain as, as we've all, you know, uh, you know experienced within COVID, the, the impact of a fragile supply chain uh, on, on everybody is significant. And, Part of the uh, value that we can bring with new and better technologies is uh, is the ability uh, to uh, to have a more robust supply chain across our industry. And finally, uh, I think IP uncertainty can be uh, a challenge that uh, people face when when looking at new technology. As obviously, freedom to operate is paramount to the ability to supply. And you know. Uh, but fortunately, there are many opportunities to improve our ability to innovate. And I think some of the strategies that, that I think are, are most important uh, have already been highlighted really today. Um, and those include consortia uh, to allow for pre-competitive uh, collaboration uh, and groups such as Nimble and uh, you know, others are, are, are certainly uh, uh, important, uh, I think, to that objective. Uh, regulatory engagement to provide mechanisms uh, for feedback to innovators. So the ETP, uh, which is highlighted today, I think is a great example of that. And there are others uh, that Sarah talked about in her presentation. I think uh, uh, those, those, are, those are tremendously important. And finally, standards and guidance documents to provide common understanding and vocabulary 
uh, with uh, you know my focus and interest in continuous. Recently, I've spent a lot of time with ICHQ 13, the recent draft, and I think it's a, a really great uh, uh, example of a document that provides a good insight and the use of the annexes to you know provide even more granular perspective without um, you know maybe as uh, rigid uh, uh, you know format as the the actual guidance I think is also very helpful and that was. Uh, you know, I think done well with Q13. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier, proactive investment by industry. I think uh, uh, greater willingness uh, to do that uh, across the industry will, will, is important as well. Um, so as uh, we're all I had, and uh, you know, with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and pass it on to the next speaker. I apologize for probably going over a little bit. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate that. And our, our next speaker moving right along is, is uh, Dolores Hernan, uh, who is a quality specialist in the Human Medicines Evaluation Division at the EMA, where she focuses on the development and characterization of control release delivery systems based on micro and nanotechnologies. Thanks, Dolores, and welcome. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank uh, the National Academy of Science and the FDA for inviting us to share with you our perspectives. Uh, we believe we are very much aligned. We are all on the same boat on this. And I would like to share with you our perspectives on the challenges and opportunities offered by innovation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, so uh, the EMA has been mentioned several times, I believe you all are aware. So I will go quickly over this. So as you all know, same as FDA, our mission is to foster scientific excellence in the evaluation and supervision of medicines to promote public and animal health. Next slide, please. So in order to achieve our goal and to, to address our public health mission, we acknowledge that innovation is needed we need medicines of the best quality, which are highly efficacious of a, and which have a good safety profile. We need medicines that address an unmet medical need. And we need to avoid shortages uh, to uh, processes which are improved and processes which are reliable to increase the flexibility and agility, increase yields and in the environmental uh, and decrease the environmental impact that was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers. So we are an open forward agency and we encourage innovation. Next slide, please. I cannot see them in full, I don't know. Okay, so reflecting a little bit uh, under the scope of this session, which are the general challenges I see? If, we, if you can press the next button. Yes, again, please. So I see that both regulators and industry, generally uh, we have a traditional mindset and this can uh, create uh, fears. Next, next one, please. And next one. So industry has fear that their innovation uh, would not be accepted by regulators, but regulators as well on our end, we need to have early visibility of which are the company's developments to ensure that we are prepared. Next one, please. So we all need training to make sure we understand these innovative technologies uh, so that we develop uh, appropriate processes and then we regulate them accordingly. Next slide, next one, please. So yes, we acknowledge industry has to do an upfront capital investment that is one of the risks, but we also need to constantly evaluate whether our regulatory framework is uh, appropriate and whether there is the need to update our regulatory frameworks. So we acknowledge that there are challenges at both ends. And then I will go over the opportunities we see. Next slide, please. So with regards to the, those were general reflections of challenges I see between in, among industry and regulators, but with regards to more, going more in detail, technical and regulatory challenges, we all see that there are more and more complex systems and technologies under development, for example, uh, additive manufacturing platform technologies. We are seeing more um, uh, progressive control strategies, for example, based on performance-based approaches, artificial intelligence that has been mentioned earlier in the workshop, advanced automation and advanced process controls. 
We have also, also seen portable modular systems that and bedside manufacturing and decentralized manufacturing approaches, for example, in the case of advanced therapies, medicinal products. And with regards to the complex systems and complex medicines, I was referring to, for example, here a little bit companion diagnostics and borderline products. Next slide, please. So seeing all this, what is EMA doing? So um, back in 2020, we re uh, conducted a horizon scanning, uh, horizon scanning activities to identify which uh, are the innovations that are coming and make sure that our regulatory system is capable of regulating those technologies and novel medicines. So this is a, I, you cannot see it here, but on the lower part, of this slide, there is the link to this document where we cover the, the outcome from this uh, horizon scanning. This was done, uh, is that deep, deep report done, done by our colleagues from the regulatory science. Also meetings we had with industry stakeholders to understand from them which are the technologies and the challenges they see in the coming in the near future. So we could work together and prepare for those. So, Given the scope of the meeting here, I try to uh, outline a little bit which are the uh, core recommendations relevant for today's discussion. So the, one, of, one of the goals and uh, the primary recommendations uh, from this uh, horizon scanning activity was to facilitate the implementation of novel manufacturing technologies. And another one to promote research and innovation in regulatory science. Next slide, please. So in addition to this, what is the EMA in collaboration with the European Commission doing? So importantly, and I think uh, is relevant for today's discussion and for everyone of awareness, in November 2020, the European Commission launched the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. And basically what this means, we are conducting an analysis to try to identify which new technologies among other areas and which uh, new approaches are being developed to ensure that the European regulatory framework is future-proof and support industry in promoting research and technologies for the benefit of patients. Next slide, please. So which are the opportunities that we, we have to engage on CMC dialogue with us? Next one, please. So here I try to outline um, the different um, opportunities we have. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned some of them briefly earlier. The Innovation Task Force is a multidisciplinary platform for early dialogue to have some dialogue with us um, on legal, scientific, and regulatory matters. This is, uh, as I mentioned, an early dialogue at touch base so that uh, uh, at an early stage, you can start a dialogue with us and, and discuss your concerns, present your technology, and then we can take this forward. In addition, this is from EMA, but EMA works in collaboration with all the national competent authorities from all member states in Europe. And in 2015, collaboration was established between our EMA Innovation Task Force and the innovation offices from all member states. So we can have a dialogue, identify training needs for the European regulatory framework and test, take decisions that then could be um, implemented across Europe. Another uh, entry point uh, to, to get support from us uh, you may all know is the scientific advice and protocol assistance uh, platform. Also importantly, uh, was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, uh, which, uh, forum, uh, which forums are available to have dialogue with um, regulators as an industry and not single meetings. I would like to stress that at the level of the quality working party and the biologist working party, which are formed by uh, EMA Secretariat together with representatives, quality assessors on the small molecules and biologicals area from all member states. Once a year, we have uh, meetings with our industry stakeholders to discuss topics of common interest. So this is one of the platforms we have available. We, we are also working on the um, on development of a platform to strengthen our dialogue with quality and GMP inspections. And you will be hearing from the, on this from us in the near future. 
And also we want, we want to acknowledge that academia uh, plays an important role in innovation. We have an academia office and we believe that the collaboration with academia and learned societies is an important um, aspect that we should uh, keep in mind. Next slide, please. So this, I, I wanted to put as well uh, this into global dimension. Uh, uh, we believe uh, that developments are done in a global manner. And in this uh, regard, the EMA has a collaboration, uh, mutual uh, understanding agreements with several agencies across the globe, and also is member of different international platforms for dialogue. For example, ICMRA, International Platform of um, a regulatory Forum, uh, ICH. So I think it's important that industry work together, that we don't work in silos, the collaboration with academia and research institutions, and that we all, and they liaise with regulators, so we all work together to make this happen. We cannot work in isolation. In, an important aspect that I wanted to bring to the table is that applicants should allow regulators to discuss their applications among themselves. We have found ourselves in situations where we had a, a new technology. We wanted to discuss approaches with other regulators, but we didn't uh, receive the approval from the company. So I hear several times, oh, but mm, you know, we, there is an alignment between regulators, but we need the support from industry and the openness from industry to allow us to have uh, discussions around new technologies to make sure um, we have uh, tools uh, to try to align our regulatory expectations as much as possible. And of course, another aspect we, we should consider as well, whether there are national regulations at regional level that may prevent to share and discuss com commercially confidential information among uh, different authorities. So next slide, please. So my take home messages is that innovation is needed for the benefit of public health. I believe that industry and regulators share the responsibility to make this happen for the benefit of the patients. All parties have challenges, but we should work together to overcome them and collaborate. And I believe that early dialogue is essential to pave the way and ensure that there is a mutual understanding. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dolores. I appreciate your comments and for, for keeping us moving along. So very dense uh, content, but, but very well appreciated. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is, is Malcolm Barrett Johnson, who is Managing Director and Regulatory Strategy Expert at PharmaMedic Consultancy Limited. He is a physician with pharmaceutical experience in medical and regulatory affairs. Uh, welcome, Malcolm. Tim, thank you very much indeed. And uh... It's, uh, it's, an, it's an absolute pleasure to be invited to speak today. Um, so I, I'm across the pond. I, I'm, I'm based in London. So it's, uh, I'm coming up to dinner instead of lunch on this side of the pond. Um, what my background is in general, just to give you a very brief understanding of why my views might be of any importance at all in, or interest. I, I used to be a regulator. So like Dolores, I worked with the MEA at one point, but I worked for the MHIA. And as you know, after Brexit now, we are sort of outside of the fold. So the MHIA is slightly different. I work constantly with the MHIA in a consultancy regulatory capacity. I'm also the director on three biotech companies as well. Um, manufacturing isn't really my area particularly. So you think, oh God, what's he going to be talking about? My, I'm more medical affairs. So I've acted as a medical director for a number of companies, including big ones like AstraZeneca, Pfizer's, MSDs in the UK. What I thought I'd do, though, and I can, I can, I'm going to um, just compliment and say thank you to Janine Jameson. Janine raised an area which I think may act as quite an interesting straw man for discussion just going through, just to highlight a few points as a regulator, an ex-regulator, and someone who works in the industry day by day. This, this thing is a reflection paper by FPA, and FPA are the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries. So they're part of IFPMO, the International Federation of Industries. This, this, this 
issue came out in November 2020, and it was a reflection paper uh, reflecting on the way that manufacturing in one area and, and, and sort of small manufacturing units could be used. But it does raise a number of issues. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the European arena, uh, we are the second biggest um, um, area for wanting pharmaceutical medicines. Um, we are a huge sort of buyer of them. Uh, we're constrained obviously by, as you are in the States, by, by costings. Everything is very patient centric. So I, I agree completely with what Dolores was saying. The MEA, the MHI are very patient centric as indeed the FDA are. And the key objectives, as you will know all too well, are to ensure medicines are safe, improve lives, available to patients globally, and preserve safety, efficacy, and quality, the three cornerstones of the triumvirate stool. And I know the industry is you know, investing huge amounts in modernization and manufacturing, and indeed supply operations generally. This is to very basically make sure that the supply chains are adequate. What this does it also raise is something we've all been through recently. Yourselves in the States are still going through it, and we are also well in the UK and Europe. COVID. What we saw from that was a, an absolute need to get supply chains in place. We, we had a bit of a, a tiff with the European Union, as you may well know, in terms of COVID-19 and the supply of vaccines to that. Um, there was some degree of misunderstanding, I think, in terms of supply chains. But what it did raise, and what was very interesting, was the importance of manufacturing and the importance of getting those supply chains right. Standing slightly outside the manufacturing field, to my, my view, manufacturing doesn't get the credit, credit and impetus that it should do. Within the companies themselves, if you're the medical director level, you know about manufacturing, you understand the quality issues, of course you do, but you don't really see that. And I think we've brought manufacturing much more to the fore over the last year, year and a half, two years, and all good for that too. And the other thing which I think is also brought to the fore is a need for universal access. We're not, we don't live in a bubble. We don't just live in the States. We don't just live in the UK. We have to think about the global perspective on that. And as I think it was Kelly Rogers said earlier, one of the other um, sessions, she said, things are very complicated. Things, a lot is going on and indeed they are. And I think Sarah Arden who's from GSK earlier also said, we need to look at the international components of this under ICH. It's incredibly important. So supply chains and disruption are, to my mind, one of the most things, important things we need to look at. So this portal manufacturing that we're discussing here is, I think, one interesting area to look at. Also, you're looking at new technologies. This was brought out in the report too, 3D printing, supporting specialization, supporting production or personalized medicines, which we talk about a lot on the medical side. But I think a lot of us on the medical side don't fully know what that means. Can we actually dispense closer to the patients? Also, it's been talk, talked about, can we have bedside manufacturing? You know, can we manufacture to the patient, but very, very locally? That being a lot of advantages. At one point, I was involved with the Kurdistan government, where we had a lot of falsified medicines, a lot of children dying, because the manufacturing process wasn't there locally, the vaccines weren't there, and a lot of the tablets that were being given were made out of straw. It won, and, and sand. It was not a pleasant site, nor was it a pleasant situation. So manufacturing is vital to this and getting it local. Manufacturing has to be agile as well. And this has to be basically addressing things as well from the green agenda. Um, if you think of things like global pandemics have brought that to the fore. And we have to see that the speed of manufacturing has also increased. Next slide, please. Part of this, and, and What's, what's an interesting area to, for looking, to look at is something that came out of the European Commission. This came out very recently at the end of last year, beginning of this, is the EU pharmaceutical strategy, which you know, Delors, I'm sure, is working with very closely under the European Medicines Agency. And this is very much ensuring preparedness for manufacturing technologies. It's bringing out areas such as security manufacturing, so making sure that supply line is available, making sure that what we have available to us is fit for purpose. Also, from the EU perspective, and although I'm sitting in the UK, I can claim some degree of Europeanness. I'm out in Italian. It's making sure that the this you know the European side has a strong voice globally under ICH, and indeed with yourselves at the FDA as well. 
And also, I think it also brings to the, 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 the four things like manufacturing diversification, which is vitally important. As you may know, um, very recently, we've had something called the European Health Emergency Response Authority set up called HERA. Uh, it could be named after the Greek god, but actually it could be HERO. And this is basically being set up by the European side to make sure that we, if we have a situation like we've had with COVID, we don't get caught off guard again. Manufacturing is a very central part of that, and this is why the pharmaceutical strategy emphasises it. I'm just going to look very quickly at these pods because I think it encompasses a number of very interesting areas. These are multiple units that can be housed, um, a defined set of pharmaceutical operations, but can basically be copied and copied and copied to basically become fully autonomous and be replicate an equivalent manner the, the process and the quality that you might have in one country to another site in another place. And this should lead to consistency, higher production volumes, and a greater patient responsiveness, whether that be local or globally. Next slide, please. Well, they also raise a number of interesting issues about acceptance of things. If you go down this modular approach on a global basis, um, is the site itself autonomous and mobile, but also where does that sit with GMP? I do lecture on GMP, and I know just how important it is to make sure it's replicable and make sure that wherever that unit may end up, that can be replicated back to GMP, which kept where it was in the host country. Is there a series of registered establishments we can validate against it? And how do we sort of validate against stability and validation studies in a changed location? It's an interesting area and something which I thought was very, very interesting when I saw this as a concept. And how do you do things against insurance too? How does insurance cover things like that? So general recommendations out of this report and things which I think are very important, things under ICH, are we taking those ICH areas adequately forward in things like portable autonomous manufacturing? Are we taking them forward in areas of emergency usage, which we all know too well under COVID? Tom mentioned this, I think, generally before with his work on ICH. And are we actually building those discussions between our manufacturing colleagues and our quality offices, whether it be the MEA, the MHO or elsewhere? And I'd just like to finish on another couple of points. Um, one thing which I do think is vitally important and came up in the discussion I was sharing earlier is manpower. It came up in, the, in this consensus report too. Manpower, but not only manpower, but education, uh, education for that manpower. The technology we're seeing now is so advanced that it wasn't even in existence when I was a doctor several years ago. We're treating people with things like immunotherapies, which didn't exist. Keytruda was an amazing technological advancement, which I didn't even understand when I looked at the original data for MSD. So we have to educate people and constantly educate them. And we need to do that as well for the agencies. The MHRA, and it's a bit of a problem at the moment, is actually dropping a third of its staff in the UK. I don't know if the FDA know that. And everybody else on the MHI side is reapplying for their jobs. It's not right, it's down to money. It's partly because we pulled out of Europe, I'm not a Brexiteer, but that's putting a lot of stress on the MHIA. And I'm sure the MEA and indeed the FDA have got similar problems with money, but also with training. And I think that's something we on the industry side can help with and probably should help our colleagues in the agency side to make sure that they're trained properly and understand the problems that we're having on the industry side. So, Tim, I'll leave it there. I'm, I hope I haven't gone too much over my timing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Appreciate it. We're, we're doing OK here. We're, we'll soldier on. Uh, not very, very helpful and uh, thought, thought provoking uh, comments. And we'll pick this up in the discussion. Uh, our last uh, speaker in this, these, this short talk session is Mike Corrigan. Uh, who is owner and managing director of Horizon Controls Group, which is a full service digital process automation company founded to promote the best that the field of automation engineering has to offer. Mike, welcome and thanks. Thanks, Tim. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, I'm really honored to, to present here today on behalf of Horizon in Controls Group and at the International Academy of Automation Engineering. It's been a fascinating conversation up to now. And I think um, a number of the points that I might raise today have already been covered. But I think just um, Malcolm's finishing points there on manpower and education are something that's going to 
um, really resonate with what I'm about to say here as well. So just a little bit of background on myself. I'm originally from Cork in Ireland, um, and I moved to the US in 2004, and I'm calling in from uh, Bluebell in Pennsylvania today. Um, as the founder of Horizon Controls Group, we're an automation engineering uh, company who are very much focused on and 100% focused on the life science industry and uh, providing solutions to the manufacturing and the uh, laboratory space uh, within those in, in that industry. Additionally, we have an area of business that's very focused on training and upskilling of um, people on the different platforms and use in the manufacturing space. And in addition, then within Horizon Controls Group, we have a growing area of our business that's very focused on the mixed reality and the augmented reality, virtual reality applications uh, for manufacturing and uh, laboratory uh, situations. Um, that encompasses uh, machine learning, object recognition, and a movement for our business forward with digital twins. Um, it, it brings me to a, a point where I might mention um, a project that we are involved in additionally at this moment in time uh, with MXD. It's funded under the CARES Act. And we are um, part of the remit is to install um, digital twin technology at two life science manufacturing um, companies um, and to test the benefit of the deployment of the twins in the event of another um, national emergency. So really to stress test the benefit of the digital twin. As part of that project, um, the, we are working with uh, MIT and we are conducting a survey of companies and of the government, the FDA and bodies, and also academia. So if anybody is interested in participating in uh, that survey with us, and um, we'd be very keen to um, have you participate and then get a readout afterwards of our findings, which I think is very relevant to the topics we've been talking about today. Um, and, and hopefully you'll feel the same. Um, on the area of the International Academy of Automation Engineering. It's a not-for-profit automation and digital manufacturing education and capability building entity. Um, I came up with the idea back in 2012 and along with some of my colleagues that are on the call here today and would have put a lot of effort into it um, over the last number of years since 2016. So just to give a, a mention to Malcolm Jeffers and also to Gemma Doyle on the call here with me, a lot of great effort. Uh, we, we stood up a life science advisory board in 2016 and some of the uh, advisory board members are on the call today. And um, specifically, I know it's Sally made a, a number of um, very uh, worthwhile comments earlier, uh, specifically around the change management and the people aspect of that as well. And coming back to, uh, Malcolm's comment just in the previous conversation around the manpower and education. I think this is a nice uh, intersection point for us. Um, the Life Science Advisory Board is made up of um, leaders from a number of companies, uh, specifically uh, Thermo Fisher, Biogen, GSK, who are on the call today, Pfizer, um, Takeda, uh, Genentech, Vertex, and a number of others. And uh, we'd encourage participation from, from any of those that, that are interested. Um, typically, they're uh, leaders that have a global automation remit or maybe data science remit and analytics. And they bring a lot of thought leadership to the, um, to the table. And then we leverage what feedback we get for them. We do some research and we share with them. And then we take that into our education programs. So we have a, a very comprehensive um, education uh, program built out and it's available online and we've also worked with nimble and um, delivered on some some projects uh, most recently the spider 2 project uh, which was done in association with um, nc state and worcester polytechnic institute as well and there was a cohort of maybe nine participating entities on that project. I think it was one of the, the larger projects that into um, that nimble had led and it was very successful. In addition, we've done projects with MXD and we're also one of the founding partners of Biomade as well. So that's just a little bit of background on the IAAE. And it kind of leads me nicely into the, maybe the next slide, which is an area that I want to um, speak to. 
and it um, brings us to a project that we were recently involved in with MXD, and it's very much similar in um, you know the approach um, and and the outputs uh, as to a lot of the conversations that we're having with the committee today. And um, it's it's focused, as you can see there, around the analysis of the advantages of and the barriers to adoption of smart manufacturing for the med for medical products. And this came about shortly after um, the country went into the, the world went into lockdown, um, and we started a project in May of 2020. And our remit was to um, identify and interview a number of uh, medical product manufacturing uh, companies, in, specifically in the US. So we identified over the course of time, 10 companies, 10, 10 participants. Um, nine of those were individual sites within the US and one was a corporate entity. So it gave us a, a very interesting um, perspective. And what, what we did was we set out a program whereby we focused on the, um, the traditional digital transformation and technology adoption approach around people, business processes, technology, and regulatory affairs. And we identified um, leaders within each of the organizations that had um, responsibility in those areas. And then we set about a um, engagement which had a comprehensive online survey. The second part involved us um, utilizing the BioForum digital plant maturity model, where we did a deep dive on um, each of the areas and the, the questions in the, uh, the DPMM, such that we could get a pulse on where that um, client sat from a maturity level. Um, in addition, we did a comprehensive uh, interview session with um, each of the, the stakeholders. And um, we basically then generated a lot of content. We de-identified the data and we provided a report back to the FDA, the OSET Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats uh, Department within the FDA, and who had funded the project. Um, at a later slide here, and I'm sure as uh, the committee shares the slides and content, we will be providing a link to, to the um, report that was published um, just recently on October 1st um, by uh, the FDA. Um, some of the, um, what you're seeing on the slide now is just one, one I'm bringing up a couple of slides from the study, um, but I'm not going to go too deep into it because it's much more comprehensive and I'd encourage you to read the, um, the, the actual report that's, uh, that's available online. But what we were using here, just a framework and a transformation wrap, uh, map that shows a lot of technologies as it's applied to our industry. And basically we, worked each of these technologies into our survey and into the um, plant maturity model and into our interviews and we extracted as much information as we could from the participating companies and we um, collated all the information and uh, we came up with some interesting findings and um, specifically if you just uh, just to move the text will change here just on the next um, slide movement so these are just a sample of some of the, the transformation map items there. It's a little bit of an eye test on the left. So just uh, figured I'd make them uh, stand out a little bit. Um, but, but specifically you're seeing things like the artificial intelligence and robotics that we spoke about earlier this morning and um, the future of computing. And again, I think that's interesting in the context of where, where industry is going in the next number of years. Um, I had an opportunity to attend a conference uh, just before COVID um, in uh, MIT last year and around the topic of the future of computing. And they brought in a number of um, industry leaders from the IT space and Google and um, other MIT researchers as well. And they were focused on um, quantum computing and how it's going to find its way into industry over what they felt was that it's going to be a about 10 years from, from that stage before it starts finding its way in. But I think when you take that into context now of the, the acceleration through COVID and what we're doing with data uh, these days, it's going to push even further 
and the, the uh, advent of, of uh, quantum computing in manufacturing, I believe. So some of the other areas there the, around focusing on leadership um, and digital transformation of the, the business processes and then innovation and the whole topic for today. So these were just some of the, the extracts from the chart on the left. And if you move forward uh, on the slide, um, please. What one of the outputs that we have inside in our report is uh, this quadrant here, which is showing uh, just a kind of a benchmark for the digital mastery uh, for some of the participating companies. And the, the chart that we have um, was an extract used on, under permission from a, a book that was previously um, published um, around the topic of uh, digital transformation. And you'll see that the two blue dots there was from, originally from the book. Um, and that was indicating the benchmark of, of pharmaceuticals um, manufacturing and just manufacturing at large in 2012. And what, what you're seeing then there is uh, with regards to digital capabilities on the vertical axis and the leadership capabilities on the horizontal, you're seeing the placement of our participants on the red dots. And what you know, what you can read for that is that there has been an advancement, uh, specifically in the life science industry, since the 2012. Now, again, it's a small sample set, and typically the, the companies that participated in the study uh, came from a background in vaccines manufacturing, uh, PPE uh, manufacturing, uh, therapeutics, and medical device slash diagnostics manufacturing. So again, a small group, but I think it, it was a valuable insight into the, the, the status of the industry and relative to the topics under study. And I think it also teases, teases a, a, up a number of new opportunities to continue studies and to develop out um, on what our findings were here. And if you just move forward, just to give a bit of context to the quadrants here, and um, just to move forward, the text will change on the left. And what you'll just see if you jog forward, you'll see that the beginners, again, it's fairly self-evident, the tech wanderers move on to, to next on the conservatives, and then lastly, the digital masters. So what, what was noteworthy on that, and again, I listened carefully to Rohan earlier, and, and Rohan was one of the sponsors of the, the, the program that we rolled out from the IAA. E, uh, Biogen were an early adopter of, of that uh, content and they rolled it out at each of their facilities. And um, I think, again, when you, when you see the level of advancement that the likes of Biogen have made, you, you see that, that a number of companies are, are moving strongly towards you know, the digital mastery. And what was um, an interesting point that one of the participants mentioned that the digital transformation is, is not so much a transformation, but it's, it's, it's an evolution, right? It's ongoing. It's, it's not a, there's no definitive end here in, in this, that it's a constant evolution. And I think that's, that's evident from some of the conversations here today as well. Um, so again, just if, if we move forward on, on this here, just to, to maybe speak to some of the um, findings additionally, and again, I'm, I'm taking some of the slides out of context from the uh, survey, but I think there was one in particular that's, that was a uh, standout in, in the survey that we were doing, if we can jog forward. Um, so I think this will um, maybe resonate with the, the broader group. Might be having some, well, some updates, uh, delays here, yeah. So it's just coming up on my side there now. So, one, one of the questions that we worked into our um, questionnaire was asking uh, manufacturers to respond to a list of suggested uh, actions from the 2020 National Academies report, which I think it's, it's very pertinent to bring this up today. And you'll see that there was a number of the actions listed down below and there's the responses are in the uh, vertical columns above. And we've, we've emboldened those that um, kind of stood out the, the most from the responses. You see that action four, become familiar with condition-based monitoring approaches and provide incentives for their use. And I know that was a topic there around the incentives that was um, discussed at length this morning. So just thought again, just uh, some interesting feedback for the committee here uh, on using some of their data 
in a different context and with a different pool of people. Uh, action number five, that inspection staff have the expertise to understand the technologies and the best practices in their application. And I think, again, we, we spoke at length before lunch uh, around the, the, the benefits of upskilling. And coming back to Malcolm's point here again on manpower and education, you know, we spoke before lunch about that, the need for it, some of the education, the ongoing and continued education uh, within, say, the FDA, um, but also within industry. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is unprecedented movement of personnel within the companies, a lot of mergers and acquisitions that have gone on. And is that a disruption or is it a benefit to the digital transformation and the adoption of technologies? Okay, there's there's pros and cons as you as you dig into that. And, and again, just put considerations and time. I think we've addressed some of those in our study, so you, you'll be able to find that. But again, I think just the unprecedented movement in the last number of months of personnel is, is going to be another challenge on top of education and, and the, the um, baby boomers retiring and you know, compete competition from other industry verticals as well. So there's a lot of challenges out there. Um, so I think what you know what what we found as well is that some of the companies that were advancing their digital transformation were conservative in their feedback and and kind of humble in their approach to their advancements. When you compare them to some of the other companies that were maybe not as advanced those that were advanced were maybe, as I said, being humble and maybe being tough on themselves because of what progress they were making, which is a considerable lift for, for companies and challenges. And um, some of the feedbacks that we were getting were around the, um, the competing priorities, which was mentioned earlier, uh, legacy systems, um, insufficient funding, and um, you know, just the, the, the need for stronger leadership as well, right? So I think the migration of talent is, is going to be a challenge to the, to the strong leadership staying in place to, to guide any one entity forward. Um, so if we, if we move forward here, I think is maybe done towards the end of the, of the slides here. And in, in kind of wrapping up, I would um, maybe just speak to a couple of points here that from a key findings there on the technology front. Um, a number of the companies were saying that they're slow to adapt new technologies for reasons um, outlined um, previously, but what they're looking towards is other companies and other industries proving the technology first to basically take out some of the risk from, uh, from them subsequently uh, deploying it. And one interesting um, observation I made during our study was that one of the participating companies was part of larger, what I would say, conglomerate, right? And, and within their organization, they were the medical manufacturing arm of the, the bigger company. But elsewhere in the company, they had manufacturing entities that were making huge movements in the digital transformation space. And therefore, as a byproduct of their progress, the medical division was able to leverage some of the technology deployment that they were making. So I think this kind of stands out to one or two of the points earlier today that of adopting what's been done in other industries uh, more quickly and partnering with some of those industries just for sharing of the knowledge. But again, that was something that just stood out to me. They were able to do it all under one umbrella, but um, wherever we can, um, obviously trying to leverage what's been done in some of the other industries. Um, the on the technology front, some of the key takeaways, again, a number of the companies looking towards big data and uh, the adoption of uh, cloud computing, and um, also their focus from a technology perspective around cybersecurity, um, specifically related to, related to AI and machine learning. And lastly, then on the technology front around robotics and robotic process automation from a business process improvement. On the regulatory side of things, one of the takeaways was around headcount uh, to be able to implement more broadly. That was seen as a challenge and a barrier. Um, and then we'd, we'd spoken to some of the others that um, was related to the National Academy slide earlier. On the people side of things, low levels of training and unknown levels of training within organizations. So basically you could um, present that as visibility of training and maybe insufficient levels of training 
was seen as a barrier to uh, moving the digital transformation forward as well. And I'll finish on a last point that it's most likely that um, the, the, we, we presented one, one selection of slides uh, and we asked them what, what was most likely to be their areas of training that they would focus on. And um, the, the, the leader on the result there was around operational excellence. Um, so again, not necessarily technology focused, but uh, more on the operational excellence side was, was the, the leading result there. But again, you'll, you'll find a lot more context and a lot more information um, on the, the slide, um, on the, the reports uh, per the links that are shared here. And just leave with a little bit of humor at the end of this, uh, there was one comment fed back to us and said that, you know, with regards to and relative to the international, um, the international challenges and the compliance challenges and references earlier to harmoniz harmonization, one person commented and said, how are we going to achieve harmonization when we can't even agree on the, agree on the spelling of the word? So I just thought that was a, an interesting piece here, given uh, all that, that, that was said previously. So again, I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, in the follow-up chat. Thanks, Tim. Thanks very much, Mike, uh, for that. Uh, and you know, perhaps we can harmonize the uh, conversation and then in the, during the community discussion by whatever spelling you all would like. Uh, and thanks, uh, Tom, Dolores, Malcolm, uh, as well as Mike, for for your comments. And and now we're moving into the community discussion. And we really want to hear your voices. Uh, so you know, this is an opportunity for you to speak up on uh, what you view as the hurdles to innovation uh, for the community as a whole. This is particularly important because we have, you know, preparing for tomorrow's discussion on solutions and a path forward, uh, the speakers in, in session four tomorrow morning and Sally who's preparing uh, to moderate that discussion are dependent on you in the community to speak up and talk about uh, what these hurdles are, what the gaps are, to that, that, that we see today so that they can begin to propose solutions in response to you know, these observed gaps, both those that have been spoken about by the speakers and those that the community as a whole have voiced. Uh, so I urge you please to use the Slido uh, issues, I think it is, uh, ideas, excuse me. If you just have a comment there uh, you know, that you'd like to raise or something you wanna talk about, we'd appreciate that. You can use the Q&A to pose questions uh, to our speakers that, that react to, to their uh, remarks. That would be appreciated also. We'll use the upvoting uh, for both of those, uh, but I'm gonna get it started a little bit while people are, are, are getting going on that with a couple of my own questions that I've been thinking about. And uh, we heard about innovative technologies and existing mechanisms in, in sessions one and two. So I have a couple of questions here and I wanna, Get, see, see what people have to say. And we'll, we'll, uh, we've got the panel uh, up here on the, on the screen, so I, I won't call on you, but you're certainly welcome to volunteer first. Others raise your hands uh, as well. One, one question that we haven't you know, completely and overtly spoken about, but I, I'd really like people to voice is, you know, with regard to the technologies themselves, do people feel like that the, the pace, perhaps the slow pace of implementation is due to insufficient technical readiness uh, fundamentally. Uh, you know, is that part of the problem or is it not part of the problem? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, I, I'll, I'll start, I guess. I, I do think that that may be part of the problem, Tim. I, and I think that uh, honestly, um, part of what we saw um, in some of the examples today, I thought were good examples of uh, investment in technologies ahead of uh, deployment, uh, particularly uh, uh, Narendra's uh, 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 description of technologies that uh, uh, GSK was investing in uh, might be a good example. And, and you know, in, in, from my perspective, uh, by doing that, uh, now we're better positioned to implement that technology when an appropriate application comes along. And I, I think. Uh, I've heard from a number of my colleagues uh, in industry that you know a lot of times uh, by the time you know you need a new technology, 
you don't have the time to develop it. And so if, if we can be proactive enough to invest ahead of the curve in technologies that we think we might need, uh, I think we'll be in a better position to deploy them when, when the, when the uh, real need uh, uh, materializes. Actually, I think uh, a good example we have seen uh, with the COVID vaccines, uh, with the lipid nanoparticles, although, although we had on Patro approved a few years ago, then we, because the technology was available, uh, several other companies have been, uh, have been using that technology and have been able to develop uh, the vaccines in a such a speedy manner. I think that's right as well, Tim, because, you know, the technology we've seen in the COVID vaccine is something we can use for other things. In fact, one of the biotechs I'm involved in is using that technology basically for something which is different. And I think also I think there's a lot of feeling. And I remember this from my regulatory days. Well, you're, you're not scared. But, you know, as it came out in the report, a lot of the technologies have in the past been developed for one product or a series of small, you know, small areas of products. The more we can go down the line of developing a technology which can be more applicable to a wider range of things, the better. Maybe that's something we should think about and say that we're going to give grants, innovation, awards and stuff to technologies which can have a wider remit than maybe a very narrow group of products. That may be easy, it may not be. But when you're looking at artificial intelligence systems, that's obviously an area on the control side where you could do that. So I think that's uh, it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Any, any yeah, other comments? Um, Thanks. Yes, actually, we have seen that with other technologies, for example, continuous manufacturing, the first sponsors, you all know, that uh, use this technology. They, they, they have been using uh, the platform they develop with few adaptations for other products, and they reach the market uh, in a, uh, more, uh, more quickly, faster. So uh, I think there is an advantage there. Of course, it takes time and investment to develop the platform, but once the platform is there, then of course the, the, the development, it goes quicker. Tim, if I was just to add something as uh, some feedback that we often get from, from clients uh, when we're engaging on the education level is for more of an industry academia um, engagement because what they're finding is that with a number of the graduate um, graduates when they come out that it takes quite some time to get them up to speed to be um, autonomous uh, at the plant and so that's not just from an automation perspective but I'm just saying in, in broader terms as well so I think we need to kind of continue to evolve in the education space to make sure that what we're um, developing for the industry uh, by way of personnel um, is appropriate and, and can help the companies to, to, to work faster as well, to adapt faster. Thank you, Mike. If, if I could just to add to that, I, 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 my experience is that should be bi-directional uh, also because the students that are coming in often can, especially in areas like digital, uh, they, they can yeah. sometimes affect the thinking of people that have been in the industry for a long time. Yeah, Rex looks like he's raising his hand. Uh, be, being uh, in education, I guess I have to say something about that. Um, and particularly since I'm on the side of education that really uses the digital technology and the modeling and the control. And I think the challenge for the pharma industry is actually to attract and retain such students. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of examples of students who spend a year or two doing applications, one of your companies, and then they join a technology company, a software company that gives them um, financially much better perspectives. Uh, and, and I think you have to find a way of, of motivating and engaging them and keeping them there because that talent pool is on demand uh, across many sectors. Good point. Yeah, that's Thank absolutely you. true. And I think, uh, you know, more and more training is a core competency, uh, for, for all of us. Uh, right. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, the more we can come up with creative solutions to, to train our workforce uh, in areas that are important, uh, the better. But I, we, we see that as well in the data analytics field. I mean, you can't hire people from the top programs. They, 
they're going to Wall Street or wherever making, you know, way more money than, than we can offer them. So we have to come up with another mechanism to get that talent into our organizations and train. Yes, actually, this was another topic that I, I covered in my talk, the partnership with academia, because we all know uh, some, you know, the basic research and so on generally is done by academia and then it's transferred to industry. So I think the partnership and the collaboration among industry and academia and regulators as well is key to make this translation of these technologies into the market. One, one thing actually on, on that point, Tim, and to bring two things that you mentioned together to some extent as well is, is um, my son's working in, in, in aerospace and he's, 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 he's qualifying from aerospace and rocket science. It is rocket science. But you know, what I see from what he's doing is you could take a lot of the technologies on the academic side and bring them over to the other side. We see this also on the business side generally. We don't always bring together the pharma components of, a comp of an academic unit together with the business side. It happens in Kings in London where we've got a very strong development team at Kings London got a business school they don't talk sometimes we don't you know could we get i don't know the swansea or the manchester aerospace group to be talking to the pharma group academically but wider you know we've also got the crick institute in london two and a half thousand phds in one building over 12 floors amazing what do they do with it goodness knows they don't develop it very much further it's terrible but if you got them involved together with the tech team google and um you know the, the technology side on the digital side is over the road from them at St Pancras and King's Cross they don't talk crazy we need to get the industries talking together but the academic centers also talking to industry but also internally perhaps no it's very interesting I thank you Malcolm and the, the 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 both the adjacent industries aspect and the learnings there you know is a really really good uh, you know, thought. And I think that the business, the relationship of business, you know, not only as perceived by the industries themselves, which is basically framed by their own viewpoint of the business, uh, you know, and so perhaps the academic uh, business area, you know, is an opportunity to look more at the system level, you know, rather than at the individual pharma level, you know, with regard to that, because the individual pharmas have their, their direct business interests, their direct portfolio interests, you know, which of course comes first because of the way things are set up in the system. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in how, you know, as a whole and as a community, you know, we can look at advancing this at the system level. Uh, you know, when you, when you think about, you know, what, what do we own collectively, uh, you know, and people have the interest in preparing for and enabling the manufacturing of their portfolio with agility and all of that. Maybe we're not doing as well as we, we could in, in, in that. Uh, but then in saying, how do you raise the whole of it? Uh, well, no, no single entity actually owns that. You know, we, we have, to, have to tackle that uh, collectively. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have the next question to sort of move on to, and thank you, Kelly, for, for prompting it. You know, it's kind of a follow-up uh, question from, from the, the previous session uh, on existing mechanisms. And, you know, really we'd like to at least ask people if, you know, how are the existing mechanisms doing? Uh, we've, we've inventoried them a bit. We've heard some, you know, viewpoints on existing mechanisms and some opportunities uh, that, that uh, are, are in front of us. Uh, but I'd love, love to hear what people's views are on whether these mechanisms are, uh, you know, are they sufficient? Uh, you know, is there a, are there a lack of mechanisms right now in place? I, I'm not sure. We saw a lot and we got a lot of good links there. Thank you uh, for that. So th there's a lot out there. Do people feel like uh, these are, are lacking? Are they insufficient or are we not utilizing them? Is the awareness, you know, a big issue? I think lack of awareness is one thing. Another thing is resource limitations, because of course uh, we saw the numbers from the emerging technology team earlier on, and we have similar numbers as well in our programs. We, we, we have uh, proposals for, from different companies or different uh, research organizations, but of course we have limited resources, so we cannot um, address all and we have to prioritize. Thank you, Dolores. Yeah, that's that's certainly a, a very serious issue and one, 
you know, that probably is something at the policy end that, that you know, needs a push, uh, you know, uh, there, there, because it, in order to get it we, with constraints, it becomes impossible if those constraints are, are completely tying hands. Tom, you look like you're ready to say something. I was really just going to agree. I think that the the numbers that we saw, and also the fact that you know there are are those who have had their applications not accepted, shows that there's a greater demand for that type of dialogue and engagement than you know is available right now. And uh, um, that just, I think, to me, highlights how important that is. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, it's great that we have it, but I mean, you ask, could we do more? I think the answer is in, in the data, there's obviously a lot of interest in, in that uh, type of engagement. Thank, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm gonna go uh, to, to uh, Slido now. Uh, Kelly poses, is it, I think this is, uh, is there a need for more direct collaboration between industry and regulators, not just academics and regulators to develop understanding of capabilities? Uh, I think we've talked about that a bit, but certainly open to, to touch on it again. I think we'll let it always go first. <laughs> I, well, I, I, honestly, I, I, I've got this constantly. Uh, most of what I do is regulating between bio industry and regulators. The regulators, and, and I'm sure the FDA is the same, are extremely open. Uh, we've got some new systems in the UK, uh, which we're working with the MHIA together with the Americans, uh, with the Orbit Project Orbis. It's not particularly manufacturing, but the way that we discuss it is it includes manufacturing. And, you know, I think Project Orbis is a very good example where one set of regulators is communicating with another set of regulators. So it's not just industry to a regulator. You know, an industry is not interested just talking to one agency, even the FDA. It's a global aspect i remember some years ago we were looking at something and they said my market won't float because the fda won't accept it they said we've got to get the japanese accepting it ema accepting it you accepting it and the fda so it's not just a local thing but yes very much and you know we've also got to get the regulators talking to each other to make sure there aren't any gaps when they're talking to a, a section of industry so say like the vaccines we did that, I think, extremely well. But to some extent, I think we were a bit lucky. I think those discussions were taking place a few years before on things like Ebola. If we hadn't have had that, we would have ended up with a big problem. Another example, if I can add to this one, is, for example, in priority medicines for a med medical need and breakthrough, that we, we have a collaboration between EMA and FDA, and we hold a workshop back in 2018. Uh, we develop, uh, as a result, uh, a workshop report. We develop some guidance in Europe. We are developing some general... Um, el, um, we are continuing the discussions with FDA on the topic, continuing the collaboration. So, and actually this has been proven to be very valuable because obviously with the COVID vaccines, there was an unmet medical need. So some of the... Uh, outcomes from those discussions have been used for the regulate uh, to regulate the the COVID uh, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic and vaccines. So you know there is a scope, but as I mentioned, there are limited resources. So there are different initiatives here and there. Um, also, and for example, this was a case where we this we it wasn't a single company. We approached our European stakeholders. FDA did the same with theirs, like pharma, bio. So it was like. We, we identified topics uh, which we, we, th we thought there was need for further discussion between regulators and between regulators and industry. And we approached stakeholders in a global manner and we said, okay, we are having this, do you want to collaborate? And then there was very good collaboration uh, between regulators and regulators and industry. So I think uh, it's for the whole community to identify where are the gaps and make proposals, uh, reasonable proposals, and then uh, take the, the topic forward. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'm gonna see if I can call on, on Johnny Erickson to, to speak up, uh, if he's willing to come, come up and be spotlighted uh, to talk about his question, uh, which relates to, his question is, if, tech, if platforms within a company can improve new technology adoption, would multiple companies collaborating on a common platform accelerate adoption even more? 
And you know, John, you might want to elaborate on that a little bit. And I'm very interested in, in, in the extent to which we had in the polling questions, you know, trans, you know, on the what can industry do? Transparency was one of these. Uh, and you know, I would love to get a little bit of discussion about the extent to which companies feel like their manufacturing innovative technologies are proprietary or whether they are enabling and that they wish to have access. Okay, well, thanks, Tim. So I, you know, I was, was thinking about that. I think it was Dolores who was talking about saying platforms can, can really help there. Um, also, you're talking about having to prioritize because there's so many different technologies. But you know, if, if the industry in a, uh, you know, in a, in a legal way could get together and say, these are the technologies we really want to work together on. Can we focus on those and get those over the line? And, and then once we've got that, then we could work on, on some other things. Now, it, it would depend on you know, getting everybody together and agreeing, but my sense is that most people have very similar problems. And so the question is, can we work on it together? Actually, I think that's the key issue, because if you identify this, you come to regulators, discuss with us, we can see how this fit with our the regulatory framework. And this is the exercise I was referring to that we did within our uh, regulatory science strategy, uh, horizon scanning activities. And this is exactly what we are doing now in the context of the pharma strategy. So honestly, if you, if, if you do this exercise and identify those technologies, we at the MA would be very happy to hear from you. And as I said, there are different uh, platforms available. Lots of companies, for example, are members of FPA and other uh, organizations or even, you know, so, and I'm sure uh, other um, regulatory authorities would be very happy to have this consolidated feedback uh, from industry so that we can all work together and, uh, and, and, and smooth the path for the introduction of these technologies. Yeah, actually, that, that point as well, as Dolores knows very well indeed, the European Commission has had for many years something called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, the IMI process, which was built on Horizon 2020, and before that, something called FP7. It's going forward in another guise now. What that does, and, and my guess is you probably have something very similar in the States side too, is that we get industry together with academia, together with the regulators to basically raise what they call calls. The calls are basically areas, like you said, um, John, which raise things that industry and academia and indeed regulatory are interested in. The European Commission put several million pounds behind each call. They come before a committee. I used to be on these committees. They're brought forward. You put a section of industry together with academia, together as regulatory, together, and they work it out together over a period of up to four years, if not longer. And this has got, I can't remember doors how much it is, 1.2 billion euros, something, over the course of the horizon 2020, a huge amount of money has gone into these. And we have actually sorted out a number of things. What we haven't done, and I, I, you know, I don't know if this is the case, we haven't seen much on the manufacturing side. We haven't seen much, it's been working more with things like problems, things like developing new antimicrobials, things like developing patient education programs. We haven't developed it, but why can't we do that more globally? It's almost like an ICH program. We've done it locally because that's the way money works. It's sort of ICH um, centered on global side, but IMI is more European. If we'd worked together with the United States, it would have been quicker and better, probably put more money into it too. Actually, that's a very good proposal, and I, I guess it's true that so far uh, the European um, funding has, hasn't gone through towards uh, manufacturing initiatives, but it's something that is, is available. Tim, you're so perhaps a matter of suggesting that uh, uh, authorities uh, uh, talk to each other, you know, funding uh, regional funding uh, agencies uh, talk to each other and come up with a global or an international program. You might have invented something there, John. All right, we'll talk some more.
And, and Linda, very good for, for letting us continue. Thank you for the permission there, because I was, I was going to ask for it and you beat me to it. Yeah, we still have some, we still have a few you know, interesting comments in the Slido uh, uh, in the, in the Q&A. And so I, I'd, I'd love to talk for a couple minutes uh, about you know, both Janine and, and uh, Paul, if either of you or both would be willing to raise your hand and, and be spotlighted be great to talk about the training and workforce aspect of it and what the opportunities are there. And while there's silence, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, go back to Tom mm -hmm. for a second, you know, because uh, in Janine's question, she, she uh, posed the, the COVID opportunity, you know, because the visibility of, and the, the vulnerability, I guess, of supply chain, you know, during the pandemic has, has been, been uh, uh, illustrated and Paul's ready to jump in. I was just gonna observe that, you know, Tom, in your remarks, you were talking about expectations for timelines uh, and, you know, how product timeline, you can't really expect technology timelines to be a lot faster than product timelines. Well, we've certainly seen some change in that in right. the last, you know, uh, so that ought to suggest that there's opportunity. If the cycle time of a product can be, you know, 12 months or less, uh, then the cycle time of a technology, you know, might also be able to be accelerated. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe added to that, the compelling needs of the pandemic, I think, drove, um, you know, I'd say a, a little bit more willingness to uh, explore strategies that were uh, people were reluctant to explore uh, prior to that, um, like making material from stable pools, for example, in my area. But, you know, so I think, uh, um, yeah, certainly as product timelines accelerate, that might help uh, enable more rapid adoption of technologies. So it looks like we might have a limit on number of spotlights. So Janine, you're you're up uh, on here, and Paul's got his hand raised. So we'll go to him next. But but uh, you've got the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I was uh, taken by surprise there. But yeah, the the, um, the idea of uh, in, encouraging people into the biopharma industry now, I think, from a number of conversations I've had at different conferences and and with recruiters as well, they've noticed that there's a big interest now. Now biopharma is suddenly in the news. Everybody's aware of what we do, and uh, the huge benefits. And I think people have changed their mindset as well, um, that they're not so much after money, they're after doing good for the society. And, and it seems to be that this is a, a really good opportunity to leverage that and, and really use it and, and try and attract more people. Because I think all the ideas that we're discussing here are, are fantastic, but resources is always an issue. And especially with so many new technologies and, and you can't train everybody in everything. Uh, and we've got to be smart and we've got to work out how best to attract resources and, and retain them. I'd be really yeah, I, interested in your thoughts. I, I certainly agree with that. I, I think, you know, we have to seize this moment. Uh, you know, it's it's there and the visibility is just, you know, never been like this before. Certainly when I was at Pfizer, you know, it, it was like an astonishing amount of attention uh, went into uh, the, the manufacturing and supply chain aspects because we were trying to do something we'd never done before, uh, you know, in terms of the scope of the vaccine. And so people's appreciation has also gone up. And, you know, Tom, you made the remark about proactive investment, you know, and the willingness to do that. I think, you know, Janine, your, your point is really Really well taken uh, that, that we, we really got to pick up on this uh, and and do something with it and as a community you know making sure that we push and speak up and not sort of accept our humble uh, humble role you know uh, that we might have might have felt like we're sometimes relegated to we used to joke you know that it's like how the sausage is made and people don't want to see underneath it just want it to work <laughs> yeah and I, I think the benefit of that too, if we can, if we can find a better way to integrate people from other industries, which we, we're starting, one of the areas we're investing heavily in is digital, and we're hiring a lot of people from outside of our industry. And I'm constantly impressed by their, you know, knowledge and energy, and challenged by their way of thinking. I think they bring a perspective that's very healthy and. Uh, you know, there are many industries that do a lot of things better than we do that we can learn from. 
Um, and, and part of the challenge, the, the, the bargain there is, is finding a way to train them in the specifics of our industry. So I think that's, that's uh, I, I agree with you, Janine, we have an opportunity and, and maybe we need to develop a little bit more muscle in how we you know, integrate folks from outside of our industry. We're so used to hiring people with 10 years experience in the pharma industry. That's a, often a criteria for our uh, requirements that hopefully we can start to move away from. Yeah, hi, Janine. Lovely seeing you. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, I think what you're saying, Tom, is absolutely right. You know, even on the medical side, you know, this is the first time my wife understands what I do in 25 years after the COVID. It's a ridiculous way, but she seems to understand what I'm up to now. But I think we have to specialise. We have to say to engineers, there is a separate section or an area you could work with, which is really interesting, which will provide expertise and things for patients which you wouldn't perhaps have got in other other areas of engineering on the medical side we're only just beginning to actually say to medics you know pharmaceuticals are and biotech is a really interesting area i've only just started a course at a university explaining to medical students what what we do it's taken us 27 years to get there you know and the same with pharmacy pharmacy knows it but they don't understand fully the manufacturing side they understand about production you know many years ago they used to produce you know specials and stuff like that but they don't probably understand the manufacturing side is so interesting and the other thing is we don't actually combine things a bit like we were discussing earlier you don't produce a pharmacy school which has got inroads into the engineering school you don't put the medical school together with aspects of some other technologies that we do we've got biologists I'm a, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, I'm trying to persuade biologists to take their heads up and not worry just about nematodes or, or plants can be quite difficult. You know, we've got to persuade the biologists. I think, you know, there's more to what you do. You could do a lot more of what you do than just looking at nematodes and counting seashells. Now I'm being rude to my biology colleagues, but, you know, it's difficult getting these societies to think, wow, pharma is part of what you do. In fact, you could imagine that we are the pinnacle of all the natural sciences. But persuading Cambridge or Oxford to think about that, phew, you're on the dark side. That's it, mate. Forget about it. But can, we give Paul the, can we give Paul the mic here for a minute? Yeah. Thank you for joining, Paul. Well, hi, Tim. Um, well, yeah, I think there's so much breadth to this. It's, um, it's kind of overwhelming. And, and you're right, um, Malcolm, I don't think we can count on the the academics to move quickly on this. Um, you know, there's, there's just not any room in the, in the current curriculum to add new courses or make new requirements. Um, so um, I think there is a lot of this coming down to continuing education. Um, and I think it would be helpful, my opinion, be to get a good baseline on um, what, what does the current, what is the current mode of training in various organizations, whether it's industry or, or regulatory, you know, how do people get trained now? And what would be the preferred mode of training going forward? You know, we've learned a lot in education about how to do remote, remote learning, right? We've also learned that it doesn't work for everybody and that a lot of people still need hands-on learning. They need, you know, learning by doing. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but uh, that, that's something I think that's gonna be important to address. Um, um, but certainly is an opportunity to do things with remote learning and recorded videos and um, you know, modular education, just like we're talking about modular manufacturing. Um, who is the target audience in your organization? Do you want you know, plant operators? Do you want R&D people? Do you want you know, people that are doing sales? I don't know, right? Um, do you want, um, and, and then what are the critical topics that they need to learn? And I think there's some opportunity to, to cluster those by your target audience. So everybody doesn't need to learn the same thing, but you know, if we, if we're thoughtful about clustering critical topics by target audience, I think we could start to develop some kind of a continuing, continuing edu educational modular grid. Um, and I think it would be a great opportunity for a consortium group that represents multiple organizations to start with that as a, a you know, a, a, a put a line in the sand. It's to find the current state, you know? 
Thank you, thank you, Paul. I'm I'm going to have to hold it there uh, so I can turn it over to to Rex to, to do the closing. I, I appreciate the discussion. Thank you, all all the speakers and panelists and and participants and. In this discussion, I think we could go on uh, longer, but there is time tomorrow uh, to talk about, you know, where how we're going to move this forward. So I, I really appreciate the the thought provoking comments, uh, and thanks everybody for for your participation in this. And Rex, I'll pass it over to you. Some okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was muted. Um, I really appreciate the, the lively discussion uh, and uh, certainly enjoy the, the presentations in this sessions and the, and the preceding sessions. Um, there was a little organizational question that Linda asked me to uh, convey to you. Namely, there's been multiple questions about access to the recordings of this session. Uh, and the answer is that uh, these recordings will be made available on the National Academy's website. Uh, when they are ready. Uh, so um, I think, uh, um, you know, and this will uh, encourage you to look at the uh, National Academy's website, which you may have never visited before. Um, now, I did want to point also to tomorrow's program. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the three sessions we had today are really intended to set the stage for a session four, which will be really discussion of possible solution and action items. Um, and we're, we really have a, a great set of speakers, uh, Tom Fisher and, and uh, I'm sorry, Adam Fisher and Tom O'Connor of the FDA uh, will be leading off the session. And then we have, again, a series of short talks um, uh, from the industry sector uh, and academia as well. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll end up with a, an interesting portfolio of potential solutions, which we hopefully will be able to uh, winnow through and come up with some uh, conclusions and recommendations for community action in the future. So tomorrow promises to be a, a really interesting program and I, I hope you get a, you know, a good rest and a fine drink tonight and, and be ready tomorrow to contribute to the program. Uh, Linda, did you have any instructions for us to, to share beyond that? Uh, no, I think you covered it all. Um, I we will be using the same Zoom link as today. Um, so tomorrow, if everyone can hop on at nine, invite your friends. Um, we're hoping to be just as engaged today uh, as today. And also, um, don't be so camera shy. We will hope to get more people talking. And um, it is a community after all. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, and have a good evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you all tomorrow then.